So, hey, what's up, guys? How are you all doing? I hope you are all doing great, so welcome everyone back to the channel. Shadow Clone is here. So, this story is about what what if Naruto mastered Femkarama's chakra early? Part 1. Please let me know if you want the next part in the comment section. So, if you enjoy this, what if, do subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell to never miss any updates from this channel. And check out my videos at the link given in the description. Watch and have fun. Also, make sure to share with your friends. And so yeah, without taking much more time, let's get into the video. Chapter 1. The Evil That Men Do, Allied Command Ship, Offshore Near the Land of Whirlpools, Many Years Before Our Story Begins Anoki looked out in disgust across the remaining joint force assaulting this fly speck of a village. True, the combined military strength of four major villages and several smaller villages lashed together was impressive, however, this combined might have just taken the middle ring, after seven days of pitched combat. The blood price for that precious parcel of land had been horrific. If he had known when the cages sat down to plan this that he would lose a third of his forces before ever claiming the beachhead, he would have turned his back on the hull scheme. Now he was committed. Now it was too late to turn back. The emergency cage summit had divided the main island, in this cluster of one large and three smaller land masses, into a series of four concentric rings labeled the outer, middle, inner and core. The outermost ring consisted of 200 yards of shoal water and the first 50 yards of beachhead, and that ring had cost nearly a full third of all combined forces. It was supposed to be a quick landing, an easy and overwhelming victory against a single clan. Anoki glanced down at yet another bleedy allied corpse, floating past the ship's prow, just to get hooked by line and tackle, manned by the sea sprite's crew, and shook his head. So much for easy. Shoal waters around this island were filled with devastating whirlpools and very competent yuzu water jutsu users, while the beachhead was a sluggish morass of sand and very, very deadly earth jutsu users, capable of using lethal earth and sand techniques. The Tsuchikage hadn't seen fighters this deadly since the Second Great Shinobi War, and his Suna allies were hard-pressed to take the beachhead from them in order to secure the landing. It had taken four days to get that far, with Suna forces rotating out in the constant assault. It had been brutal, and the Yuzumaki were ruthlessly unforgiving. The many broken invaders floating in the bleedy shoal water and lying along the even bloodier shore bore silent testament to that fact. Never annoyed off the Yuzumaki. Wasn't that the old saying? Anoki, the sand-aimed Tsuchikage of Awagakur no Sato, grimaced. He now faced an entire clan of embattled Yuzumaki, and it was a sobering concept. Sharks were beginning to surface belly up as a result of their frenzy gorging on human flesh. In their mindless buffet, they'd eaten until their stomachs burst. Such was the greed of shinobi trying to plunder Yuzushi Agakur for the greatest secrets of the clan. Too bad their bodies seemed to explode upon death, often taking enemy combatants with them. Men, women, children it didn't matter as they all burst into an enormous gout of flame upon death. Another explosion just past the beach line punctuated that grim thought with more red-clad body parts sailing through the air. Anoki shook his head again and looked at the remaining tally of shinobi still in fighting condition under his command. There were far too few in I were red for his comfort. Sighing once again at the cost of this battle, Anoki wondered how many generations it would take for his village to bounce back from today's losses. The obvious answer was many, but it was not a reality he wanted to face at the moment. Too many if you asked his honest opinion. Anoki couldn't fault them, the Uzumaki clan. They were fighting for their very existence against nations that had traded willingly and peacefully for goods and services with the island clan only a week ago. It was the height of hypocrisy and treachery. The Uzumaki were due their outrage. However, Anoki still had a job to do and he would see it through. This was the shinobi way after all. What a colossal waste this was on both sides as a result of following the path of shinobi. Defenders had long since evacuated villagers from the outer and inner ring sections, employing a scorched earth style retreat. They left nothing for the invaders to use against them and fought to their last breath. Every inch gained cost dearly in blood, oft times 20 to 30 invaders for each defender. The only consolation being that fewer and fewer defenders were being encountered further up the shoreline, which initially raised the morale of invading forces, until those same invaders discovered that it cost more lives to defeat those fewer defenders, and each concentric ring was more difficult to capture. The answer was simple. Defenders were stronger the further in you pushed, and it cost you more to push farther inland. Anoki saw the logic behind this and wept a silent tear in tribute to the noble Yuzumaki clan, the weaker defenders filled the outer rings with the sole purpose of draining chakra from the invaders. As invaders moved further inland, they encountered stronger opposition capable of overlapping their area of influence and increasing their defensive power, which, in turn, required more effort, resources and time to overcome. 
Anoki could see the fire in the eyes of the defending Uzumaki clan members and watched in silence as they stokely fraught tooth and nail until that light faded, usually after reaching physical or chakra exhaustion, making them vulnerable to a killing blow. Even in death they were silent warriors, no begging or pleading. And the damnable berserkers still exploded when they died. They knew another dawn for the Uzumaki would not come. They knew they were going to die to the last man, woman, and child. They knew this was a bitter war of attrition, and each defender was doing their utmost to make the invaders pay in rivers of blood. They also knew they were succeeding. Standing afloat in the outer ring with little under half the combined invasion force remaining, Anoki's eyes grew wide as sake saucers as they looked beyond his remaining ground troops to the inner ring and core, holding the fabled Yuzumaki shrine. They needed to hurry. Beyond the three youths standing on the temple grounds powerful chakra was rumbling in the earth below. He could feel the thrumming vibrations through his pointed shoes and feared one final strike of retribution from the vengeful clan. Their fury was legendary, almost as legendary as their skill with kin. This told him the invaders were running out of time. Jurea could not take his eyes from the intricate seals being laid over every square inch of the clan shrine. All of the remaining seal masters of clan Yuzumaki had gathered and were calmly layering fresh ink in intricate and sequentially linked patterns around the base of each column, the surrounding colonnades, and the shrine entry itself. Not a single one appeared rushed or panicked, despite the ringing thunder and flashes of fire, lightning and other elements wreaking havoc in the inner village just beyond the clan enclosure. A great village was going to die today, ruthlessly stamped out by the combined greed and fear of the elemental nations, and he and his teammates could do nothing to prevent it. Akinoha was complacent in the act nearly made him wretch where he stood. He glanced to his left and right taking in the stoic faces at his sides. Arachimaru was looking behind the small group, apprehension wrinkling the inner corner of his eyebrows, just enough to make his smooth forehead pucker. People were fighting and dying with fanatical furor just beyond the compound gates, and they were running out of time. It was clear on his face, his left hand twitching every time a defender died. Tsunade was nervously glancing in the same direction, her hands and jaw clenched, as she watched suffering spread through this peaceful village of Kenjutsu masters, the last of a greatly skilled clan that had faithfully allied itself with Konoha for generations. She knew the Yuzumaki were related to her Senju clan, and that this was her extended family, spilling their life's blood into the already sodden earth, to buy time for the final ceremony taking place deep within the shrine behind her. In her pained eyes, Konoha's treachery knew no greater shame. With one last heaving sigh, the self-proclaimed Toad Sage wrenched his eyes from the commiserating faces of his team and back to the large double doors of the Yuzumaki temple, the happy-go-lucky lecher nowhere to be found. Dot Yuzumaki Nido's face, the second Yuzumaki to bear that name, was grim. Deep in the lower levels of their clan shrine, the most sacred of places, her face was set as unyielding as the alabaster stone lining the ritual chamber all around her. She was tiring of Hachiko's pleading and dreading the outcome if this final ploy to save her clan's legacy. We will speak of this no more. The sword maiden's pleas died on her lips as she knew all too well what that phrase meant if she pressed the issue further. Looking to her old friend and mentor, Mido glanced up to the village above their heads to the latest sounds of artificially made thunder and silently urged them to finish the ceremony. One did not simply rush the most complicated ceremony in the history of Yuzumaki Kenjutsu. How much more time do you need? She asked between clenched teeth trying clearly to hide her desperation. It pained her that her family legacy would break after her mother held it together for so long, but every story must end eventually. If only it wasn't during her short time as temporary elder. They hadn't even appointed a permanent replacement after her mother died shortly after the ceremony of transition. Shaking loose her morbid thoughts, she snapped her eyes back to the old man puttering through his ceremony. If he heard her question at all, the wizened scholar never broke his string of hand seals completing the 70th one and slammed his bleedy palm into the seal beneath his feet. The seal began to pulse then glow with a steady stream of red energy that slowly bled to white, matching the eight other seals beneath the feet of eight similarly garbed, hooded and kneeling Yuzumaki clan masters. Once all nine seals were a steady stream of white energy, tendrils snaked out forming archaic glyphs interlocking each seal to the central master seal, then linking to their adjacent counterpart, making a glowing wheel hub and center spoke design. Ayanaga Yuzumaki lifted his head, eyes softening in a final farewell, as he memorized for the final time the loving face of a very young Mido Yuzumaki, the last ruling Yuzumaki of the village hidden among the whirling tides. Mido smiled briefly, then spun on her heel, slim wooden box in hand, and ascended out of the lower shrine, before the seals ceased pulsing, wisps of chakra floating to the tiled ceiling. Once outside, Mido headed straight for the three Kanoha Jown and waiting patiently near the entrance. The double doors behind her closed with a hiss, a burning energy lining the doorframe, as potent seals activated causing the compound and earth surrounding it to shake violently, as she focused on the white-haired ringleader. 
Jurea's eyebrows raised to his hairline as she thrust the ornately inscribed and heavily lacquered box into his arms. It was seamless with no visible locks or keyholes, the clan symbols breathtakingly inlaid with gold centered on the surface where a lid should be. Are you sure you won't come with us? He knew her answer, but he would ask one last time just to be sure. You know that I cannot, Jurea san. It will not end so long as I draw breath in Saratobi, she hissed his name almost as a curse, remains. Okage. You know that he will not endanger his village for our sakes. There were heavy doses of anger and resentment in that statement, causing all three Jounin to turn confused faces to the very beautiful royal, all arguments of persuasion left to the wayside. I am placing great faith in you to make sure Yuzumaki Kashina receives this. Her stony gaze brokered no other option. Failure was not optional. It's up to you now, cousin. With a nod, the three shinobi body flickered away just as Mito drew her own blade and purposely strode to the gates of her clan shrine, her sword maiden trailing in her wake. They had done all they could to preserve the clan. It was time to end this kabuki drama between villages, Tobaya. Dot. Bink tamed Toru knelt in the sweating grass for the fifth day in a row with loathing, his eyes taking in the widespread destruction from his cliff's concealed vantage point. Today's sky was angry, with dark and roiling clouds masking the sun's warmth, while below him man grunted, fought, bled, and died in the misery of war. He clutched his cloak about his shoulders as the wind whipped up around him, a fitting companion to the death and waste happening below. His accompanying sniff was filled to the brim with disdain. They disgusted him in every sense. Pitifully short-lived, man had made a thorough mess of every endeavor, mucking up the very land with their blind morass of stumbling greed. How had the thirteen allowed this manifestation to grow like the cancer it was? His ears perked nervously had he said that aloud or merely thought it. Girding himself tighter in the howling morning wind, he mentally reprimanded his lapse in discipline. To ease his mind, he idly fussed with the same fleck of mud beleaguering his cloak. This will never come out. Ruined. His mercurial mind flickered back to his last thought. Where was I, hm? Oh, yes. That way led to pain at the hands of the Justikers, and his silver eyes flicked nervously to the nearest brush. Being one of the few clan males did not grant him immunity. His mouth twitched into a familiar sneer even before the first few drops fell from the sky. Perfect he groused silently and tugged his hood down to further shield his face. He had no idea why the matron was interested in these blustering infants, this walking blight upon the land, but she ordered, thus he obeyed. For three turns of the cycle he obeyed. He would die obeying with none to mourn him. That was not their way. He knew one goal and only one. He needed to find her. Wherever she lay, whatever den or village or mudhull had hidden the great Yako, he needs must find her. His body shifted as he noted the significant rise in power below, the thrumming vibration that shook the mountains and the bones deep in his chest before all went still. It was an ominous end and somewhat anticlimactic, yet it pulled at him, his body leaning forward of its own accord. It was then that he noticed them. Three streaks fled northward toward his direction, one pausing to slam a hand down to the earth before summoning the largest frog no, toad, judging by the warty skin he'd ever seen. He reflexively sniffed again. The thing must have stood forty spans high, the blue vest and blade at his side at odds with the pipe clamped in its warty lips. Unfortunately, he had little time to stand there slack-jawed as the beast gave one powerful flex of its hind quarters and cleared the distance between the island and shore of the mainland, another hop sending it high into the air and cleanly over the very cliff Tor observed from. For the briefest of moments, his eyes locked with those of the three humans atop the creature's head before they were gone, the toad thumping his way with each earth-shattering leap deeper into the heart of fire country. Tor was no fool. He knew exactly what lay deeper into the land of flames, but his mind wandered to what might lay in that ornate box tucked firmly under the rather thick arm of the male with spiky white hair. The delicious delay only lasted a few moments more before his eyes were unavoidably drawn back to the tiny island under siege. Cretans. Neanderthals all of them. Its tragic end was a foregone conclusion. He knew the outcome even as he turned back to it and settled back into a comfortable crouch. He would need to see its finale before returning to his clan's matron and dare not leave a moment beforehand. He could not help but be distracted though as his mind kept wandering back to the deliciously curious secrets hidden away in that secret treasure box. Even before the battle ended he knew where his next journey would take him. Inside he shuddered contemplating a life among these beasts. Who would ever want to live a human's life? He simply could not fathom it. Perhaps he should delay for the necessary diligence in investigating that other island group further east, just in case the remnants held more of the Yuzumaki below. He sighed in anticipation of more agonizing moments, attempting to keep the smelly creatures at arm's length as he hunted and pecked through the humanity of yet another mud hole village. A servant's work was never done. With another look of disgust, his fingers picked at the persistent blotch upon his cloak. If only he had fresh lemons he could dot. 
when all was said and done, Anoki stormed from the island three days later empty-handed and, once his remaining troops had been recovered, began the long trek home without delay. Cries of the victorious force rang half-hearted in his ears and left a bitter taste in his mouth. Their shinobi might have ultimately shattered the Uzumaki phalanx, but at the cost of much blood, sweat and tears, their victory hollow and turning to ashes in their mouths, with their morale equally broken. Weeks of non-stop effort and they hadn't even been able to breach the final dome protecting the shrine, a shrine rumored to hold the greatest treasures of the clan. It was all for nothing and he wanted to be fully done with the place. He left convinced the price was too high to pay for this win. Let the others fight over the scraps. Chapter 2. The longest night I I I 10 years 6 months after the fall of Yuzushiagakur oi. Oi 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 oi. Stop breaking down the damn door. Jiraiya, the mighty toad sage, was not feeling very mighty at the moment. As he groaned his way up to a sitting position, head thumping all the way, one hand blindly reached out to grab and shake what he discovered to be an empty sake bottle. Dan at all to Nightmare and back. Someone wants their skull caved in for this. It was still dark in his hotel room, but the sleeping bodies lying next to him wouldn't have budged if the sodden hotel were ablaze. Everything from the neck up still hurt from last night's information gathering session, but if the shapely leg draped across his own was any indication, it was a highly successful endeavor. He cast a quick glance under the covers of the barely covered bottom on the other side and grinned at his own superiority. Mortal men quake in my presence and, thinking it a clever little jibe, began looking for his trusty pad and pencil, seeing a brilliant introduction in his near future. Then the impatient fatherless trying to break down his hotel room door started trying to raise the dead again. To make matters worse, the heavy fog trying to squeeze his brain was winning, and the white-haired legend was considering ripping off a limb or two to make the fool ruining his lay in vanish into the Suna desert, he needed to finish up negotiations with that fatherless Rasa today before shooting off to spy on Kumo. Oh, the beauties they have their weary hand gripped the bridge of his nose as he considered the ramifications of Kumo or Iwa, as neither by themselves could do much after the Third Shinobi War, managed to drink enough booze to work out an agreement threatening Kanoha's safety. That thought almost made the carpet lining his tongue palatable. A quick wince, a muttered prayer to whatever wine gods favored him for the day, and a grumbled wiggle out from under the exhausted tangle of flesh, and he was off at a stumbling shuffle. Flinging the door open with an irate, what? Caused the knuckles barreling towards the formerly closed door to freeze in place and hover. Or maybe it was the fact that he was bare acid nooked, and the confused Kanoichi bearing his village's crest on her forehead was turning a brilliant shade of red while imitating a lionfish. Normally such a reaction would have been priceless, but he was far from impressed he thought the rules spelled out clearly at the beginning of this mission, even for his village's ambassador to Sunagakur, had been pretty explicit. Despite how comfortable I am in my skin, this had better be important. We talked about this, Jiraiya began in the exhausted voice he often used to berate detractors of his literary genius. He jerked to a fuzzy brain halt once she slapped a scroll against his chest and bolted for the end of the hallway without a word. HNH, nice speed on that one, he gruffed out with a chuckle before closing the door to the outside world. That was better than arguing. Maybe he should use that tactic more often. Who knows, maybe he'll get lucky from time to time. With a light giggle, despite his pounding head, he staggered back to his crowded bed. Oh well, another three or four hours should hit the spot. Without thinking, he tossed the unopened scroll onto his pile of things in the sitting area and trudged back to his warm bed and the two unconscious piles of curves awaiting his return. He'd get rest later and revisit the do not disturb before noon policy with twitchy ambassador once more. Career bureaucrat, HMPH. If he was feeling particularly generous and he was after last night's escapades, he might treat her to round or two to smooth over the hurt from her nut encounter with the great Jiraiya. He chuckled again even as he crawled across the bed to face plant between the twins, his eyes growing heavy as they slid shut with a sigh. Too bad the third sister couldn't get off shift otherwise triplets would have been awesome. What? It wasn't like Kanoha was burning or anything. There wasn't anything that blonde fatherless of a student he loved like a son couldn't handle, the cheater. I I I meanwhile, back in high no Kuni year 11 day 283. Unlike so many days before I began this pilgrimage, today is a day worthy of note. As such, I shall endeavor to strike prose to passages I document what precedes me. A few hours from the hidden village of Kanahagakur no Sato I came across signs of her passage. All about me lay strewn the whirlwind of her rage, the earth at my feet, embracing the great Yako's paw, not more than 100 yards from some nameless haven of humanity. As I look about me, straw and wood hovels lay smashed to so much kindling, the dead, bleeding and wailing stagger about equally dazed or cling to a loved one now past. Having little to no success in my travels, I am set to return to this village hidden amongst the leaves in search of a young maiden of crimson locks, spied those short days after Yuzushio fell. 
the few after images of her likeness found cast throughout the other lands held neither her spark nor furor, and, to this revelation, I must again cling in the hopes that her bond with the Nine has deepened enough that I may perceive it. The great roars in the distance have ceased, and it is with heavy heart that I hope my haste of these past eleven years have not dimmed my successful culmination of Matron's ambition. Praise be to Inari that I may be fortuitous at last. Or, the silver ghost I, I I four years later in the great tree itself like tinkling bells and silver wind chimes, the tiny child's laughter rang out in the late rainy morning. Her bare feet skipped along the cobblestones kicking up water from errant puddles. The rosy hue of her yukata sleeves flapped like soggy wings, the many imprinted butterflies and snapdragon flowers, delicately embroidered on the delicate silk flickering with every twirl and hop. Golden threads sparkled just enough when the clouds parted to catch the eye. Her laughter trilled as her face scrunched up to the heavens, eyes closed in a squint as she blew raspberries to the angry clouds above. Her single bun had disintegrated through rough and tumble play, her honeyed skin covered in fresh rain and auburn hair plastered to her face through the morning showers. Raising her tiny hands to the sky as if she could grab the clouds and wring them dry, the child spun in a circle, calling for her brother to come and play. Hearing no response her laughter died as she stopped her dizzying spin, her flailing hair partially blocking her eyes. Nai san. The girl spun quickly to look behind her, her eyes wide open, their crimson color fading to gold the closer you got to her oval shaped her eyes. Her cherubic face broke out into a particularly feral grin, long canines piercing her lower lip, causing blood to dribble down her chin, her voice dropping four octaves. Come play with me, Nai san. Then the world erupted into flame. I I I at that exact moment, House of Hope Orphanage, Kanahagakur no Sado somewhere in Kanoha, a small child cried out in fear, his nightmare shocking him awake in the dank and dismal room, filled with the smell of his own sweat and bodily wastes. Amethyst blue eyes tried to pierce the darkness of his windowless cell, while his frantic gasps tried to calm his furiously beating heart. There were noises outside his room, footsteps followed by angry voices stopping just outside the door, one of them familiar. The orphanage matron. He could hear keys jingling, and then the lock started to make familiar clicking noises. All too familiar. Anik set in and the small boy scrabbled along the wall furthest from the door, sounds frantically trying to make himself as small and non-threatening as he could in the darkest corner he could find. It wasn't a difficult thing to do in a pitch black room barely bigger than a closet. Something threw the door open, nearly ripping it from its frame, and the flood of light nearly blinded him. His eyes always hurt with any light even when he wasn't kept in this room for how many days had it been now. He could vaguely hear the matron pleading with someone, something about needing to discipline the beast. The child knew she was referring to him because she never called anyone else that bad word, not even the Koga brothers, and they bullied everyone. But the whimper, as he knew crying out would only get him beaten again, the boy curled up in a ball with his face as far into the corner crevice as he could push it, his arms flailing about trying to cover as many areas of his body and head as possible, the growing silence from the blurry figures by the door growing louder with each passing second. Everything was suddenly so loud right before the silence became deafening. He must have called out in his bad dream, and they gotta really be angry now. To be honest, it didn't matter if he did or didn't cry out. They always blamed him, and they always beat him for it. He hated that spoon. The quiet grew almost too much to bear, and his heart was beating so hard it was echoing off the walls and thundering in his ears. He couldn't see movement with his face pressed into the small corner, but he could feel the heat from the person that had to be standing right behind him, their breath hot on the back of his neck. That chilling fear that started as panic was now full-fledged terror. He bit his lip to keep from crying out and reflexively jerked as his arms became desperate trying to ward off the blows he just knew were coming soon. They always came, but why were they taking so long this time? They were so close now. When gloved hands grabbed his arms, the shock became too much, and, with a final shriek of terror, he passed out. Standing in the mangled doorway, Hirazin observed everything that transpired and was incensed. Anger and killing intent began to freely flow, causing the rot unmatron standing behind him to cower on the other side of the hallway. At some point, she lost control of her bladder and sank to the floor babbling incoherently as the very air closed in on her. Somewhere in the back of her petrified brain, images of her own gruesome death began to flash before her eyes. With a carefully restrained flick of his wrist, he sent Nico off to the hospital to get the boy looked at by a trusted friend. That done, he slowly turned to face Matron Nagara, the glare in his eyes promising long-lasting pain, until her growing dread turned her into a blubbering, whimpering mess. Find a replacement for the good mother until Ibiki is finished with their upcoming conversation. Two swooshes of shadowy air and the hokage was alone in the hallway, while his anger cooled, the stench of the now-empty larder wafting out into the hallway as his only company. He conveniently forgot to tell the pleading orphanage manager that her conversation with Ibiki would be the last conversation she would ever have. 
I, I, I at the same time that the House of Hope was undergoing a managerial shift, a hooded and heavily cloaked figure slipped from the shadows of an alley, his nondescript hood pulled low enough to shadow any recognizable features. Tall and lean of build, the gait was smooth and gender neutral, no swing or swaggering to betray form or function of the so inclined. The gate maintained an even tempo and ate up ground as the figure shuffled, dipped left through one alley, scaled a wall like a wraith, before leaping back two rooftops to emerge from another alley headed in a completely random direction. A half hour of this peculiar behavior and the figure paused by a nondescript door. Above it lay a wooden sign depicting a single kunai blade, the bland colors on it weathered and faded through years of rain and relentless sun. Standing there in the stoop, the figure waited in the flickering light of the doorway, as if waiting for something or someone. Some unknown catalyst occurred, and the hooded phantom turned to enter the dilapidated establishment, nodding once to the barkeep, before making an abrupt right just past the entry door and passing through another portal just past the restrooms. It ignored the semi-conscious shinobi spattered about the drinking room and smirked at the jaunty a hard day's night, playing from the ancient juka box. Shotuns among shinobi. Who knew? Once the employee's only door closed behind it, the figure lifted a glowing hand to backlight the short hallway leading to another door, not more than a half dozen meters away. Closing one gloved fist and extinguishing the jutsu, the figure lifted another to the aged wood. Knock 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 knock. The door opened silently on well-oiled hinges. Inside the room sat a circular table with four chairs, two of which had their potential occupants standing behind them. On the table sat a nondescript white bottle and four saucers, each one turned upside down in front of an empty seat. The hooded figure entered and stood directly behind one of the chairs. After the soft click from the closing door echoed in the silent chamber, the masked and equally nondescript door opener moved to stand behind the only remaining seat. The tension rose briefly as the four figures cautiously observed each other, the only light in the room centered over the small table and chair set. The sparse bulk was barely enough to show no sandaled feet lurking in the far corners. As one, four gloved pairs of hands reached up slowly enough to pull back their hoods, showing four Anbu-style masks. The monkey looked across to the newly joined dragon and nodded. Tiger and Rooster nodded once he glanced their way. Again, and as one, all four raised their hands in the same foreign sign, the right fist closed and held chest high, with the left palm opened in a knife-like fashion, the flat palm resting against the knuckles of the right fist. As one they lowered their hands and the tension lessened minutely. I hope there is a good reason for calling us here off schedule, Tiger intoned, his voice almost growling in displeasure. They are moving up the timetable. Subject is being extracted as we speak. Dragon was neither anxious nor annoyed. He just was. What of our plans? Nothing has changed for us, Rooster. If not for their masks they would have been identical. That was the point of the identical henge after all anonymity. Do we know yet? Monkey seemed nervous. Not yet. We have narrowed it to a dozen primary. Anything less will take more time, years maybe. If nothing has changed for us then why call us here? Tiger didn't move their feet, but there was a hitch in their shoulders, almost like a settling of their balance. We must adjust the plan for our subject's new environment. The other three tensed simultaneously. Which one? Was all that Rooster said. Echo. At this Tiger did take a step back. And you are absolutely sure of this? Dragon nodded only once in return. I wish that I were not. He glanced around at his three mystery guests. We must be flawless in our execution. How is the subject? Three masks turned to Rooster, but Monkey answered. The subject is faring as well as can be expected. Today they made contact with the rabbit. An impression was made. His head tilted slightly as if remembering something. Favorable. Monkey nodded. Very. Tiger chuckled in response. Brewster reached out and popped the cork on the bottle with a kunai, the ceiling tag breaking as he flipped over his cup and poured a drink of the clear liquid. The other three flipped over their own saucers and repeated the process. As one, four cups held before their faces in one hand with the other placed in front of the saucer in a similar flat palm gesture, the four of them drained the vessels and placed them upside down on the table. None of them removed their masks before drinking. Nothing else needed to be said before four shadows vanished simultaneously from the room. I, I, I somewhere in Kanoha, six years after Kaiubi, A.K. stumbling, falling to his hands and knees his palms scraped raw and bleedy as he scrambled shakily to his feet yet again, the small figure tore through the back alleys in terror. He could hear his own heart pounding in his ears, drowning out the ragged sound of his breathing. This was becoming an all-too-familiar sensation the past few months, one that he hated. It was like this last year also. Festivals were supposed to be good things, but Kanoha's only festival of the year always made things difficult. People seemed to get really angry before this one came around. It was something the now frantic six-year-old did not understand. 
his throat raw despite the cool night air, his voice had all but failed him during the last half hour, while he tripped over garbage cans, dodged angry mobs by ducking under abandoned carts, and cowered in the shadows to the sound of angry and drunken voices. This by far was the most terrifying half hour of his miserable six-year-old existence. In a flash of golden hair dirty from grime and caked with blood, he scrambled into a darkened corner and tried very hard not to move or make a sound, each breath coming out as a strained hiss through clenched teeth. Wait here, Kit. There she was again, his angel. She'd never lied to him before, so he hunkered down and waited. I lost him. The small child flinched. More angry words and swearing followed. He didn't recognize that voice, angry and frantic as it was, but the sound sparked a fresh round of terror, causing the frightened child to instinctively press down and away from the light of the streets, sheer panic pressing down on every square inch of his body, forcing him further into the grimy corner of the alley he was hiding in. He waited just like his angel asked him to. It felt like forever for the adrenaline-fueled fugitive, the moments ticking away in reverse as angry feet splashed through freezing puddles and slammed into the hard stone. A small, raspy whine slipped through his clenched teeth before he could silence it with tiny hands pressed to his mouth, a pitiful sound crossed between a soul-shattering sob and whispered plea for help any kind of help. Tiny fingers clamped down frantically crushing the whimper into a hiss of leaky air. He needed to be still, but it was so hard. Maybe if they couldn't find him they would give up. Maybe they would go back to their drinking and leave him be. Several pairs of legs landed on the ground not more than three meters from where he crouched. Snowby. His young mind screamed. Their backs were to him and he couldn't see higher than their waist, but he could tell that their upper bodies were being twisted side to side. They were searching for the small beast that got away. They were looking for him. People were talking to each other in hushed and angry tones, but he couldn't hear a word of it. All he could hear was his own heart screaming in his tiny ears. Thump thump how come they couldn't hear it. The pounding made his neck hurt. Thump thump couldn't they feel the terror coming off him in waves. Thump thump. Without warning, the legs ran off in the direction of other voices. Someone thought they found the beast, and the hunt was back on again with a chorus of howls and jeers. After a few more shudders wreaked havoc on his small frame, Naruto Uzumaki released through clenched teeth the shaky breath he'd been holding, then edged his way out of the shadows and away from the angry legs that called for his blood. Go quickly, kid. We need to get back to our den. He was still hungry he just no longer cared. If he could get home, then he could look for food tomorrow. Tomorrow would be better. Tomorrow he chanted it mentally like a lucky charm. Tucci Jiasen would help him tomorrow. Tucci Jiasen never yelled or threw things at him. Tucci Jiasen always helped. The first few steps were hesitant and wobbly. The leg gave out in fear causing him to stumble and fall to the ground, splashing muddy water all over himself and scraping away more skin and angry little patches. His head whipped around in terror as he froze. Did anyone hear him? Hurry, kid. He lurched to his feet and pushed on to the end of the ally staying to the darker side. He could see the end now. There were fewer lights in the streets here, fewer people. His heart was racing again, but this time in hope. He was very close now. So very close. It was because he was so close that his face scrunched up into confusion and anger when his legs abandoned him again less than 10 meters from the edge of the alley entrance and the ground rushed up to meet him with a dull thud. He was vaguely aware of a sharp pain in his back below his right shoulder blade. The alley entryway spun as he fell, the street twisting in his vision so that he seemed to turn sideways, his head bouncing off the hard stone ground. It was also getting harder to breathe almost like he was breathing through water. Funny that I wonder why. He thought. Oh. It must have something to do with this big guy behind me and the shiny, sharp thing in his hand. It looks bleedy too. He was no stranger to blood. He'd seen enough of his own over the past two years. The small child wanted to figure out why he couldn't run anymore, but his attention flickered briefly over the shoulder of the sneering Snowby standing over him to the two cloaked figures on the roof. They were wearing masks, and he briefly wondered where he could get one like theirs. Did they find them at the festival? Maybe he could wear it to hide behind if he ran out of food next year. Maybe he could go to the festival like everyone else if he had a cloak and mask. His mind flickered back to the present when one of the two on the roof moved. Why did it look like the smaller one was reaching out to him? One of the masked people was angry and pushed the smaller one. There was a flash, some awesome smoke, and then they were gone. He couldn't think about it any longer since the angry guy standing over him was yelling and waving to someone just off where he couldn't see. It didn't matter anyway because Naruto couldn't understand what he was saying. He sounded very happy all of a sudden and had a brief thought that it was good that this person could be happy during a festival that seemed to make everyone else so sad. This thought popped into the small boy's mind just before his whole world erupted into pain. After an eternity of agony, a heavy sandal stomped on the back of his head and everything went completely black. He wondered no more and his angel's voice seemed really, really far away. 
I I Rayan followed behind the Hokage, her lion-faced mask hiding the apprehension written clearly across their very human-looking face. The old man was standing atop the Hokage tower watching Nin streak across the night sky in search of the vessel. Rayan felt they should have been out there with the others. Call this punishment for a job done all too well. The lion-faced Anbu didn't even appreciate the deprecating humor of their mask. She'd never displayed demonstrable aggression, among the humans anyway, in the combative arts excelling instead in the administrative field. Her crude peerage found some humor in the mask jibe, so she sniffed often and let this to pass without so much as an acknowledgement. Her disdainful attitude fit right in with the perky altar image. Absent-mindedly her left hand reached up and adjusted the uncompromising wrappings around the smaller Thanavarage chest, trying to get at the itch just beneath them. How human women suffered through the indignity was beyond her. She was thankful enough that she'd opted for a less robust figure for this new alter ego. The spy's life was difficult enough as it was. Thank Inari Kami for small favors. Back to the old man standing above her with an orb in his hand Hokage was peering very deeply into it. Every so often he'd tap the tiny communicator hidden in his right ear and provided directions, most likely to Inu, as others closed in on his location. Was it enough? It had to be enough. Please be fast enough. Rain really did not wish to explain to the matron how she let Kaiubi Haim die at the hand of savages. That was a conversation that could only end one way, and she'd be a thrissikurst in Yuzuka if it ended well in any way, shape, or fashion. Rain. She snapped to attention, one fist to the roof next to a slender right knee. Hi. Hokage-sama. The lilting alto voice sounded oddly pleasant even through the mask. I have found him. Secure the boy until Inu arrives. Hurry. Pale blue eyes looked through slitted eyeholes and up into the glowing orb, held low enough to peer into enabling her recognition of the alley junction, as well as the shinobi stalking the boy from behind. The lion-faced Anbu leaped away so fast the Hokage thought it was a body flicker jutsu. She had to be fast enough. Inari Kami let her be fast enough today. I I I something shook him and the shock made his eyes fly open. Pain. Pain was all. Pain was breath, life, light. What was this feeling? Flying. No. Floating. He couldn't understand why it was still dark with his eyes open. It didn't matter. They hurt so much it was easier to keep them closed. Why was it so cold? Oh, that's right. It was October, and October weather is always cool. He had a birthday in October, didn't he? Someone, please make the bees quiet down. They sounded angry, and the buzzing was starting to hurt his head. How did the bees know his name? Couldn't they tell he was tired? So tired. Maybe if he closed his eyes for a little while just for a lit apparently, the bees didn't like that. They wanted him to keep his eyes open, but the flashes of light made it hard. His eyes were heavy, so very heavy especially the right one. Were those bells he heard? Also, who would be giggling this late at night? Don't they realize people are trying to sleep? Grown it ups got angry when people woke them up. He wanted to sleep too. He wanted to sleep so very much nee chan a cerulean blue orb shot open only to stare blankly into the cold mask of an ansatsu senjutsu takushu butai, anbu, agent streaking through the night. Hey, this anbu had whiskers just like Naruto. That was kind of neat. I I I the dog-faced anbu cursed softly. He was trying not to jostle the broken and bleedy child cradled in his arms, but that loose roof tile caught him by surprise, and the child twitched from the pain. His anbu-issued cloak was ruined, blood flowing from numerous stab wounds in the child's body, far more blood flowing than could possibly be in one this tiny. He had no doubt that the child had few bones still intact. He could count a child's ribs even before the mob smashed them into odd angles. This little one did not have long left. Oh, how he wished he could kill them all. Vessel or not, no person deserved this. That it had been done to an innocent child made it all the more reprehensible. It's a good thing the demon inside him clearly wanted to live because it was going to earn its keep tonight. Brad and Mouse had some explaining to do but first, he needed to see to the child. Kami take pity on the resident or doctor or nurse that refused to help the child for he would not. It was a good thing that he was met at the entrance by a worry-faced doctor with a full team. Thank Kami that the Hokage had connections and knew good people. I I year 17 day 283. As I sit dumbfounded by the day's events, my hands clench and unclench of their own accord. Despite drowning them in sterile alcohol and scalding water, I can still see the stains. How has circumstance led to this? My failure is now complete, yet I cannot form the words to condemn my soul to my beloved matron. How can humans be so ignorant? So cowardly? So cruel chance thus fortune that I should soar near the heavens, my own wax wings singed in the glory of my triumph. Blindly I searched for the crimson princess only to allow the crown prince to slip through my clutches like fine wine before pagans. The vessel lays dying, even as my tears stain this the transcript of my inadequacy. May Kami have mercy on my soul for she will not.
It is fortunate that a feminine face stares back at me, for I could not bear to gaze on my own. Now my tears no longer seem so out of place. Toru, the silver ghost I I I wherever he was it was dark and the ground was sweating. No, it was covered in water deep enough to hide his hands. He was thirsty, but the water kept turning red. Everywhere he went the water turned red. Eventually, he just stopped trying to get a drink and instead tried to figure out why his right eye wouldn't work. He was a smart boy for his age he knew his right from his left. He didn't know what that thumping sound was, but it was everywhere around him and it was loud, slow but loud. Lifting his head up from where he was down on both hands and knees in the growing pool of red water, he could see dingy walls with large pipes on either side of the long hallway. It almost looked like the sewers he used sometimes to hide in from the angry people only it didn't smell as bad. The water at least didn't smell as bad. Proof was that sewers soaked no matter where you were, but here the water was kind of salty. He looked up again. The pipes to his left briefly glowed with a nice blue light every time that thumping sound came. The pipes on the right glowed in orangey red color, and both sets glowed together. The red pipe seemed to be a lot brighter right now. It was almost comforting. Since he didn't know where he was and still needed help, he rose tiredly to his feet to begin staggering along the dark hallway, or at least he tried to. He was having a really hard time standing up at the moment. He figured he'd just follow the pipes not caring that there were torches lighting up as he moved along the tunnel. It just helped him to see better with his one good eye, the right one didn't seem to work right now. He could hear the tinkling of a small bell off in the darkness. It sounded familiar he lost track of the number of times he fell. Everything hurt bad and it was hard to breathe. He thought it odd that his hands didn't want to work right and his legs kept falling out from underneath him. Eventually, he just pulled himself along and half crawled along the tunnel. He stopped moving only when his head hit something hard and metal. Oh, my. They hurt you pretty badly. For several moments, the boy just lay there in the water not moving, his forehead pressed against the cool metal. The bells tinkled again as someone approached him on the other side of whatever metal thing he bumped his head on. Then he slowly looked up and blinked his one good eye to clear out the blood. In front of his face was a thick block of metal with lots of writing in it. The writing and pictures were very thin and covered every square inch, but, since he couldn't read, it was just pretty to look at. When he tried to look up he couldn't see the end of the bar, but this wasn't the only block of metal. There were many others on either side of this one. It sort of looked like the metal gate at the front of the Hyka mansion, only the bars were thicker and golden brown in color. There was a sharp gasp of air just past the bars, so that brought his attention from the very large gate to the pretty face peeking at him through the gap in the fence. In his days of pain, he found her very pretty, and he felt bad that she had to see him the way he was. Her mouth was open with a sleeve of her yukata covering the lower half of her face, the silken cloth, a mix between a soft pink and a very light purple color. The butterflies on the fabric were golden like the coins in the greedy merchant's shop with all the jewels. She lowered her sleeve to speak again, and he could see a collar around her neck made in black material, he didn't know it was silk, covered in silver symbols with a shiny golden bell just below her chin. Her eyes were wide in fear and sadness, a single tear sliding down the side of her face. You look very hurt. I can help you if you like. Her eyes flicked to the trail of blood slowly spreading out into the water covering the floor and away from his broken body, her golden red eyes with the black slits held tears that started racing down her pretty cheeks. Her skin was the color of honey and looked very soft. She reached out with one sleeved hand and he instinctively flinched, leaning away into the side. His reaction made her cringe, her sad face crunching up as more tears welled up into her very large eyes. He thought she had very pretty eyes. No, no I won't hurt you. We are one in the same. Naruto had never had anyone say that to him before. Heck, he didn't have the first clue what that even meant, but it sounded nice. She sounded nice. Except for three people in his short life, no one cared, as far as he knew, whether he lived, ate, or breathed. Trust, as a result, did not come easy for the orphan, but he could tell he was dying. His normally hot running body was starting to get very cold, the room was getting darker, he was getting weaker, and he was sweating and miserable. What else did he have to lose at this point? It's not like he could outrun her if she could squeeze through the bars. Slowly, very slowly, his body righted itself and, as his tired eyes started to close, he leaned forward enough to touch his forehead to her tiny hand hovering between the gate. The little girl's response was a shuddering sigh that turned into a happy giggle. With his remaining eye closed, Naruto could not see the red chakra oozing from her sleeve as it coated his body. He could not see the many pulsing symbols along the walls and bars of this girl's cage surge to life. He could neither see nor feel his body rising from the water, nor feel her soft hand caressing his cheek as her chakra deadened his receptors. He couldn't even feel the tender caress she gave him through the bars, nor hear her soft words, as she began to shut down various senses and unnecessary functions, prior to starting the repairs to his wrecked body. She spoke to him nonetheless. 
humans think they know, but they are unseeing, unknowing children scrabbling about in the darkness. He could not see the statue rising from one corner of the room on her side of the bars, the figure on the pedestal, looking very much like a certain blonde-haired jinchuriki with thick manacles wrapped around its neck, waist, and wrists wrists, which were further shackled together like a prisoner. They cannot see the light of their salvation and have spurned what is good and just, and they call me monster. On the walls of her cage, larger seals began to appear in rows with smaller seals near the bottom and within her short reach, while more and more seals appeared above each row growing in complexity. If we cannot make them see the truth, then we will thrive without them and make them choke on their foolishness and fear. She reached up to one of the seals placing the flat of her palm across the center of it. There was a burst of blue-white flame that engulfed her hand, and the seal flared violently for a second before its crimson color flashed to a dull and burnt black. Only once it was completely charred did she lower her hand and look to the boy floating in a cocoon of her chakra. This will help for now but soon they will see. They will all see. She went back to the bars and reached out to the unconscious boy with concern etched across her entire face. I promised when that one-eyed fatherless lost his control over me that I would help you. I promised that I would make good on the pain I've caused you to your family. She lifted her hand and the boy's body rotated so that he hung upright and freely in the air. I cannot embrace you as I would like, not yet anyway, but I can help you now that we are properly linked. Several circles three feet in diameter appeared on the wall beneath the seals in her cage, each with an oval pupil slashing vertically from top to bottom. She placed her palm in the middle of one, and her chakra once again flared to life, as flames flowed from the center slit to the outer rim like fire chasing oil, the tendrils connecting to complete the eye's form. When the flames died, she lowered her hand and was rewarded with a colorless circle minus the eye slit. She grunted in disappointment. This will never do. She pushed another tendril of chakra through the dark sphere, and an image appeared as if a human eye flickered open. She could see into a sterile hospital room while a nurse puttered around changing out bandage supplies, the sound of paper rustling and medical tools clanking on a sterile table transmitted nicely through the circle. Otherwise, the room was empty. Seeing no need to observe the poor creature any longer, she broke the connection with a wave of her hand and turned back to her floating model, her smile seemed ravenous at this point. Well that worked nicely. I I I nurse Tamako froze when a chill shot down her spine. She didn't know why, but she was compelled to turn around, her heart racing and her own ears to see nothing. There were no windows in the room, the only light coming from the bright overheads. A bed, a nightstand, and a beeping monitor were the only man-made items in the room. With a quick check in the private bathroom, she turned to check over the lone occupant one last time. The child was breathing steadily, his one visible eye closed, and the other wrapped heavily in bandages. It was silly to assume that the child would be conscious, given the Herculean effort needed to save his life. They'd only moved him from ICU to here just that morning. It was silly to even consider, right? He was just a boy after all. With a soft grunt at her own paranoia, she clicked off the lights and left the room for her break. Chapter 3. Of mice and dogs I I I the young Anbu captain appeared on the roof adjacent to the dried pool of blood in the alleyway below. He was 20 feet above the ground and it still appeared far too large to have come from that tiny body. Below he could see the shinobi police force, their trademark blue jackets with the red and white paddle emblazoned on the back, scurrying around the crime scene, pretending to be interested in police procedure. Inu was not fooled. Half of them were standing dead center in the bleedy earth, diligently eradicating any valuable evidence left in the crime scene. The somber dog faced Nintskat audibly in disgust. Without turning away from the disgusting display of bias, he pulled the string hovering in his shadow. Report. Two Anbu, one with purple hair braided to the small of her back and a cat's mask and the other with spiky brown hair and boar tusks, stepped forward. The cat spoke first in lilting feminine tones, her edged voice crisp with her frustration, like a blade being drawn from the scabbard. Apparently, the child hunkered down in preparation for the festival. His apartment showed signs of being barricaded from the inside, at least to the best abilities of a small child. The six-year-old could not have anticipated two drunken shinobi breaking into his apartment three days prior to and trashing the place, nor the unidentified intruders that broke in tonight and flushed him out a second time. An open window in his bedroom suggests he escaped through there. The suspects destroyed what little food he could gather, did you know he is charged four to five times the going rate for rotten food and boxed ramen? Her disgust and annoyance were evident, but she was not expecting a response. Her eyes swung down to the crowd below them long enough to scowl at everyone making a mockery of efficient investigative work while she continued her verbal. They opened all of his ramen containers and urinated in the cups. The rest of his meager belongings were strewn about his apartment or broken beyond salvage. To make matters worse, none of the vendors would sell him more food for the week citing she paused to review her notes, limited supply due to festival sales. 
but the trap set, we estimate the child went the last two to three days before the festival holed up in his dump of an apartment without anything to eat. These fatherless knew he would eventually have to sneak out to find something to eat, and they stalked him from his apartment to the market, then set upon him almost immediately. Nico was known for her dispassionate almost methodical analysis, but here she sounded furious. Inu could swear he heard her growl. Were domestic cats capable of that? No assumptions or conjecture here, Nico-chan. You are sure they stalked him? The feline Anbu held up a glossy bag sealed and labeled Exhibit No. 5, its glossy environs containing several expired cigarette of them. These were collected on one of the neighboring rooftops adjacent to the victim's apartment complex, which is convenient since his apartment building and the ones surrounding it are all empty and have been since he moved in a year ago. Additionally, we found standard-issue protein bars and meal supplements, several of the partially consumed pieces with trace DNA. Samples were sent for analysis to T&I. Intelligence Forensic Subdivision for confirmation and a match to our suspects. Now that sounded like the Nico he knew. All three figures shuddered briefly. Despite being hard in Shinobi all of them were intimately familiar with Kanoha's torture and interrogation division. In fact, Inu would be headed there once he wrapped up his findings on site. Anything else? Or took over from there. As you can see, the Achiha and civilian police force are diligently deleting any usable evidence we could use to corroborate eyewitness accounts, not that Kanoha's honorable populace would have offered any. The group frowned almost in sync at the obvious bias against the container. We managed to secure about half of the images we needed for our database before the circus arrived and began impeding our efforts. His ensuing snort was filled with derision. He even managed to get an L-square on a couple of them. The dog Nin clucked his teeth loudly while glancing down into the alley as Boar rattled off the rest. An L-square was a measuring tool, a ruler with a 90-degree bend for measuring prints and other objects. Ibiki once called it by its old name, some kind of visual scale if memory served. It was old old technology resurrected from a time predating the Warring Clans era, but it had its uses. Not a silver shuriken by any stretch of the imagination, but it could help build a web of evidence to catch a shoddy criminal. His lone eye hovered over the one civilian suspect below and narrowed. Too bad most shinobi were trained to get around such tactics. There were five people primarily involved in the attack, with over a dozen observers slash supporters cheering them on at the time. Amazing how there were no corroborating eyewitness testimonies from any of them to provide a coherent picture of what actually happened. That last part was spoken almost to himself, but both Inu and Nico caught the dripping sarcasm all the same. They all contradict what viable evidence left at the scene suggests, and all of them claim the child attacked the mob single-handedly while unarmed. Some claim he spouted several heads and large demonic wings with clawed hands at the wingtips. Others say he grew enormous fangs and tried to drink their blood. Is there any proof to substantiate their counterclaim? The elite asked despite the unbelieving tone of his voice. He needed to follow protocol just in case. There were no wounds on any of the victims, unless you count Mud as a lethal weapon. Some of the child's injuries suggest he was defensive for the first part of it, but our guy found no shreds of skin beneath his fingernails to indicate he tried to fight off his attackers, no torn cloth in his hands or mouth. There was no need to elaborate on who their guy was, Anbu had a specialist trained to work in time-delicate situations where a victim's life was on the line and evidentiary perishability was an issue. Inu snarled in disgust. Send the liars to Ibiki. Fill his cells. Bor nodded glad that his mask hid the wince in his eyes. Therein lies the first major problem. Primary suspects include one civilian and four shinobi with significant clan ties. We have Yamanaka, a Inuzuka, a Hayuga and a Chiha, all lesser clan members without air status, but clan members nonetheless. Inu whistled sharply while looking down again at the five figures kneeling in the dirty alley with their hands in restraints. Was that police officer congratulating them on a job well done? He knew the pain all of this would cause his investigation. Then an odd thought struck him as he looked at the sun peeking over the horizon. Why haven't they been taken to Ibiki yet? Or merely pointed to the platoon of clan lawyers arguing sharply with a lead security force representative, the fools placating gestures doing little to ease their concerns. Inu fought the urge to urinate over the roof ledge and onto the disgusting cesspool of humanity beneath them. We need to move quickly on those four shinobi. Ensure they make it from here to T&I before the council can intervene. If they make it back to their respective clans, we'll never get our hands on them again. Patience Kakashi, patience. And what of our assigned escorts? Time was slipping away, and he didn't have the full picture before his initial report was due to the hokage. Despite his recent lackadaisical attitude towards punctuality, he would not be late this time. Here Boar sighed heavily. Rat and Mouse had the guard. Rat claims that they lost visual on the child during the chase and were too late to prevent what occurred. Inu raised an eyebrow beneath his mask. Their stories match. Boar shook his head in the negative. 
Send them both as a gift to Ibiki as well. It seems I owe that man more than a few drinks after this. Or, a senior Anbu operative, actually flinched at the comment, internally he wondered how Inu could see his answer looking in the opposite direction, but responded as a professional. Hi. Nizumi will be sent without delay. We are having trouble locating Rat. If there was any doubt left in Inu's mind, that statement crushed it. Hokage-sama would not be happy about this whole mess, but he would be even less happy about letting the Rat fatherless get away. He changed the channel on his radio and clicked his mic twice, after his short burst of traffic, the already agitated dog Nin turned to two of his most trusted Anbu. Wrap up here and draft the written report. I want it in my hands within the next two hours. I need to arrange for a guard rotation for the hospital room first. Inu turned his head just enough to observe the late arrival, his eyebrow raised imperceptibly behind his Anbu mask. Yes Toki. For the gangly Anbu to come to him directly meant the news was important. Inu just hoped it was positive as the morning had been full of nothing but crap thus far. Anbu guarding emergency access point India have apprehended Rad. Inu almost smiled at his early choice to turn over the handling of standard comms traffic to the efficient Nin while he ran this down. He was trying to sneak out of Kanoha with his filthy tail between his legs under forged mission orders. It appears your notice went out over our emergency comms just in time. How so? Bor asked, the curiosity for a good story edging through his mask. They could almost see the Anbu smirk under his mask when he responded with, he was waiting for KR clearance when you piped in. Toki scoffed loudly. He was surrounded by killers with nowhere to run, he chuckled as two of his audience vanished in swirls of angry wind and leaves. Inu growled underneath his mask as he sped off to T&I to meet its newest guest, the cat-faced Anbu hot on his tail. Buildings flew by in a blur as they crossed northwesterly across the large village, most of it still asleep. Light was just beginning to glare from tightly closed windows as they sped by. Below in the busy market district, shutters were being flung open, stoops were being swept clean, and rugs were being beaten fresh in preparation for the daily glut of traffic yet to come. In the back of Inu's mind, in that tiny pessimistic part of his brain that saw the worst in people, he began to dissect the average Kanohan, those simple folk that claimed to embrace the will of fire and yet would cheer on the monsters that would murder in cold blood a defenseless child. Vessel to the mightiest demon to ever walk the earth, true, however, it was an innocent child all the same. He knew from many discussions with the Sandane that the creature was most likely slumbering deep within the seal located on the boy's stomach, but what if the vicious attack had awakened it? What if they damaged the seal enough that the monster could escape and, once again, set fire to Kanoha in order to finish what it started six years ago? How poetic would that be? Idiots, the entire lot of them. You could try to justify their ignorance through fear all you wanted, but the jaded captain knew to expect continued horrors from the lowest elements of the village, so long as the boy was kept helpless. Anbu couldn't be everywhere, and there weren't enough able bodies willing to help the isolated orphan indefinitely, Anbu were never meant to be babysitters. Sooner or later, if the child survived tonight that is, he would need to learn how to defend himself. This would be vitally important once he grew, as all children eventually did, and folks could no longer look past the cute exterior and began seeing him as the threat that he could be. Cubs grew into wolves at some point, and wolves fought back when cornered. A demonic-powered wolf. The last haddock shook off the sudden shiver rattling his spine as they settled onto the winding stairwell leading them up to the observation lookout located halfway up Hokage Monument. Without skipping a beat, the tattoos on their shoulders pulsed clearing the Jinjutsu, preventing the uninitiated from finding one of several controlled entrances to his home away from home. Not two seconds later, he was clearing the challenge from the two visible Anbu sentries, his head giving a discreet nod to the additional four waiting in the shadows, before continuing on from the kill room the KR, into the hallway beyond, then down the pathway to the right leading to the holding pens below. The kill room was a choke point, a vital access space to highly sensitive buildings or bunkers, where the person entering was put at a severe disadvantage. Those spaces were normally heavily reinforced, the walls often sealed to resist high-grade demolitions, in addition to being reinforced concrete meters thick. There was always a narrow passage leading in, followed by a narrow passage leading out to restrict flow and bog down infiltrators, while defenders either detonated stage defenses, usually more explosive notes or paralyzing seals, or launched violence on the attackers through murder holes cut into the walls. They were a helpful holdover from the Third War imported from Iowa back to the Land of Fire, a lesson Kanoha paid terribly for in leaf blood. Inu shook his thoughts free once they were beyond the brightly lit chamber. The dark gave him time to think, to center himself. What he would be required to do in the next few minutes would make him want to vomit despite the hardened past of the war veteran, breaking a comrade always left a vile taste in his throat. They were deep now, the warmer air of the upper levels, giving way to cooler airstreams of the lower security brig level. 
one by one, they posted on the far side of a large pane of seal reinforced safety glass to clear what most considered the first level of security, Inu knew it was actually the fourth and final chance for infiltrators to turn away. Beyond here, security only grew worse and often ended in death for the unskilled. Once through the vault-like door, they shot down through the next three stairwells into a square chamber void of furniture or decoration. Without pause, Nico followed him to the center of the room where floodlights revealed on the floor a circular pattern of ceiling work three meters in diameter. Inu placed his sandals firmly in the center. Challenge, a booming voice echoed over speakers hidden in the ceiling. Inu 0207, active, access 4479 or 82 Delta. Nico noticed that the script surrounding the Taichu on all sides was gaining a dull red glow, a dull glow transitioning to a much brighter one as he rifled off his registered access code. For several agonizing seconds, nothing happened before the glowing light flashed green once, then faded. Only then did Inu step from the circle and patiently wait while Nico repeated the process. Once the circle flashed green again, both operatives glances upward and waited. Query. Came the same monotonous drone. Prisoner, Rat 1009er. Authorized. An angry buzzer sounded in conjunction with a flashing red light above one of three doors on the wall to the left side of the room. Both surged through knowing that the door would be accessible so long as the buzzer sounded and not a second longer. The missive was to repeat the same challenge-answer process with the added benefit of Anbu Analyzer, backed by an Anbu Black Kill Squad, dissecting every nervous tick and muscle response looking for infiltrators. To be honest, five seconds wasn't very long to clear the room, so you could not afford to dawdle. Beyond that large bedding chamber, the hallways radiated outward like a concrete reinforced spider's web, the subterranean threads filled with chamber after chamber of shinobi deviants. This section of the compound always made Inu twitchy, he'd spent a few months here after she died, the memory of it making his right hand flicker and clench. It was protocol really in friendly fire cases until the accused could be cleared, but being down here still brought back memories he'd rather forget, if he could. He'd need to visit them again soon and let them know how things were progressing. He forced himself to break away from that memory and focused forward where his feet were silently taking him and his Nico shadow. Each hallway beyond the spoke had the sterile quality of a mental ward. It was also lined along both sides with reinforced concrete walls embracing more seal reinforced glass, the panels solid and unbroken. Inu knew that each cell had air holes, not vents, in the overhead to provide air and prevent escape, which wasn't a worry since each cell both restricted and disrupted chakra use on three levels he was aware of and at least too too complicated for him to rationalize. Given the audience these rooms catered to, it was a sound precaution, not overkill. Besides, if worse came to worse and someone actually posed a valid escape risk, those air holes stopped providing charcoal-filtered sustenance and started churning out nasty derivatives of sarin gas, flooding the targeted cell, if necessary. Inu paused for 10 seconds to peek into the holding cell housing a young woman sitting placidly on the starched bed of her cell. The base was made of the same unyielding stone with a thin bedroll laid across it. There was no space beneath the slab holding her bed, the space between the top and the floor, consisting of a solid slab of the material the walls were made of. The sterile metal toilet seat sat to one side of the room next to a sink of identical construction, and in the middle of the room sat a circular metal table with two stools. Nothing had sharp corners, not even the edges of the table and sink, and the air holes in the roof were easily 10 meters straight up. In that brief inspection, his eyes focused on the broken posture of the woman wearing plain white prison clothes, matching her prison-style bedroll, the billowy shirt thin and most likely uncomfortable. The trousers were equally thin and non-complementary to her small yet anbu-trained body. As the temperature was carefully modulated to a crisp 22.2 degrees Celsius setting, nothing needed to be overly cumbersome, and that prevented opportunities to store weapons and other tools. Worse still, as female prisoners were not afforded metal-laced undergarments or wraps, as the metal clips that kept them closed could be used for other purposes, their conditions kept such prisoners in a constant state of discomfort and vulnerability, meant to, as Ibiki always boasted, keep them pliable for later conversations. He needn't fear that she would recognize him. Those same chakra inhibitors prevented sensors from reading anyone right outside their cells. The planes of glass keeping her cell wide open to people, allowed access to this part of the pens, as they were affectionately called, were tinted with just enough silver nitrate that people inside couldn't make out shapes in the darkened hallway. Just to be safe though, Ibiki spared no expense and limited the blindingly bright light in her cell to the floodlights mounted above her glass prison and turned so that they shone in her face the entire time her room was lit up. If they weren't dimmed during the authorized period of sleep, he doubted she would ever get any rest. Knowing approved shinobi sleep deprivation tactics, Inu surmised that may have been the original intent, but it wasn't like Mouse would have noticed given her current state. 
This tiny woman sitting on her horrible prison bed seemed lost to it all, her shoulders slumped, her hands resting listlessly in her lap, and her face sunken as it was. They hadn't begun the official questioning, but he could already tell she'd withhold nothing once whoever Ibiki sent finally arrived, which should be soon if he missed his guess. Snapping his eyes away from the mousy brunette, Inu stepped quickly from the well-lit cell to his intended target two more doors down and scowled beneath his mask at the pacing figure presented by Anne Rat. Former he had to remind himself. He also couldn't help thinking that the hunchback Nin had earned his moniker as he watched the condemned man pace back and forth in his cell. Bulbous nose and eyes, flared ears, recessive chin, greasy hair plastered in a stringy crown to his head, the man personified his Anbu avatar in more ways than one, Rad harbored in that rodent-like noggin, a keen nose and sharp mind. Inu pushed the call button on the small grey box melded into the glass window and waited while the nervous fellow in the overly bright cell paused his frenzied pacing to glare, with one hand bridged over his eyes, to the large viewing pane. Knowing that Rat would only be able to see shadows on his side of the tinted semi-one-way glass, he felt fairly confident that the voice distortion of the speaker box would make him mostly unrecognizable to the prisoner within. Ashiro Kinichi Inu blared through the mechanical voice box, taking no pleasure in the involuntary flinch of his former peer. The Ashiro family was not a clan, but both sons were known for their service to the flame. The elder boy, Kazu, was part of the engineering division, a broad-backed Anbu with a gifted mind for puzzle solving, well Kinichi, well Kinichi was Kinichi. Inu knew that calling him by his given name would drive home the crucial point of, you are no longer one of us, you are one of them now, the ones you despised and belittled as you once locked them away. You are no longer special. Young Kinichi once made his family proud when he got the nod to join the Anbu. He was defying his fate and living up to the name his proud family had given him. Oh, the blow his arrest would be to them. You have two minutes to tell me the truth. I would not waste this one chance you're being given. Inside, the former rat stiffened, his usual sign of distress, as he launched into a stuttering tale of being called off station to quell a small disturbance at the festival, of how he'd only been gone for twenty minutes. Hands pressed to the glass he couldn't see through, he pleaded his innocence and begged the mystery voice to just ask Mouse. She'd be able to confirm everything he was saying. Inu called his bluff and to press the button again. There were sufficient police force and Anbu patrols on duty near the festival to handle disturbances. You knew your assignment. He watched the frail man collapse on himself, even as his mind frantically tried to work out an escape, a predictable habit. Rat's normal collapse under pressure did not disappoint. DT they called needed backup child was safe with Mouse Inu, let him ramble on until a pair of handlers, the heavy combat Anbu that rotated prisoner duty as they relocated subjects from their cells to handily adjacent interrogation chambers, came in to hoist him away. When one clamped onto the smaller man's arms while the other slapped a seal transfer strip to Rat Kinichi's forehead, Inu merely shook his head at the struggling creature, screaming his innocence at the top of his lungs. Anko would get the truth from him eventually, but the terrorized man didn't need to know just yet that Mouse had given him up without a struggle. Time is up, Ken, the Somer Nin muttered to no one in particular. Kakashi knew it was a long shot, but the truth would come out quickly under Anko's gentle ministrations. At this point it was just a fact-finding exercise to corroborate the story provided. Long after Rat's cries disappeared down the blackened hallway, Inu turned on a heel and departed to find the nearest Nin bar so he could work on his initial report. Nico moved on to watch the interrogation of a man she'd wanted to gut years before she never liked Rat all that much. I I I Kanoha General, four days later, Kanahagakur no Sato Dawn was breaking. Bakashi glanced quickly out of the window to his left just long enough to see the growing light reflect off a mirrored building next to the hospital courtyard, before snatching his eyes back to the imperious figure standing in front of the same window overlooking the western half of the village. He left the bar, as he'd done several nights in a row now, unable to sleep, and found himself in the very spot he now stood listening to the good doctor explain what Kanoha's upstanding citizenry accomplished several nights ago. To say the atmosphere was tense would be a gross understatement. When the good doctor opened up with, we should have lost the child if not for his tenant, well that just sent the mood right down the crapper, didn't it? At that point, everyone in the room sighed internally because the doctor's honest statement meant that the creature was awake but hadn't escaped for whatever reason. They'd give thanks to Yandame's unfathomable skill in Kenjutsu later. For now, they were simply grateful that Kanoha wasn't a smoking crater. That still left them with the aftermath of such a horrific attack on the unconscious child in the bed before them. Saratobi Hirazan, Sandame Hokage of Kanahagakur no Sato, tried not to shake as he listened to the very nervous doctor next to him, reading off the list of injuries suffered by a six-year-old boy in his village. A six-year-old boy he loved very much. Included were stab wounds to both vital and non-vital areas that should have outright slain the child, the fact that he had not died could only be attested to the Kaiubi's overwhelming need for self-preservation, combined with its restriction. 
They knew the detached Anbu elite, along with his hokage, could simply not fathom any other reason for the creature's assistance. For once, the old man was grateful to the creature of nightmares. However, there were limits to how beneficent the demon could be as a tenant, something Hiruzen noticed in the worried eyes of his old friend. Dr. Katsuo Yamakishi had serviced the Saratobi clan for over four decades. Though he considered himself close to the Hokage, he never took that relationship for granted. Having been asked from the moment of the child's birth to be the sole medical representative to care for the orphan Yuzumaki, he had taken that responsibility to heart without reservation and what he saw now, despite the years of documented mental, emotional, and physical abuse, sickened him to no end. As he gave his world synopsis, Yamakishi sent tried to clear his throat yet again to buffer out his own fear, rage and frustration, in order to give a clear and unbiased assessment of the child's overall health. The good doctor first noted that he had been present when the still bleedy Anbu arrived carrying the broken body. In a very professional tone, he quickly summarized the young captain's initial medical assessment on the patient's level of consciousness, airway breathing and circulation, noting the inability to confirm spinal stabilization due to the egregious rate of blood loss, they had to take risks and stop the bleeding and clear the fluid from his airways first. Citing fear of imminent cardiopulmonary failure, the captain had opted for speed in order to reach advanced life support services, hoping that medic nins could reverse any damage due to the subsequent trauma of transport. In Dr. Yamakishi's eyes, it was a necessary risk that saved the boy's life. The heavy sigh escaping the immobile Anbu officer in the corner was not amiss. From there, Yamakishi-san took personal charge of medical operations to repair and sustain the child's quality of life. As the patient was unconscious and unresponsive, the doctor immediately transitioned into a rapid medical assessment. Establishing the patient's baseline vitals and trying desperately to identify any existing or potentially life-threatening conditions so they could focus on those medical emergencies first. It was during this phase of his report that the Hokage's anger flared, his Kai lowering the room temperature drastically. There were just too many injuries and, despite the Kai Ubi's parallel efforts to save the boy, there were just too many leaks to plug, rips to heal, arteries to mend, and organs to replace and or save. As it was, a team of four medic nins were working with five apprentices to keep the damage stable, while the demon's chakra healed the most serious damage. The small medical staff was amazed at what they were seeing transpire at the soft tissue level, but there just weren't any other medical personnel cleared or trusted enough to be in the room, so they were trying frantically to commit to memory the demon's work in saving a child that should have died hours before. It was frustrating, in more ways than one, as they were unable to record any of it for later research to later study and build upon this miraculous healing phenomenon, and the boy was healing at an unprecedented rate. So much was happening at the cellular level using chakra, and they couldn't take the time to study it due to lack of helping hands. The fact that less than 10 trustworthy medical staffers existed in a hospital staff of hundreds was not lost on the third hokage. It was a fact he would remember well. Most of the critical structural injuries had healed or mostly healed, while the boy was in transit with the demon's energy, or Yaoki. The Kaiubi no Kitsune fought furiously to stem the leaking of life-giving blood from vital organs, while generating enough new blood to keep oxygen flowing to the child's brain, preventing trauma and atrophy. The medic nins could literally see the blood and pulsing red chakra flow, could see the soft tissue knitting itself back together. This accounted for the gallons of blood found at the scene of the crime and staining a young Anbu captain from neck to sandals. Unfortunately, repeated jostling of the child during rapid transport to the hospital continually sent waves of pain due to the enormous number of broken and fractured bones, the repeated shocks risking paralysis or worse. Then there was the downside to the Yaki's rapid healing effects that made the Hokage grimace in sympathetic pain. Medic nins were going to have to re-break and reset every broken bone in the child's body to fully heal him. This is a process that would take several days and, as they could not trust sufficient numbers of the hospital staff to work on the Jinchuriki non-stop, they would have to do this over multiple operations conducted over multiple days, perhaps weeks. It was officially a nightmare of epic proportions. The boy would be in constant pain with no relief in sight for the near future. To make matters worse, the Kaiubi's recuperative powers were making anesthesia worthless unless it was being applied constantly. Naruto was building an impressive tolerance to anesthesia, his biorhythms constantly resetting to wakened levels, thus continuously refreshing the astronomical levels of pain and adrenaline almost immediately as his fight-or-flight reflex took hold. To keep the patient sedated, staff transitioned from traditional anesthesia to keeping the child's mind buried under deep layers of sleep-inducing therapy through direct chakra application to critical brain functions, they had to shut his mind down so he wouldn't register what was being done to heal him. This had huge field applications and, better yet, it was one they could all earn to use through treating the boy. 
This could effectively open up life-saving surgery with combat med teams of two or more NINs, and the potential future impacts in large-scale combat surgery were staggering. Through direct application of chakra to several parts of the brain involved in sleep, the med NINs could actually rotate out when needed, thus prolonging their endurance. There was only one trustworthy anesthesiologist in the group, and they couldn't go for 15 hours without exhaustion, but there were several med NINs with the skill to induce forced slumber to the brain, with much less chakra strain. They could effectively rotate out and catch their breath so to speak. They would all still be exhausted when this was all done, but, for now, they could share the load. By the fourth rotation, they all had the process pretty much in hand and were gaining a much-needed education from the lone brain specialist in the group. Maintaining the correct chemical and hormonal balance required more concentration than simply doping large sections of the brain with anesthesia, but less chakra, thus allowing the nin small breaks in the action. To keep the patient pliable, they would need to subvert normal operation in the brain's hypothalamus, the brain stem, the thalamus, the pineal gland, the basal forebrain, and the amygdala, simultaneously applying chakra directly to the base of the skull and through the temporal lobe. First off, they needed to suppress the suprachiasmatic nucleus within the hypothalamus, preventing information about light exposure and enabling greater control over the patient's behavioral rhythm. They were tricking his body into believing that it was always time to sleep, thereby modifying his sleep-wake cycle. They were effectively resetting his internal clock. Second, by shutting down triggers from the brain stem, they could add an additional buffer to the hypothalamus and reduce the brain's production of GABA, a chemical affecting exciting levels in the hypothalamus, while manually controlling activity levels in the stem's pons and medulla sections, thus preventing the deepest level of sleep or REM. Entering REM sleep would relax the body too much allowing him to enter a dream state, something that would be catastrophic if those dreams turned into nightmares brought on by recent physical trauma. They could not risk a thrashing patient in the middle of delicate surgical operations. Nins would need to keep him safely in stage 3 non-REM sleep for as long as possible. Third, they would need to artificially stimulate the pineal gland to enhance certain signals from the suprachiasmatic nucleus, a fine balance if they were to keep his internal clock in snooze mode. The trick was to increase the pineal gland's production of melatonin just enough to support but not surpass deep levels of non-REM sleep. This was a delicate balancing act. Lastly, triggering the basal forebrain to promote sleep while subduing the emotion-generating amygdala produced a final buffer layer from the external trauma of surgery to help keep the patient's brain effectively dead into external stimuli. It was a medical work of art cobbled together out of desperation and the fear of chakra exhaustion. They could not fail the hokage. They could not fail this child. With a heavy sigh despite the miraculous teamwork used to save the comatose boy, the doctor's wandering thoughts, jarred by a subtle cough from the hokage during his medical spaceout, returned to his grisly report. The patient suffered multiple lacerations and contusions. All major organs were punctured and hemorrhaging blood at unsustainable transfer rates. The fact that he did not bleed to death en route to the hospital is simply miraculous. The ambu standing in the corner growled but did not take his eyes off the boy sleeping in the recovery bed. Seeing no additional comment, the doctor continued. Once critical organ function was restored, we proceeded to mend major soft tissue damage, reconnecting repeatedly perforated muscle tissue in the abdominal and thoracic regions. The Hokage's question made Yamakishi san pause. Repeatedly perforated, doctor. The Hokage queried. Naruto was stabbed 47 times in the stomach, chest and neck regions of the body. Irizen's eyes grew slightly before he could still his face back into impassivity. In addition, we were forced to reconnect all major ligaments in his arms and legs. Someone had an impressive anatomical knowledge base. They were very thorough in making sure that he could not escape. Inu immediately thought of the Inuzuka suspected of participating, Pagu was part of the hunter division. For the first time the Hokage turned from the child and looked into Yamakishi's eyes before he spoke. And what of his eye, doctor? I am sorry, Hokage-sama. It can be replaced but not saved. We will try to match the remaining eye, but that is the best we can offer. The child has an unusual and very rare natural eye color. The Hokage nearly sagged in defeat. If he survived, the child would have a constant reminder of this night every time he looked in the mirror. He would start his day with a souvenir of how an angry mob tried to take his life on the day of his birth. Oh, how the Hokage hated this festival. If he could prove who from the council leaked the child's status as the Kaiubi container, he would string that person up publicly at next year's festival. That thought prompted him to his next course of action. What is your recommendation moving forward? If things progress normally, we will begin resetting his bones once his vitals have stabilized and we have conducted a detailed physical assessment. The mechanism of injury appears to be numerous blunt objects we found multiple fist and foot impressions over 60% of his torso and lower extremities, so we must be cognizant of secondary and tertiary soft tissue damage. 
We had to reset his broken ribs and repair his fractured spinal column and skull to ease pressure to critical organs, so he should be out of the woods there. Now we need to correct his extremities, and then I'd like to keep him here for observation for the week following the last corrective procedure, which will be the eye replacement. The Hokage nodded his permission sending the tired doctor off for much needed and well-deserved rest before turning to the shivering Anbu. It didn't require a Hokage to see that Inu was angry. His whole body literally vibrated with rage. Admirable though his anger may be, here is Inu that Inu did not know the boy's true origins, otherwise he'd be addressing many more corpses, so this emotion could only be in response to a drunken mob willing to attack an innocent child, any child. Right now, however, he needed him focused on the remaining tasks at hand. Captain. Inu snapped to attention and focused on his commander-in-chief. I will want you present when the offenders are released from Ibiki's custody. Make sure that Anko is present as well when the final report is given. Immediately the Anbu's chakra resonated with anticipation. He knew full well what the Snake Princess's reaction to these fatherless would be, and he planned to watch as much as he could for as long as he could. Also, assign your best team to guard the child, lest our more motivated citizens seek to continue the festival's remembrance. Inu's response was brief, immediate, and professional. With a response of, hi. Hokage-sama, he vanished in a swirl of leaves, his body bent at the waist. Hiruzen turned to the boy wrapped in bandages and wished him strength in the week to come. He would try to visit and lend some of his own strength when he could. With a tear rolling down his wrinkled cheek, the old man vanished without a sound. I I I deep below Kanoha in the dark environs where sunlight fled the evil of men, a figure swathed in robes and bandages, imperiously lorded over the kneeling figures beneath his day's throne. A single eye flickered between individuals as his mind recorded and filed each mission recount, the right side of his head wrapped up eerily similar to a convalescing Jinch Kriki resting in Kanoha General. With a quick nod in the dimly lit chamber, the three masked figures before him vanished into the shadows as a fourth shuffled silently but quickly into the room, assuming a similar pose with their neck bent and one knee pressed to the stone floor, the other knee bent and supporting their hands. What have you learned? The mummified shinobi rasped out, the cross-shaped scar on his chin wrinkling with his barely suppressed interest, his lower lip rising ever so slightly when he awaited news of something important. The vessel is stable, Danzo-sama. He currently rests in the high-security ward on the second sub-level. Doctors appear pleased with his recovery rate and plan to relocate to a more accessible location if the next few surgeries prove equally promising. The figure identified as Danzo appeared displeased. The soft-hearted fools would squander high security and risk the container to further reprisal, TSK. The agent was monotone in his ongoing report. If I may, Danzo-sama. He waited for permission to continue, like all well-trained tools should, Danzo happily noted, though he'd never let on he was pleased. Kanoha believes that the standard 222 Anbu rotation is sufficient to protect the vessel while he recovers. The move was predicated based on access to direct sunlight. Danzo scoffed at the old wife's tale about sunlight being good for recovering medical patients and young children. Any signs of the seal weakening post-attack? This part was crucial. Negative, Danzo-sama. The demon dot bitch, Danzo calmly interrupted. He was nothing if not precise. Pardon, Danzo-sama the bitch made no apparent attempts to escape a seal that we could detect. Conversations between the doctor and the Hokage appear to confirm that the entity was more focused on healing the container rather than taking the opportunity to flee and wreak more havoc. Danzo's one visible eye narrowed in thought. The creature must have bonded at some point with the child to forego its freedom. That is a point we might be able to use to gain leverage over it. That concludes this agent's report, Danzo-sama. The mummified shinobi nodded ever so slightly acknowledging the figure's satisfactory performance. Make sure we establish a proper guard over the weapon, we cannot afford to let Kanoha bungle at safety before we can gain control. Use 4th platoon to fill the roster. Zero body count unless another attack on the weapon safety appears unavoidable. Danzo only had the one unit comprised of four platoon-sized forces, but they were highly trained, more so than Kanoha's soft-hearted shinobi. He was confident they would succeed where Harrison's pathetic nin would continue to fail. Just because the beast had not retaliated didn't mean that it wouldn't eventually. By then, Danzo wanted to be firmly in control of the reins. Chapter 4. To dream a dream I I I given the furor that Inu went about trying to incarcerate or eliminate those responsible for the cruel attack on a child, you would think he'd been aware of the child's identity, secretly squirreled away in the deepest vaults of the Hokage. One might even argue that he represented all that was good and right in the inarguably questionable morals of the shinobi universe when, in fact, nothing could have been further from the truth. Truthfully, he was indifferent to the child's plight, the woes of an orphan he'd had the opportunity to watch over briefly during his ongoing career as one of Kanoha's elite. 
it's not like the child was the long lost son of his beloved sensei. No matter how similar his golden shade of hair was, or how often the boy's even rarer moments of quiet reflection, when he thought no one was watching, reminded him of the one man the Cyclops would have single handedly stormed the very walls of Awagakur, no Sato to avenge. The boy served a purpose. He was the final masterpiece of his beloved master, and, yes, Kakashi could finally admit to himself at least that he held his beloved Minato-sama in that particular lens, even if he'd never utter it aloud. As his master's remaining Namaka's family in Kanoha had been wiped out on the tragic rampage of the Nine-Tailed Demon, his particular affectation towards his departed master transferred to the only tangible object left of his legacy, the child's sacrifice. The Jinchikriki of the Kikbi no Yako. The child's last name was peculiar to say the least. Why the Sandane chose to name him after the defunct clan from Yuzushio was, at a minimum, bizarre and yet poetic at the same time. Kakashi had the opportunity to see the seal on his little tummy, under the supervision of the ancient Hokage and Jureyasama, the great and powerful Toad Scholar, responsible for Icha Icha perfection in all its many hues. That great honor shed light on the Yuzumaki influences, shaping his master's greatest work, therefore, making the homage to the extinct clan of seal masters noteworthy, any similarities to the raging redeed that dogged his master's heels notwithstanding. He was uncaring, not obtuse. The boy meant little to him outside of his representation as his master's greatest sacrifice to the village that he loved and protected until his dying day, that being October 10th, which coincided with the child's day of birth. Inu could mourn the first and celebrate the second in his own way. It was also the reason why he could never be near the boy on the day of the Remembrance Festival, lest he spiral and lash out at the innocent not responsible for the death of his beloved icon. He understood the sacrifice needed to seal away the beast and clearly understood the difference between the kunai and the holster that carried it, much like any competent shinobi familiar with the storage seals they use daily in the performance of their duties. Unfortunately, he was only human despite the myths and legends surrounding the great copy ninja. Humans had their faults, their weaknesses, and he didn't want a moment of weakness to cause him to see nine malevolent tails of chakra instead of a whiskered face crowned in gold. So he stayed away on the same day every year. He kept his distance on this one day, and this time it cost him more than he was comfortable with paying, so that meant the thieves that stole the innocence from his master's legacy needed to pay for their crime. This meant that if Kakashi couldn't rest until they were found, then they could not rest wouldn't be allowed to rest until he found them. Whether or not they survived to reach Ibiki was questionable, but that's considered resting of a fashion, right? His mask was good at hiding his grimace as he cursed them. Inside he was hoping that the malevolent fury of the demon that slew his master would burn them for all eternity in the deepest bowels of Mujin Jigoku, or the nightmare of unending suffering, as it was commonly used in curses to ward off evil. In the meantime, he'd focus his efforts, when not guarding his master's legacy, to honoring his promises to his fallen team. Perhaps he could find a way to sweet-talk Makata-sama, fine and reasonable woman that she was, into letting him take little Sasuke under his wing when Itachi was out on missions. Abito would like that. Yeah, Abito would probably wouldn't begrudge him looking after the latest generation of Ichihas. Decision made, he snapped open his favorite orange distraction and began a leisurely stroll to the hospital. It couldn't hurt to check one last time on the blonde science project. I I I said science project was in a bit of a bind at the moment. Naruto didn't know where he was, where he was floating off to, or how long he'd been at it. At least he thought he was floating. Everything was dark, he was laying on his back, arms and legs splayed out at all angles, but he couldn't feel anything holding him up. He was just kind of there. It was peaceful here and he didn't hurt so much anymore. To be honest, it was kind of nice. Just as he was growing comfortable with the sensation he felt something pull on his belly button, just the briefest tug at first. Then that tug became a yank and, before you knew it, he found himself plummeting into a pool of dark, dank water. Paddling frantically for the surface, his head broke through and he managed to tread enough water to get a look at where he was. The pool itself was square in shape and he'd fallen right into the middle of it. He couldn't see the bottom, but he wasn't keen on looking for it. He was a passable swimmer, at best, and the water was hard to see in and salty. One side of the pool grew shallower the closer you got to the edge almost like a ramp. That ramp led to a hallway that disappeared down a dark tunnel. That tunnel appeared to be the only real exit unless you counted flying back up the way he fell. Since he couldn't fly that pretty much settled things. Forward it was so he started doggy paddling, hands and legs kicking frantically as he inched along painfully enough until his toes began kicking off the ramp beneath his pistoning limbs. Odd how his clothes were bone dry once he finally stood up out of the pool, the water swirling lazily around his knees. The room was dark but fairly large, with enough torches spaced out along the edge to help see where you were going. The walls were dark and dreary, no windows or other light sources, but he was used to that, the lights in his tiny apartment didn't work half the time. 
on the left side of the hallway, a pipe as big around as his body and pulsing with a blue light, ran high up along the wall disappearing off into the dark distance. On the right side, three glowing red pipes, each three times the size of the blue pipe, ran the hallway in the same fashion. For a second, he thought it looked familiar. Not wanting to hang out in the dingy pool, Naruto started slushing the rest of the way out, the pool must have flooded because four inches of water filled the hallway and through the tunnel. This place reminded him of the sewers he used to use to hide from angry villagers. It was depressing to be quite honest. He stopped, his head cocked to the side, while he tried to remember that word people kept saying when they felt like they saw something once before. He gave up after a few seconds and, with a shrug, kept walking. There were no windows or doors anywhere in this place, so he went the only direction he could. Straight. Before too long, the tunnel opened up into another wide area that ended at the largest set of bars he'd ever seen. He couldn't even see the top because the bars disappeared into the dark nothing above. He couldn't see anything past the bars and, even though they were clearly big enough for him to slide through, bars were meant to keep something dangerous locked away, so he wasn't going to risk the deep shadows in there. He paid attention to horror movies on the rare chance he could sneak a peek at one without Gigi finding out. He didn't have a key anyway, and there wasn't one conveniently hanging around on a hook. There was a sheet of paper higher up on the bars with some weird kanji on it, but he couldn't read that either, no one at the orphanage bothered to teach him, and the civilian school he went to for the last year and a half kept him just below the level of a functionally illiterate vagabond. So he couldn't tell if it was a clue, a warning, or a message. It appeared that he was stuck up the river without a homemade fishing pole. Maybe there was a secret way out at the bottom of that pool. The more he looked around here the more appealing that idea began to sound. Just as he turned around and was about to go back whence he came, a very small, very soft voice called out to him. Hello, Naruto-kun. Naruto froze in place, his head slowly impersonating a barn owl as it tried to pivot 180 degrees back to the bars. He couldn't see the voice past that dark curtain of metal and no one appeared next to them. Despite a small voice in the back of his head screaming, run away. Naruto edged closer. HH hello. Nothing. Can you help me? I can't find the way out. A girl about his age, and unlike any other he'd ever seen, stepped out of the shadows and into the dim light next to the bars. She was breathtaking, at least to the gaping six-year-old. Her hair and yukata were a deep shade of red he hadn't seen, except for in those fancy glasses people used in those expensive restaurants he was never allowed into at night. Her hair fell down in crimson waves along her shoulders to where her elbows bent. Her skin was the color of honey and looked smooth like those fancy dolls in Nubiri's store window. Around her neck was a choker made of black silk with a tiny golden bell attached to it. Her yukata had golden patterns all over the lower half, like butterflies, and the sleeves hung low enough to cover her hands. The only odd thing he could see was her eyes, they started out a bright red but faded into a deep gold color the closer you got to the middle. Given the wide variety of eyes he'd seen in town this wasn't odd by itself, it was the tiny slits that should have been her pupils that seemed off. Naruto couldn't even shrug at that because he was too stunned by how pretty she was and the odd question in his mind as to why she was locked up in here. He wondered who she had made angry enough to get this kind of detention. Even with how much the school hated him, they at least kicked him out at the end of the day sometime sooner. Well, most of the time sooner rather than later. That small voice in his head was screaming now for him to run away before she could rip off his head and slurp out his brains. It was too bad that his feet weren't listening. Pee pee pretty, he stammered. She blushed, eyes wide in shock, before her hand shot up to cover her mouth with Yukata's sleeve while he stood there gaping like a blonde koi fish. I can help you, but you can't leave just yet. Naruto blinked in confusion and asked the obvious question, the whole time swearing that inner voice was mocking him now. Why not? The tiny girl sighed, her eyes growing tender as she waved her left arm at a section of the wall on his side of the bars. A red ball of energy expanded and spun unfurling into a large flat disk of energy resembling a swirl. That swirl exploded in a burst of color shaped like a window, a window looking down into a room with a small child wrapped in many bandages and laying in a hospital bed. That child looked a lot like him. You can't leave because if I send you back to your body right now the shock will most likely kill you. Naruto's answer was underwhelming in its simplicity. Oh. Then his slow churning brain began to grind through what he was hearing. What do you mean, send me back to my body? I am going to keep you here with me in your mindscape. I need to keep you here for just a bit longer. Mind what? The tiny girl sighed, and it was such a heart-wrenching sound to the would-be hokage. The teachers at school often made that exact same sound whenever they had to interact with him. Naruto wished she wouldn't make that sound anymore. Your mindscape is comfy spot deep down in your brain where you can meditate, learn and get away from the outside world. Naruto looked all around at the floor, the walls, the bars, the non-existent roof, and his face fell. My mindscape isn't very comfy. 
it looks like a sewer just not as stinky. The young lady blinked, her head tilted to the side as she studied the fixer-upper named Naruto Uzumaki. Maybe that will change in time. For now, let's work with what we have. Okay. Naruto chirped. Without much ado, he plopped down in the water, crossed his legs and gazed up lovingly at the very nice girl that was happy to just sit and talk with him. Yes, it was true that she couldn't run away screaming or angry like everyone else he'd ever met in Konoha as she was trapped, but being willing to talk was a vast improvement in his social network of now four people, three of which he couldn't talk to until he got out of here. You know my name, but I don't know yours. What do I call you? Kikbi, for now. Naruto let out a surprised hun, thinking to himself one of her parents must not have liked her very much to give her that name. Kikbi's body shimmered and began to vibrate violently, causing her whole form to blur for about three seconds. Then the blurring image stepped away to stand next to her and stopped vibrating, revealing another Kikbi an exact replica. The new twin winked at the very confused and highly impressed six-year-old before stepping over to one side of the cage, her back to their ongoing conversation. Don't mind her Naruto. She needs to have a conversation with someone, a conversation that I can't take care of since you and I are having a very important conversation of our own, and I don't want to be rude. Naruto's crestfallen face brightened a bit as he took that to mean she wasn't going away for good, and he might get another friend to talk to, even if she looked exactly like Kikbi. Two Kikbi friends had to be better than one, and now his day would be twice as awesome. But that earth-shattering realization, he turned his deep blue eyes back to his newest friend and inhaled until his face started to swell before letting it all out in a rush. Amigish that was so some place to teach method. Kikbi blinked very slowly and deliberately as her mind methodically broke down and processed that very compressed statement. As the words, and their meaning, began to sink in, she realized that Naruto had absolutely no idea who or what she was. All he saw was a friend, an awesome friend that he could learn cool things from and hang out with. Her burgeoning smile faltered as her demonic disposition, despite clearly not being a nasty demon, warred very quickly between crushing his optimism with brutal reality or deceiving the poor child in order to keep her promise to her last host and only true friend. She found her answer somewhere near the middle. Kneeling as close to the bars as possible, Kikbi took a quick breath to steal her nerves. There are a great many things I need to teach you Naruto and, additionally, a great many things we need to accomplish, but first you need to understand some things. Naruto slowly nodded his head sagely to indicate he was following along and hide the fact that she used several big words he clearly didn't understand. The first thing you must understand is that I'm the reason why your village hurts you, why they don't like you. The boy's face twisted up in confusion and the robust nature of his personality let her know exactly what he thought of that. He laughed. It was a gut-busting, lay on your back and roll around like a baboon type of laugh that had tears in his eyes. Kikbi hated to do this but he needed to know. He needed to see her for what she was if they were to move in any way forward. While he was slapping the water around him in fits of hysteria, she quietly stood, backed away from the bars, released her transformation exploding to her full red-orange furred glory and roared for all she was worth. Naruto's body was blown 30 feet down the tunnel, and his laughter ceased almost immediately with a frightened yelp as shock abruptly took over. Silence. Then more silence. After what seemed like ages closer to five minutes in Naruto time, Kikbi could hear the sloshy footsteps headed her way and waited for their biggest hurdle to begin. If he could accept her as she was, there would be nothing holding them back. If not Kikbi didn't want to entertain the idea of her remaining years in this vessel being filled with silence and solitude. It was far too depressing to consider, and she'd grown fond of Kashina's company, no matter how much she hated to admit that. She also wanted that closeness with Kashina's kid. She needed that next relationship. Imprisonment held little else of value, and his seal was different as it allowed her to experience his life along with him, no matter how miserable and tragic it currently was. Waiting for him to return was torturous. Naruto stopped roughly in the same place he had the first time he approached the bars, his head tilted back so that he could look up into the muzzle of the very, very large fox on the other side of the bars, his jaw practically unhinged and his eyes as big as saucers. Kikbi blinked one large eye. Naruto blinked both of his smaller eyes, then slowly closed his mouth and gasped. You were for real Naruto's question came out in a squeak. Kikbi merely nodded her large head, her muzzle near the bars, as her large body flopped down on the ground, sending waves spiraling outward from her location, the warm air from her nostrils, shooting Naruto's hair out behind him like a spiky flag. You really are the Kikbi. The large fox nodded again amused at the child's amazement. But but everyone says the Yandane killed you. This time her snort was derisive to indicate what she thought of that. So it was all a lie. The tone of his voice was much more reserved as the truth began to slowly sink into his tiny mind. They lied to him. Did everybody else know? All along they told him one thing and hid the truth. They told him one thing and hated him for the other the entire time. 
Kikni nodded a third time peering with interest as the emotions played across the child's face. Shock. Confusion. Realization. Comprehension. Shock again. Rage. Finally, sadness. His large puppy dog eyes looked up into her slotted ones, and the boy fearlessly stepped through the bars and wrapped his arms around her muzzle, trying to hug as much of her furry face as he could with such tiny arms. Kikni blinked in confusion, her what? Coming out nasally as the boy finched her passages. Naruto just spoke into the short hairs of her muzzle, while tears streaked down his face and fell onto her fur. Sure, the village hates me. Even when those mean ladies in the orphanage used to lock me up, they always had to let me out when Jiji came to see me. You can't even get out on your own. It's like people are always mad at you. He had the reasoning power of a six-year-old and apparently the forgiving heart of one as well. She would have to wean him off that attitude if he was to survive. With one large paw, she scraped him from her muzzle and pinned him to the floor. I don't need your pity. I am the Kaiubi no Yako. She roared. Naruto just smiled and hugged the paw that threatened to crush him. Everyone needs a friend. Even if you are the strongest, it's gotta be lonely here in my brain, and now neither of us will be lonely any longer. The boy flashed a blinding smile up at the five-story fox pinning him to the floor. And just like that, he accepted her. She was his friend and she could do no wrong because they were stuck together. She was so shocked the great Kikbi reverted back to her tiny human form and promptly got tackle hugged by the blonde dynamo. She vaguely realized as her mind sifted through the child's mercurial emotion shifting that she enjoyed the physical contact. She couldn't kill him without killing herself thanks to the seal, so she just sat there until he hugged himself out and broke contact with a large blush, painting his entire head bright red. A small voice in the back of her mind wondered how he would feel about those hugs once her front was considerably less flat, but that could wait. She hoped it wouldn't change. Kikbi really liked hugs. Naruto released her then plopped down once again only this time it was inside of the cage and without a care in the world. Kikbi, despite this unusual new relationship, knew their next conversation would take a very long time to work through. She needed to know what his future plans were, as best that a six-year-old could plan, so that she could figure out a way to keep him alive long enough to release her from the seal. If for no other reason, she needed him to trust her implicitly before anyone else. For her goals to become reality, nothing could come between her and her vessel, and that included that worthless mass of human flesh the boy lovingly referred to as Jiji, making this a vital conversation to get right on the first go. Meanwhile, her clone was having an entirely different conversation with that worthless mass of human flesh. Oddly enough, as she considered her toes while planning her next opening salvo, she realized that her red toenails weren't completely covered by water anymore. She smiled. It was a start. I I I in Kanahagakur general via the mindscape here is in Saratobi, leader of the remaining Saratobi clan, Sandame Hokage of Kanahagakur no Sato, was experiencing a nervous breakdown. It had to be. There could be no other explanation for what he was seeing despite his previous four attempts to clear away without success this horrible Jinjutsu. Kai. Five failed attempts. Maybe it was a stroke. Retirement had to be better than this. The Kikbi clone simply glared at him and asked dryly if he was finished. When the stunned Hokage lifted his hand in another half-ram seal, the clone lifted a clawed hand filled with flames and challenged him with her eyes, which were now pulsing with flames as well. Hiruzen slowly dropped the offending limb. He was right in that it was a Jinjutsu just one made with her Yaki, something he couldn't purge as a human. He just didn't need to know that right now. The Hokage had been in the middle of receiving his monthly spy update from Jureya in Naruto's hospital room. This new routine served several purposes. First, it allowed him to be near the boy, observe his current status, and receive any medical updates while checking up on the Anbu guarding him. Inu, who had arrived as part of the watch shift, still maintained the guard, thankfully making the brief easier to facilitate. Second, it allowed Jureya to view his godson as he had heard of the attack and wanted proof of life as he called it. Hiruzen was not fooled despite his spymaster's nearly stenetchisled face. Jureya was mad enough to kill and would have to be guarded during the remainder of his Kanoha visit, so he didn't inadvertently make things worse for the boy. He knew the perfect pair of Kanoichi for the job, but it would take major bribery to get them to accept the mission, given his students' proudly self-proclaimed super-pervert status. Last time he asked them to babysit the Sanin, they threatened to castrate the Toad Sage in the middle of Market District during the lunch hour. The Hokage's office was still receiving bills for psychiatric services provided to minors, based on the emotional scarring of that event. Finally and more importantly, it allowed him time and space from the pressures of his two advisors concerning the ninja still yet to face tribunal over the assault. Kaharu and Hamura were a little too eager for things to move along, as they put it, so he could return to the proper affairs of a hidden village leader. They seemed a little too eager to help if you asked him. He wasn't fooled, and none of that included a free trip to the land of crazy. 
so that was precisely why his schooled mind was futilely trying to regain control of his current predicament. The dungeon-like quality of the Kyubi's cage and the thankfully still intact seal was doing little in assisting in the matter. Inu, Jiraiya, and the Sandane were standing on one side of the bars with Kyubi just behind the seal. She had already explained how she had pulled them into a mindscape Jinjutsu where the four of them could talk. It was all a lie of course, since she couldn't cast Jutsu directly through her unconscious host, the seal gave her very limited influence on his body, so she'd begun flooding the room with her yaoki and trace amounts until she had enough to gradually saturate the networks of other inhabitants of the room. From there it was simple chakra network manipulation through overwhelming force, hence why the old man couldn't purge it from his very human chakra system. Her chakra for days had been saturating both his room and the operating room the staff performed their procedures in effectively deadening their perceptions of it. Overpowering their pitiful human networks had been child's play, and, while she had their undivided attention, she decided to have a little fun with it. Kikbi was in a distinctly human form, a female human form, most likely of a woman in her early twenties. None of them could tell for sure as she was moving around by using four of her nine tails as legs, two pairs of legs to the front and two to the back. Her remaining tails curled up around her body like a tulip, revealing only her neck and head, resulting in her having to hoist her left hand above the tails in order to threaten the hookage earlier with serious bodily harm before returning it to the cover of her remaining appendages. Hiruzen caught her movements afterward as if she were adjusting something awkwardly in her arms. The slowly growing puddle of red beneath her was not lost on any of the three men warily watching her questionable movements from beyond the bars. Why did you bring us here, demon? Now that the initial shock had passed, Hiruzen attempted to keep her engaged, while Jiraiya attempted to peek under the tails under the premise of examining the seal above her prison. Dickby smirked and ignored the posturing behind the snide comment. To tell you that your concern for the child is no longer warranted. All three visibly stiffened as if they'd been stabbed. You are hereby relieved of most of your duties. I will provide hereafter for my kid. All three males then gasped with varying levels of hostility, the hokage glaring as his killing intent began to flood the chamber. Kikbi was less than impressed and flooded her own anger laced yaki, thereby obliterating the Hokage's influence and effectively resetting the atmosphere. Don't be such a spoil sport, Hiruzen. You had your chance to protect Naruto and failed, not once, not twice, not three times, but many. I can hardly do any worse than you have. Hiruzen was not impressed or pleased, and he opened his mouth to contest her claims, only to be rendered mute when the she-demon lowered her remaining tails to reveal a bleeding Naruto laying across her lap, her legs crossed and tucked neatly under his body to support his weight, while her remaining tails kept them above the sower water. Her yukata was open to one side as the boy nursed from a rather healthy-sized front, his remaining deep blue eye open to the roof above and unfocused. The blood running from many tears, breaks and other injuries dripped in steady rivulets into the water below. Even the sight of the Kikbi's magnificent and nearly nook bosom did little to hide the impact of the gory scene. His most recent failure, despite the boy's miraculous recovery to date, was boldly on display, and Hiruzen had no pliable defense. Kikbi used her tails to once again cover up her nursing of Naruto's spirit, much to Jiraiya's groaning displeasure. She was well aware of his perverted leanings and had more than made her point. No need stroking his twisted ego. Or for him to be stroking anything else while this was going on. There was a muffled explosion followed by the redeated beauty glancing down as she readjusted herself beneath a luxurious curtain of fox fur provided by her tails. Come now, Kikbi, surely you wouldn't risk all the progress the boy has made with the people of Konoha. She scoffed hard enough to ruffle the tips of the tails still blocking the perverted Sanin's view of her figure. What progress? It's there, but change takes time. If we make hasty decisions now we risk souring Konoha's view of the boy and isolating him further. The old man sounded desperate to believe that Kanoha would eventually make good on Minato's request and embrace him like a long-lost son. I think your medical shinobi need to inspect your tobacco for signs of tampering, she cut back snidely. How much more pain does he need to suffer before you realize they will never accept him? Hiruzen seemed ready to argue something idiotic about the will of fire when she waved her hand and a large circle of red flame burst into view. That circle expanded to reveal a screen of sorts that began flickering through brief moments in Naruto's life like a short film. What the three seasoned shinobi saw therein cut off all further argument. It began with scene after scene of Naruto being thrown out of store after store, sometimes at the end of a broom. The ones that didn't throw him out marked up prices on the rotten crappy, sold him four to five hundred percent, none of it sufficient quality to offer a beggar. Jiraiya's hands closed into trembling fists as he stared on in disbelief. Hiruzen's opinion of the Merchant Guild and the current Haruno Guild head hit an all-time low, despite not being able to prove any of what he'd just seen. 
In the back of the old cage's mind, plans immediately began shaping ways to earn the boy's forgiveness on behalf of the civilians that cheated him, as it was the lesser of two evils in his mind. Scenes of his life in the orphanage were too horrible to bear, and Harrison asked if those could be skipped. Kikby gleefully refused to reliving every unnecessary paddling, poisoning with pesticide, starvation attempt, and bullying by peers and adults alike. The finishing blow came when, despite getting a new matron, the orphanage threw the child out onto the cold streets of Kanoha, five days after his fourth birthday. They already have an opinion of the boy and, as you can see, it's not positive, she nearly growled out. The toad sand and glanced at his mentor with barely concealed disgust, something here is unnoticed from the corner of his eye. The vast majority of events after the orphanage involved inhumane amounts of emotional, educational and social neglect from every quarter of his life, save for the owner of a small Raymond stand, the stand owner's daughter, a small group of Anbu, and the Hokage. Given that the boy spent a short stint on the streets once the orphanage kicked him out, their collective efforts did not make up for the ongoing abuse of an entire hidden village. The boy's absentee landlord would apparently be paying a visit to Ibiki's hostel, based on what Hirazan saw in some of those snippets. Ureya's pained face blanched a little more after that with each example Kikbi spat in their faces. This rotten village has tried to kill him for the last time, her voice finally falling to a growl. Hardest to take were the scenes of other children at playgrounds kicking and punching the little guy while adults cheered them on. There weren't too many of those, but there were enough to paint a very dismal picture of Kanoha, especially on the day of the festival, when adults did less cheering and got more directly involved. When the images finally stopped, Kikbi resumed her verbal assault. You had one job when it came to the boy, you were supposed to keep him safe and cared for. Her voice was like a hammer blow to the old man's conscience. You had your chance and you blew it. Her bare feet settled on the sweating stone floor, even as all nine tails repositioned themselves behind her body like a fan, her yukata firmly back in place. This doesn't let you off the hook though as he needs you to continue providing the means with which he can feed himself. Gurea's eyebrows were knitted together in rage, but he stepped in to defend the old monkey, sort of. He was his teacher after all. I thought you were going to provide for him, Kikchan. Jiraiya considered his comment entertaining obviously, that is if you were judging by the self-satisfied smirk on his face. The Kitsune female did not appear amused. I can provide for his needs, but I doubt you'd be happy with how I do so. Her eyes narrowed dangerously, the glint in them hinting at nothing socially acceptable. If you doubt me, test us and find out. No, that won't be necessary. The old man slapped the back of Jurea's head hard enough to face plant the toad sage into the sweating flooring of the mindscape. Please ignore Jurea's good natured ribbing. The curvy demon's eyes followed the dazed sage on his way to prone reflection, her growing smile taking a darker turn. I'll consider it so long as he never calls me that horrible name again. Both the Hokage and his prized Anbu were quick to slap a hand over the opening mouth of the Sanin and chorus out an exuberant deal. The entire experience of having the boy's life shown to them from his perspective was jarring, especially given the shinobi he saw in those images, partaking in the explicit torture of the boy. If he had any way to prove even half of what he saw, Kanoha would have a ninja manning shortage that would take decades to overcome. Heck, they were still trying to recover from the losses of the Kikbi attack six years ago, and that was contained to a few hundred lives. This systemic level of abuse and neglect was heartbreaking. I I I once the three were forcefully ejected from the mindscape jutsu, Jiraiya turned to his teacher with an angry scowl and asked, what did she mean when she said, the village had tried to kill the child for the last time sensei. The sandane cursed bitterly hoping his very adept student had missed that portion of the conversation. The supposed and exposed front could only do so much to distract the toad sanin, and now he desperately wanted a drink of sake and a smoke. Chapter 5. Breaking the mold III back in the office of the Hokage, Hirazin calmly, more calmly than he felt, walked behind his desk, grabbed two saucers and his best bottle of sake, and poured one for Jureya and himself. Jureya, the answers you seek are not always pleasant to the ears. While the other accepted the saucer, he did not partake instead looking expectantly at his leader and mentor to justify the lynching of a six-year-old boy. Here is inside and downed his drink before pouring another and proceeding to pack and light his pipe. Knowing the uphill argument ahead, the Hokage admitted to himself that he was familiar with most of the visions they saw in the Kaiubi's Jinjutsu. He knew that the Jinchuriki's secret had been leaked, but he'd done what he could to contain the damage, believing that the boy could win over the hearts and minds of his fellow villagers if given half the chance. The problem was that none of the villagers were willing to give that chance. The small boy had been isolated and shunned his entire life, sorely lacking the necessary skills to effect that change. Unbeknownst to the August leader of the Leaf, many of the boy's frequent complaints of unfair treatment had been waved off as inconsequential slights or minor inconveniences, misconstrued after some of the few major events of his life. 
Hiruzen hadn't wanted to spoil the child by being the overbearing guardian figure, as that would drive people away from the child for fear of upsetting the cage. Instead, he'd hoped the child would be able to either win their hearts or learn to shrug off their hostilities as the minor annoyances he saw them as. After all, no one would be stupid enough to actually harm the boy after several of the Hokage's more pointed examples, right? Right. Clearly some of those minor inconveniences were a bit more substantial than he originally believed. Hiraya responded showing his displeasure by deliberately pouring his sake onto the carpet of the Hokage's office and crushing the saucer into powder with a calloused hand. By this time, Hiruzen's ire at being constantly reminded of his failings had peaked and he was more than willing to share the blame for young Naruto's current dilemma. And just what would you have me do Jiraiya? Where were you when the boy needed his godfather? Jiraiya scowled acknowledging that any semblance of respect had long since faded. I was doing the work that you appointed me. You knew I couldn't be here to take care of him and lugging around the gaki isn't gonna cut it for a growing boy. But all true and the benefits of that network greatly helped, it would not be enough to appease the kami of shinobi. And just what pray tell kept you from making provisions for the boy while you were gone. Before today you never even inquired about his condition. The Hokage's glare was unflinching. I sent money. Jiraiya roared. In front of desk of the Hokage's secretary, the elderly councilwoman flinched at the raised voices behind the thick walls and double doors of the Hokage. At her desk, Kai looked up at the steadily climbing eyebrows of the ancient woman waiting patiently for her crack at the Hokage and smiled warmly. Perhaps she'll have a coronary before the door opens, I'm sure they'll be done in a moment, councilwoman, the younger woman's smile faltering near the end. The councilwoman in question did not seem to agree. I'm sure that will ease Minato's spirit when you meet him in the afterlife to explain your reasons. This, more than any other argument Hiruzen could have made, floored Jiraiya and squelched his anger. There would be no just defense for abandonment on his promise. He didn't have the heart to explain that the money he sent via Tsunade never made it to the boy she took the cash and gambled it away routinely, hence the reason he no longer sent any, at least not through her. Given how badly the merchants cheated the boy, it was no wonder he was nearly destitute. The toad sage's eyes narrowed dangerously. I'm not the one needing to defend myself to Minato once I get there. The temperature began to drop as the two shinobi powerhouses further squared off. Watch your tongue, Gama-kun. The threat wasn't lost on Jiraiya a toad's tongue was their greatest weapon, but the old man was deflecting by pulling rank and that struck the sage as peculiar. Unfortunately, they didn't have much time to continue the argument as the office door opened suddenly admitting Himura and Kaharu with smug looks on their faces. Hiruzen only moved his eyes their way, the killing intent oozing from his body and lowering the room temperature by another several degrees, forcing their breaths out in stuttered gasps. Takahashi Kaiyu, his new secretary, was standing in the doorway red-faced and apologetic. Hiruzen did not fault her for their high-browed behavior. He cut his former teammates far too much slack these days. D. The CC Council has called an emergency meeting. Without so much as a, by your leave, they both turned on their heels and departed intentionally leaving the door open. The Sandame Hokage was quickly losing his legendary patience as he stormed out of his office. I I I Kaiyu bowed low at the waist as the Hokage rushed by, although he did pause long enough to gently pat her shoulder. She knew that he understood, but she still bristled at how those two fossils disrespected her favored leader. They needed to learn their place, and the freshly decommissioned Anbu was of a mind to teach them the correct behavior. She sent the smarmy smile on the face of the toad sage along with him following an angry sounding hiss to go with her narrowed eyes, Sanin or no. With a sigh and a small sniff of disdain, she set the fresh pile of paperwork into his inbox and moved to close the door to his office on her way out. They could discuss the new missives when he returned. He really should just let me make them disappear, she mumbled to herself. The two Anbu guards by the door merely chuckled at the five-foot-nothing petite figure tearing through the office like a tornado. I, I, I entering the council chamber and assuming his seat, Hiruzen recognized the full board plus four additional faces standing behind the far wall. They recognized Rhea's lawyers for their respective clans, and, without prompting, the fourth identity clicked into place despite not having a name they were all lawyers for the accused, soon to be facing a tribunal for the assault on the boy. Duraya entered and closed the door, an unpleasant look on his face, as if he'd eaten something bitter recently and still had the taste lingering about his mouth. Several civilian and shinobi council members raised an eyebrow as he did so, but none questioned his presence. The Sanin still kept his proverbial council seat, despite the number of meetings he spent out and about the land on village business. His network was that important to keeping Kanoha one step ahead of the huntsman. Yudatain Kaharu sniffed dismissively at the contemptuous look from the Hokage. She held no guilt in her part of this and was not afraid to indicate as much, at least now, that she was back among her supporters. Safety in craven numbers he groused. 
Hirazin raked his eyes across the faces seated around the U-shaped conference table and noted the number of smug faces lacking the common decency to feel remorse for the recent attack. His mood soured considerably beyond his ongoing battle with Jurea. Oh no, he had no reason to believe that particular argument ended conclusively. Hokage-sama, please review and sign our petition. Hirazin gawked at Elder Yudatane. So, there was to be no discussion. Did they presume to openly dictate to the Hokage? Believing he already knew the offending document's contents, the Sandame glanced quickly over the neat lines and promptly set the petition aflame, the ashes quickly burning out before they hit the floor. The outraged gasps in the room were expected. I will not commute the punishment for grown men attacking a small child. His eyes narrowed dangerously. The Chihefu Gaku rose from his seat, the picture of arrogant nobility. If it were the matter of a small, defenseless boy, I would be the first to surrender clan rights to prosecutorial adjudication, however, you know where I stand on the demon versus child argument, the Hokage interrupted. This contention holds no merit within these walls, Councilman Ache. Bugaku scat and resumed his seat in disgust, but not before sending one last barb. You cannot deny this is clan business. The boy does not hold shinobi status and, as none of them broke your precious law, their questionable behavior in attacking a civilian notwithstanding, bloodline clans may exercise jurisprudence. He blatantly left out the fact that the civilian council would never support the boy in any claim, so that meant any petition on his behalf was dead in the water before it even began. The Sandame was well aware of the Shadame's broad-reaching benevolence to clans in general, those with powerful bloodlines all the more so. He was also painfully aware of what would happen if he lost his grip on the attackers. The fact that the only civilian caught in the act with three clan bloodline members and one non-bloodline clan shinobi was rapidly closing loopholes to avoid punishment was not lost on Watanabe Siwa, the lone non-shinobi. The civilians in the room would most likely do all they could to protect him or minimize his suffering, and Hirazin knew that. The old man decided right then that if he could not make the villains suffer, then he would make their protectors pay through the nose. The Sandame argued a losing battle for the next 25 minutes, putting up a valiant effort, losing one that it was. He knew that clan punishment would amount to little more than a slap on the wrist for three of them. As the Yamanaka did not have a bloodline and the civilian really had no clan serving protection. Only two of the five would have to pay reparations, with the civilian council strongly advocating their shock at such behavior and vowing they would work diligently to ensure Siwa Khan met his appropriate financial obligation to the poor victim. The Hokage was not so quick to let any of them off easy, as he had a fairly good idea what the council felt would be appropriate and sufficient reparations. But Anabi Siwa and Yamanaka Rakuto, for their part in the brutal mauling of a defenseless child, will each pay the sum of five million rai. the hissing sound of air being sook through teeth ringed the council table to the aggrieved through the office of the Hokage, who, as the child's sole legal representative organization, none of the village's legal counsel were willing to represent the boy, so the Hokage's office was forced to take up that role, will act as executor of the Uzumaki estate until he is of age to do so. The clans will pay the same in reparations, either in currency or the equivalent value of clan resources, through the Hokage's office, which will be remunerated directly to the Uzumaki estate via established clan accounts. The shinobi clan heads that had been scowling at this mockery of a council meeting nearly snapped their necks as heads on their side of the room whipped to the Hokage's seat, many with happy glimmers in otherwise murderous glares. It was not enough, but it was something for the boy currently lying comatose in the hospital. Many civilians and a few shinobi clan heads stood to argue against what they felt to be an unfair and harshly punitive measure when the Hokage viciously cut them off. You have 20 days to remit payment. Delinquents will be referred to at Biki San for appropriate corrective measures, and fines will be doubled. With that, the third rose from his chair and vanished in a swirl of leaves. Amura and Kahara knew that it achieved a victory over the old leader, but they weren't so smug as to assume it was complete domination. The civilian council wasn't so self hour A couple of advisors starting to feel their age, they released a sign either knew the other had been holding. Another heavily bandaged shinobi scowled as he puttered out of the chamber, the only indication of his displeasure a slight tightening around his one visible eye. These fools were playing a losing game, and, sooner or later, their one real weapon would tire of this foolishness and call in all debts. Back in his office and for the second time in the day, the Hokage sat in impudent fury, unable to change the outcome of what he was hearing. Sure, he could override the overall premise of the argument, their defense was rather loosely based on the clan imminent domain concept, established by the first Hokage at the foundation of the village, but that doctrine was intended to govern affairs internal to clans themselves. The problem was that it was a loosely defined concept meant to shape clan politics, and blatant use of force could potentially lead to rioting and insurrection. He could not afford a civil war over the demon vessel that the majority of the civilian populace would turn against him, causing the revolting clans to openly oppose him. 
in his mind, it was simply not worth the risk. Furthermore, the fact that the child was not currently in a shinobi clan, was not an active duty shinobi, or at least attending the academy, something he would have started next semester, therefore, he did not have the statutory protections other shinobi enjoyed against baseless attacks by other shinobi. In essence, he had no one to defend him, and no one else beyond the Hokage or a small Raymond stand owner was remotely interested in doing so. He would rot in the lowest levels of Nightmare before he left the boy unprotected another year of his life. Unfortunately, Hiruzen had few options. As it was he jeopardized his own clan speaking on the boy's behalf, but he felt the risk worth it. He owed that much to Minato and Kashina. More and more the Hokage was inclined to believe that the Kaiubi was correct in her the fact that the Kaiubi was female still shocked him and that gorgeous bosom of hers assessment of what the child would need to survive. There wasn't much Hiruzen was inclined to do to stop the demon, but there was something he could do to help protect the child. Hiruzen waved a hand and whispered to the crane-faced Anbu that appeared next to him. Find cat for me. With a curt nod, the efficient Anbu vanished with tiny puffs of smoke. Back in the mindscape I am going to help you, Naruto, and I am going to help you in several ways. This pleased the boy greatly. He had a new friend that would never leave, and she was going to help him somehow. Life was a hard day today, and it was worse when you were a six-year-old that had no one to teach you how to get along in life. Jiji was nice in a grandfatherly type of way, but he wasn't always available. In fact, he hardly ever got to see the guy since that meant getting past mobs that wanted him dead most of the time. This mindscape thing was nice to have, and he wouldn't even have to leave his apartment. Now if he could just get her to walk around outside of it first of all, we are going to break the limiters that have been placed on you. Naruto was confused. Ano Anosa, what is a limiter Kikbi-chan? Kikbi blushed at the familiar suffix to her unofficial name, but continued anyway. The limiter is like a very tall wall that you can't get over around. Picture a wall with a hole just big enough for your hand to fit through, and on the other side is all the ramen you can eat. The problem is that the hole only lets you get the ramen closest to the wall, and the rest of it is forever out of your reach, that is until we find a way to remove the wall. Naruto turned three shades lighter and had a look of abject horror on his face. He could resonate with that example and wanted very dearly to get past the evil wall blocking him from Ichiraku's perfect food of the gods. Seeing she had his devout attention, Kikbi pointed behind him to the nearest, relatively, real wall. Naruto glanced over his left shoulder and saw a statue of himself standing on a three-foot-high pedestal. The statue was made of a dark stone that looked dry and pitted. Around the statue's waist and neck were shackles connected to the pedestal base by thick, heavy chains. The statue's hands were shackled together with manacles, and the chain connected those manacles to the pedestal base right at his feet. On the base held by a small strip of tape was a paper patch with two kanji characters he couldn't read. Naruto never had a picture of himself or his unknown family, so to have a statue with his image was impressive. He looked back to Kikbi in confusion, an eyebrow raised in his unspoken question. Kikbi walked over to the wall of her cage on the same side of the room as the statue and placed one palm against the dark stone. Tendrils of red energy snaked out from her palm and lit up row upon row of strange circular symbols with lots of squiggly lines, groups of them glowing in different colors. These are seals Naruto, seals tied to the one that keeps me sealed in your body. One day soon I'm going to show you how to find that seal, and together, you and I are going to learn how to harmonize our power so that no one can hurt you again. Naruto was happy enough to hear this that his body started vibrating with excitement. Those chains on that statue represent the seals that form three major types of limiters placed on you to slow down your growth so that you don't absorb too much of my chakra. It can hurt you if you take too much in during a short period of time. This was a revelation for the small boy. What was Shatera? And why would Kikbi Chan's Shatera hurt him? Their body needs time to adjust and absorb my chakra naturally, and, while there are many seals to enhance our ability to work together, there are a few set to regulate the process, so you are not accidentally harmed by it. Okay, this sounded important so he nodded sagely, eyes squinted to near slits. The bidge most definitely did not internally squeal at the sight. Nope, not one bit. But I cannot affect the master seal that keeps me here or even the majority of the seals that contain and transfer my power into something you can use safely, I can directly affect a few that are tied to my chakra, and I believe this was intentional by the one that created your seal. I will be pointed to three seals at the lowest tier of the wall, and Naruto tried to count all the others, including the two largest ones at the very top, before he realized that he could only count to ten, and starting over every time he got to ten didn't help very much. After the third round of ten, he simply stopped counting. When the doctors finish healing you and your body has stabilized, I am going to remove these three seals that form your limiters, and then our training to make you powerful will begin. Ano Kaiubi-chan, how would you train me in here? Kaiubi merely smiled and touched a white seal on the wall on the far side of the seal array. 
but the pulse of energy, she pulled a large scroll out and partially unrolled it showing line after line of flowing script. Everything I learned through my last summoner before her great catastrophe is recorded in my memory and can be brought forth in scrolls and books for you to share here in your mindscape. You will need to transfer them to scrolls of your own out there if you want to read them when you aren't here with me. Naruto lowered his head in shame and mumbled something too low for her hearing to pick up. What was that Naruto? The boy raised his head and shame literally poured from his eyes in the form of an almost an I'm like flow of tears. I can't read or write. Nobody never taught me. The boy was all but wailing in abject shame, but Kaiubi's face brightened as she realized she had her way in to fully gain his trust. You meant to say, no one ever taught me Naruto-kun, but that's okay. That my dear kid is the first thing we are going to fix both in here and out in the real world. Naruto's face brightened like a solar flare. He finally had someone willing to help him. Kaiubi tossed the scroll through the bars and into Naruto's lap, while a small desk filled with school supplies, a standing station set up for calligraphy, and a floating chalkboard that wrapped around his new learning station, appeared out of thin air inside of her cage. Naruto was so impressed he failed to notice that, except for a few water puddles, the floor to the cage was dry. Kaiubi did notice and a smile tugged at the corners of her mouth. With a quick poof of smoke, Kaiubi created a much larger scroll with golden trim and a large fox head crest on the outer casing. Unrolling it, Naruto saw line after line of script along with many blocks filled with red splotches blurred beyond recognition. When she reached the next open square, she laid it over his kanji station and motioned him over. This is how I am going to help you out there where I cannot go, Naruto. Naruto was impressed with the neat and orderly script that he couldn't read. What is it? It is the summoning contract for the Kitsune, and you are going to be the next summoner. Blink, blink, blink. Summoner. You mean like Jiji's monkey friend? It was Kaiubi's turn to blink in surprise. Yes, exactly like that. Except it's not a monkey contract. I don't do monkeys. They are smelly and fling poo. I do foxes. She grinned mischievously and stroked his whisker cheek, soliciting a blush from the young boy who literally purred in her hand. Her grin, as a result, threatened to take in her entire face. Violently reigning in her thoughts concerning the impressionability of young human children, she turned back to the scroll. The truth was that there was no such thing as a kitsune contract. The Kitsune was a very particular strain of Yaokai, not a summoning clan. While their realm bordered the land of the Fae and the mortal realm, Kitsune were free to transcend those borders as part of an agreement through the Celestial Court. Their bodies didn't go into a state of hibernation, as their consciousness was summoned to the mortal realm to inhabit a provided chakra body, which was an unfortunate oversight in the binding agreement between the Yaokai, Oni, and Bakamono of the realms. This meant that Kitsune could never take to combat with the same reckless abandon seen in a true summons, as their very real bodies were put to risk every time they answered the call from their beloved Nine Tails, the only being with the authority granted by Inari-sama himself to summon them for combat purposes. This also came with various perks and limitations, not associated with the more volatile summoning agreements. Some in Kitsune, Yaokai in general, were not bound by chakra limitations that forced them to disperse and return home once the chakra sacrifice expired, once called by the substantially larger initial offering of life energy required to bridge the reverse summons. They could stay pretty much indefinitely short of death or old age. Also, while the summons required more chakra, it didn't necessarily require blood to enact the summons, unless the summoner chose to identify themselves beforehand to their intended summons, almost like a blood contract of sorts that the summoned kitsune could still reject. Biggest benefit came in that the contract did not conflict with the summoner actually obtaining a true summoning contract on their own, provided the race gleam did not naturally conflict with the kitsune. While there would be certain pitfalls with wolves, dogs, and other natural predators, it made for a potential ace in the hole for young Naruto, should he survive Konoha. She just needed to sync his chakra with hers so that the kitsune would recognize the summons if he called. All in all, it was a fairly useful tool for the chosen of the nine tails to have, a gift for her bestow upon her host, even if it did come with its own drawbacks. As stated before, it was chakra intensive, each kitsune summon requiring twice the normal chakra of a traditionally summoned creature. Once arrived, the kitsune in question was just as vulnerable as the summoner, meaning that death, illness, starvation and a whole host of otherworldly ailments were all on the table, hence the kitsune's less than willing acceptance to an unnecessary death. Seeing as the ability to call kitsune originated from having the kick be embedded in your chakra network, it guaranteed that something from the clan of tricksters would respond, but that did not automatically ensure obedience, short of a very specific pair of summons she had in mind for the boy, there would need to be a Herculean effort on his part to force the loyalty of a fiercely protective and exclusive clan of temperamental vixens to fall in line with another male kitsune. 
the last one did not necessarily inspire loyalty, instead forcing a rebellion among the ranks and the emergence of a strong matriarchal society that refused males any form of power or leverage as a result of his pain and treachery. Naruto would have to deal with that nightmare in time, but they would first need time to prepare. Until then, she needed to get him some help now bite your thumb, touch it to all of your fingers before it heals, and press your fingers to this empty block. Since you can't mold chakra yet, I will have to help you. Naruto did as she asked and looked up with wide blue eyes. The Kikbi no Kitsune placed her hand over his, and red energy poured from her fingers into his fingertips, burning his bleedy prints into the scroll paper. He figured that must be what she meant by Chitara. That would be cool to learn, especially if his hands got all glowy like that, with the contract signed, the scroll vanished in her hands, and Kai Ubi motioned for her student to take his seat. It was time for school to begin, and maybe he would not notice the way his chakra network tingled as she sunk another tether to it, that first infusion would make the next step so much easier. Since time flowed differently in the mindscape the mind works much faster than the body they were able to compress many equivalent days of instruction for each day Naruto spent unconscious, while medic nins broke and re-healed his many broken bones. It was a laborious process that involved preventing and or repairing nerve damage without exacerbating his condition and spending hour after hour removing bone fragments so they didn't shear ligaments, tendons or other needed biological systems. Each limb was a major session, some requiring multiple surgeries when repairing complicated structures like hands and feet. Each session had to be followed by a recovery period where his small body had to cope with the trauma caused during removing the bone deformities, and so it developed into a break heal sometimes break again heal again rest cycle before it all repeated. At night, Kikbi did her part to reduce scarring, calcium buildup, and deformities, using her chakra to finish the job. This cycle gave Kikbi all the time she needed to focus on the basics his ability to read, to write, to perform simple math, and begin the practice of molding chakra, something made infinitely easier by the way she taught through storytelling vice lecturing. Morning Nichan. The Bijuu held back a groan. Being stuck in the body of what she considered to be a six or seven year old child was annoying enough. Being stuck in such a childish frame with an equally childish host tested her patience and self-control as she found small children infuriating most of the time. They were especially horrible in the early hours of the day after a really brutal night of healing his broken body. Naruto, thankfully and for the love of Inari, wasn't a horrible alternative, so long as his mask of insipidity was safely tucked away. Kikbi discovered what she dubbed the inverse law of Naruto-ality, meaning the more attention she provided the less airheaded he tended to act. As he was receiving mostly positive attention and reinforcement, the bright ninja didn't feel the need to be loud and obnoxious. Oh. He had his emotional moments, but those were becoming fewer and far between as he learned more and more about what was acceptable behavior from the memories of his mother and great-grandmother and how Kanoha was trying to hamper his development just to keep him compliant or subdued. Did it make him angry? Of course, it did but Kikbi was trying to teach him to find all the angles behind a problem before going fox mode on someone, as he liked to threaten. Often. One of these days she'd have to ask him just what he meant by that. In the meantime, she was trying to expose him to the Kitsune way of life, and that meant thinking problems through so that a solution didn't involve detonating explosive notes she hadn't yet taught him to make. She'd have to address how he could possibly get his hands on them at some point, but that could wait until later. Glancing down to the boy happily reading the lion and the mouse, she plopped down next to him with a cheery smile on her lips. Have you figured out the true meaning of the story, Kit? He seemed perplexed. True meaning. Isn't this it? He pointed to the stylized words at the end of the story, a kindness is never wasted proud of his detective work, earning a thoughtful nod from the powerful Kitsune. That's not a bad guess. It works for civilians and humans, but there is another lesson if you want to be a shinobi. She had his full attention now as the book clapped shut. There's more. He chirped up in awe. For a shinobi, it means that today's enemy might be tomorrow's friend, so be careful how you treat people. Never let them take advantage of you, but don't needlessly antagonize them, for you may have to depend on them at some point in the future. The boy nodded sagely as he soaked up her words. Someday I will need to share with you the story of our tenth Taichu, the last great male of the Kitsune before the upheaval. Naruto remembered how she'd mentioned the Kitsune was now run by powerful females, and men were little more than servants even among their own families. He bet this guy had something to do with that, so the story had to be good. Briefing hugging the dainty looking nine tail, he hopped up to go find his next literary victim, leaving behind a gently smiling vixen proud at his emotional progress, even if his mental training was moving along a bit on the slow side. There was good news, however. In the month she kept Naruto buried in his mindscape, Kikbi was able to erase most of the damage caused by the four years of neglected miseducation foisted on the boy by the orphanage and the civilian school system. 
With the limiters still on, Naruto didn't make great progress, but he was no longer functionally illiterate. If she had to assess his education she'd guess he was right around where he should be in the civilian system. It was frustrating that he couldn't retain what he needed to, and some of the earlier lessons had to be repeated, but it was better than nothing, which was where he started from. With nothing. There were some positives. The boy took to calligraphy like a fish to water. Those lessons vastly improved his writing structure and uniformity, and this bode extremely well for when they would later get to Fkenjutsu. He also had a freaky compatibility with math that she couldn't explain, but that was a good thing in her mind. The problem was he wasn't advancing fast enough, and soon he'd be back to the distractions of his daily life filled with hate and loathing. Pushing aside her normal thoughts of scorching Kanoha to ash, the centuries young Kitsune turned her eyes to the slightly less pitted image of her container. Faster than she realized, her tiny feet found her before the wall of seals, the graffiti-like representation of the seal array molded into the bars of her cage. The vast, vast majority of them would remain beyond her reach, her face wrinkling up as she mentally cursed the evil Yandame. Unfortunately, now was not the time for dark and gloomy thoughts as she needed to focus. Her problem was a constantly shrinking level of patience. She was the greatest of all Kitsune, bolstered by the greatest of all Bijk. It was only fair that she have the greatest of all containers. The problem was the amount of time it would take to make him the greatest of all vessels in a village, actively trying to sabotage everything about him. Options. She could train him at night while he slept, but that option came with risks of its own. The mind, like the body, needs rest in between stress sessions. If he's actively using it while awake and she was forcing him to actively use it while he was asleep, when would it rest? Without a proper break, how long would it take before he snapped and starting stabbing puppies? The whole train till you break and demonically restore your body trick was a given, but they needed to resolve the accompanying you can't buy the healthy food you need to repair your body fully part of the equation. Without that, his body would eventually cripple itself there was only so much she could do with Yaki. They would need a way around human stupidity and bias first. Teachers. None of Kano has learned had impressed her thus far. Self-study. He couldn't get into either library, and there wasn't a bookstore within 10 kilometers that would sell him a used newspaper. Fact of the matter was that she had very few options with him stuck in a hospital, and even fewer resources beyond the mindscape, if she wanted to keep him current the past could only do so much for him. That realization, in and of itself, brought her back to the statue of her host, its rough and slightly less pitted exterior drawing her eyes like a neon sign in the red light district. With a deep shudder and accompanying sigh, her eyes never leaving her silent guardian, one delicate hand rose to press flat against the wall of her prison. In a vicious blast of flame and yaki, the almost delicate collection of scribbles began flaking away into tiny wisps of ash. She waited for a solid ten count before breathing again just to make sure the walls didn't collapse. Then she waited another ten count to make sure her container didn't flop onto the floor and start running in circles like one of the three stooges. It was risky enough that she broke from her plan taking a chance on stressing his system during one of the doctor's reset periods by burning through the mental limiter seal that shut off or greatly restricted the functioning of his brain. It was an enormous risk, but the results were instantaneous and very promising. Lowering her hand from the palm-sized seal on the wall, Kikbi turned to watch her student. He was bored stiff and trying to read through a scroll on the elemental nations when his eyes glazed over, then blinked rapidly four times in succession. The neck chain on the statue shattered into pieces and fell away, the fragments vanishing before they reached the floor. At the desk, the boy's unfocused eyes began rapid back and forth reading motions as his brain assimilated the information that had previously been hidden under years of fog and drudgery. With the snap of his eyes back to the scroll, Naruto rewound back to the beginning and started reading in earnest, his mind soaking up the droll treatise on inter-village politics like it was elemental jutsu of the highest order. It was a risk, a big risk, but one Kaiubi needed to take if she was going to upgrade his abilities before he could become eligible to request entry into the ninja academy. Kaiubi had planned to leverage the old Hokage to be his sponsor, since no one else in the village would. She needn't have bothered as she found out while scrying into the room Naruto rested in, while the Hokage conversed with a cat-faced Anbu in hushed tones. She fed minute traces of chakra to the boy's ears and tuned in the muffled voices on the other side of the room 3 Hokage-sama, Naruto is registered for the academy for the next fresh class as you commanded. He will begin classes in the fall year after he graduates from the civilian preparatory academy. Nico was standing at the foot of the bed, both she and the Hokage looking down at the still mummified child in the room. The sickening sounds made during the fixing of his bones had left him queasy with sympathy pains for Naruto and incredible frustration and anger at the council, both civilian and shinobi. That is good Niko-chan. Thank you. The Anbu waved off the mild approval with a bow from the waist, straightening just a hair as a thick envelope got pushed under her mask by the Hokage. I have one last assignment for you concerning the child. 
Nico raised an eyebrow at this. I am promoting you to the rank of Takibetsu Jounin, effective immediately. You are assigned a medium term Class B mission to help prepare Naruto for his Shinobi term start. He knew the young Anbu had a soft spot for the child, being one of the few not blinded by sheer rage at the Bijk vessel. She saw a small boy and one that needed some form of guidance and protection. The promotion gave her leeway in mission selection and the relative freedom to see this through. And the money Hokage Sama. Use it to prepare Naruto for his first year at the academy. He will need it. His apartment was destroyed the night of the attack, but I am making the necessary arrangements. Also, he will need new clothes, equipment everything. The envelope vanished along with the Anbu captain. Kai Ubi, seeing that the boy had not started convulsing from the surge of cranial activity, closed off the scrying portal and glanced back to her student as he moved on to basic geometry. Thinking to herself that she would need to adjust his training plan, she completely missed the Hokage's following apology to the unconscious boy. III Year 17 Date 297. He lives. The vessel lives. Kami has deigned to redeem this shattered servant assuredly when it is most needed, I fear buttressing my estrangement to the matron's calls, begins to wear thin. She comes soon. I must prepare for her arrival and pray she does not rip my tails from my spine. Toru, the Silver Ghost. Chapter 6. A mile in my bandages III in the weeks that followed, medic nins fixed every broken and fractured bone in the child's body. Many would need, and would get, convalescent time away from the trauma ward. Some would never return to active service, and Dr. Yamakishi would mourn the loss of those good souls. It is understandable that those true professionals in their field would rebel at the horror perpetrated on a child. That level of violence and trauma surely must be the product of a deranged killer, some psychopath totally divorced from the norms and customs of polite society. Surely this was not the byproduct of normal everyday citizens of Konoha. Surely not the same people that walk the streets and greet you with a smile and nod or discuss the latest speculations over tea on whether an heir will emerge from among the talented Jounin successors to the Hokage. It was almost too much to bear. Those that returned did so under a stronger conviction to help the small blonde child clearly left adrift in the large village. Someone needed to keep an eye out for him, didn't they? Yuzumaki Naruto's Guardian Club grew by seven. It had been eight days since the last surgery. Dr. Yamakishi personally conducted the physical evaluation to verify functionality and range of motion in the child's atrophied limbs. Mild electrical pulses would be applied later to his limbs to prevent a total wasting away of muscle fibers and subsequent loss or inhibition of the motor neuron collective. Besides, there was a betting pool going to see if he would wake before the new year, one played between the trusted group caring for the child and the obnoxious horde clamoring for his death. Naruto's small medical fanbase had staked their faith and a large pool of Ryu on the boy to prove the latter wrong. For now, the small cadre of trusted staff made their rounds of the upper medical floors and interspersed their normal routine with periodic checks on the unconscious miracle child. It had to be a miracle to survive what he had. Sure, it was touch and go with a few flatliners in the early stages, but with each correction to his broken body, he got stronger. Despite the unbelievable trauma, he would live. The question remaining was would he thrive or be a broken shell of a human? That was a question for mental health practitioners. This staff knew their job. They were good at their job. This battered boy would live because they did their job extremely well. Once Naruto was out of harm's way, Yamakishi-sen had him moved to a room on the upper floors, one with a large window overlooking the park. Every morning one of the nurses would check his vitals once routinely cleared and searched by very observant Anbu guards, see if the few flowers needed to be replaced, no one had identified the mysterious donor yet, and gently throw open the curtains so the boy could get daily rations of sunlight. Vitamin D Every good boy needs sunshine in their life. It was a well-known fact among mothers, and Nurse Tamako had raised three strong boys, so she should know best. III Naruto sat on the now dry floor of his dungeon mindscape. As he no longer felt the bitter tears of his hopelessness, the water had simply receded from his mind. He was no longer lonely. He knew enough to still know he was destitute and barely above the poverty line in Kanoha, but he was no longer alone, and that could make a huge difference in and of itself. The rest would come in time. Naruto. You are about to return to the waking world. I know we will speak many more times, but do you have anything you want to ask me before you return? Naruto shook his head somberly. He knew the upcoming years would be hard. Kai Ubi shared with him a few days prior was it really days since time was screwy in the mindscape. That the Hokage had made plans for him to attend another school, a special school that would help him achieve his dream of becoming the Hokage, who hadn't heard the small boy running through the streets, screaming like a banshee that Hokage was his future job title. It would require a lot of focus and dedication for him to achieve that goal, and he knew that Kanoha would fight him bitterly to prevent that from happening. Her ripping the blinders from his mind was both a blessing and a curse. Naruto only sighed in response. 
it's not like he was afraid of the hard work required. He had a vague idea what it would take for effort on his part, however, without the support of the populace he knew he'd never obtain the vaunted hat, no matter how powerful he was. Cage level Genin. It wouldn't matter since Hokage wasn't a hereditary position in Kanoha. One of the scrolls here had explained the bureaucratic structure and political interplay of the Kanoha administration, and he knew Hokage's had to be approved by and through the council. That fact struck a sour note since Hokage Jiji explained how the prosecution of his attackers when during one of his daily update sessions with the white-haired Jiraiya, Kaiubi kindly replayed that one memory for him in disgusting high-resolution detail. He would need cage-level strength just to make Chunin in this town. If you followed that scale of escalation, then he'd need to be an SS rank shinobi to be even considered for the seat. The council, in all their wisdom, would never willingly elect him, regardless of how powerful he was. Nightmare, they pretty much rewarded five jerkwads for trying to outright kill him. The more he thought about it, the more he wasn't so sure he wanted the job anymore. Oh, he wanted to make Chiji, Tuchi, and AMD Chan proud. They had been his foundation in this crumbling cesspool, but he just wasn't sure he cared enough about a bunch of villagers that wanted him dead. He thought long and hard on those same villagers that had tried multiple times since he was two years of age and living in an orphanage that would later evict a helpless four-year-old onto the street. Did they deserve his protection? Should he even care? He understood the principles of right and wrong, turning the other cheek and being the bigger man. On paper, they all looked rather highbrow and prevented him, in theory, from stooping down to their level. The problem was that each concept rang a discordant note in the back of his mind. The cynic in his head couldn't help but read those legendary missives as something said after someone has wronged you to prevent being persecuted themselves. Yes, I stabbed your dog and rapey your wife, but. You don't want revenge, do you? Shouldn't you be the better man and show me, through your good deeds, how I should live a better life and emulate your actions? It sounded like something a pacifist would say, hoping that criminals of the world would throw down their knives and see the light. Wasn't he planning to be a ruthless killer? He was to be a shinobi for Raymond's sake. His future career path said assassin in big bold letters, and he was pretty sure that would alter his perception of high morals and homicidal tendencies. Only time would truly tell. In the meantime, he had much more training he needed to complete before his new semester started. More importantly, Kaiubi Nichan promised she would provide help for him on the outside, as she called it, once he was free of the hospital. All that was moot at this point. Together they had done all they could in the time allotted to correct his severe lack of education short of social interaction, something he self-admittedly lacked in spades. Some things you just can't fix talking to yourself. Yelling at the top of your lungs in someone's ear didn't help much either, so he planned to work on that stupid mask of his, among other glaring deficiencies. With a firm nod of his head, Naruto indicated he was ready to leave and, with a mischievous wink to the auburn-haired vixen, he felt himself pushed out of the mental dungeon. He completely missed a raging blush that took Kaiubi's face two shades darker. Back in Naruto's hospital room idly, she pushed a strand of golden hair from over his eyes, it was growing so long, perhaps she would trim it today and checked his pulse. So strong this one. With a gentle pat on his left cheek, she smiled warmly and prepared to finish her rounds, her hand just turning the door handle. With a frantic press to fix the boy's critical injuries behind them and on a bright December day, Nurse Tenkako, once again on duty, heard the squeaky croak of a very dry throat and, for the second time, had her pulse race inside the room of her blonde patient. This time when she ran from the room, it was with happy shouts of he's awake. And Dr. Yamakishi's name echoing off the walls. She did not see the human-sized shadow in the corner of Naruto's room flicker away behind a camouflage jutsu. I I I knew, Nico and the Sandame entered Naruto's new room amid a flurry of activity. Naruto had been pushed forward with three to four stethoscopes pressed to each side of his body. He flinched every time a new one was plastered to his bare back. Those metal discs were cold. The three nins swore they saw one pressed to the sole of his left foot at one point. At their entry, a very weary Uzumaki Naruto, one side of his head still wrapped like a mummy, looked with a pleading puppy dog eye to his Jiji for help any sort of help to make the crazy stop. It took the Hokage clearing his throat very loudly twice to get Yamakishi sent to notice him and explain the medical frenzy. I take it by your smile, doctor, your betting pool ended satisfactorily. Dr. Yamakishi's resultant grin threatened to swallow his ears. Hi. Hi. It would appear our esteemed colleagues are thoroughly verifying our claim. The arguing between med nins and nursing staff trying to find some sort of puppet jutsu in order to disprove the claim was winding down. It all came to an abrupt halt when the boy's stomach growled loud enough to rattle the flower jar on his nightstand. Without a request, Nurse Tamako dashed from the room with promises of a good meal for her very strong patient. 
as disgruntled medical staff were shuffled away from the boy's bed and out the door by protective medmins, by way of depositing bands of Ryu notes into a mysterious bowl held by another very happy nurse. Nurse Tamako returned with a cart steaming with a large bowl of miso soup, a half dozen hard-boiled boiled eggs, four rice balls, pickles, some mild green tea, and a pitcher of water. Her eyes melted as the boy dug in as best he could, hands shaking due to weakness and gratitude. Eyes brimming with tears, the sniffling nurse helped him as best she could. It wasn't long before his body began to resume normal functions, and the weakened boy needed to be helped to the private bathroom for release. Yamakishi-san turned to the hokage while the boy was indisposed. We will need to discuss the eye issue before too long. At the rate he is recovering, this will need to be done before the end of the week. The Sande nodded sagely, fingers stroking his wispy beard, while his eyes focused on some distant point beyond the horizon. Tomorrow, doctor. Let the boy have one day of peace before we torment him anew. The two nodded with grim expressions. This would not be a pleasant discussion. Normal ablutions and feeding out of the way, Naruto returned to his bed, pausing just long enough to hug Nurse Tamako, as hard as his weakened arms could muster, he all but collapsed back into bed. At least now he could focus on the next round of information without his bladder screaming at him or his stomach shaking the furniture. Dr. Yamakishi informed him that he would be his physician from now on. As an added bonus, he introduced the hospital staffers that fought so hard to save the boy's life. Even the retired ones made a brief return to welcome him back from Shinigami's lair. It was a very emotional reunion, and Naruto hugged each and every one of them. It was also very, very pointless. A traditional effort in futility. It's not that Naruto was ungrateful. On the contrary, he was sublimely aware of the toil that went into saving his life. His gratitude was heartfelt, and their kindness was well received. It's just that he was cognizant of the trauma the retirees suffered because of, not just his, but of a cumulative career of death and trauma. His pain was just the icing on the proverbial cake. The fly in the fruit basket so to speak. Simple fact of the matter was that a handful of loving people in a hateful village of thousands can wear on you. It can begin to sap away at your soul, wearing away at the foundation of whatever sick mantra you can erect to bulwark your existence versus the never-ending stream of hate. At some point, you must wonder when enough becomes enough. At six years of age, Naruto was growing tired of the charade. He was growing tired of the ongoing lie. It was getting harder to keep the happy-go-lucky persona up, especially with his mental blockage removed and being told earlier that the majority of the folks that had attacked him would virtually walk free once clan justice was finished with them, just enraged him all the more. The only clan member that would have to face any repercussions came from a lesser clan with no bloodlines run by a highly upstanding clan lead employed by the torture and investigations unit in Kanahagakur no Sado. It would be tough to avoid that. The rest just did not care so Naruto was tired of being the only one that did. Jiji was strong, but he couldn't do everything. That tidbit of information was tough to digest. Even the news that he would officially attend the ninja academy when he left the civilian school did little to raise his spirits. It would give him the means to defend himself, and he looked forward to that with vengeful glee. This meant no more running and hiding. As the last well-wisher departed, none of them noticed the bright cheery smile fade into frustration and anger, his eye turning away from the fresh trays of food, he had moved up to a bowl giant in with steamed rice and pickled ginger garnish and a broth-filled egg soup, and stared out the cheery window with bitterness and revenge, creeping into the edges of his heart. No humans noticed but Kaiubi did, and she smiled from deep within her dark prison. I I I Kanoha was peaceful. Kanoha was resting. All throughout the village still recovering from the destruction of a recent monster invasion, concerned families lulled their children to sleep with stories of the Yandame Hokage and how he defeated the nine-tailed demon. From house to house, street to street, the village breathed a collective sigh of relief. Slumbering in the relative safety of his hospital room, his anbu detail not more than seven meters away, Naruto snored quietly in the deep sleep of the unencumbered. Curtains drawn, the steady beeping of the heart monitor, and the flickering lights of medical equipment provided the only background noise. The hospital slept, a behemoth of alabaster stucco and armor-like sheets of glass on every side. Into this piece crept unseen hands, dark figures about dark business. Tor rose from the darkened shadows of the child's room, his eyes flickering frantically from what he knew now to be the sleeping Jinchuriki and the statuesque female standing next to him. He gulped quietly, his body hunched and his voice a ragged whisper as he awaited her next command. The tall woman emerging from the dark recesses next to him stood taller than most of the humans scurrying about the village, her shoulders clearing his near 178 centimeter frame. Where he was lean, she was lithe, slim of build and supple like a ballerina. Her long silver hair matched her flowing robes, even with the very human blue highlights she added this time around to match the fragile weave. He knew better than to affix his eyes on the open neckline that hovered before his vision, even if her slim build offered nothing beyond a bony chest. 
She was just into her third tail, also silver trimmed as they swayed gracefully behind her. But that didn't matter as his station as a lowly male kept her firmly above him as the matron's eldest daughter. Her sharp golden eyes flickered down to the bowing and scraping male with clear disgust and impatience. With a quick bob of his head and shoulders, Toru padded silently to the door and released just enough chakra to engage the privacy seal, doing so that it built up slowly over 30 seconds. He sighed quietly once the shell activated soundproofing the room without alerting the sentries. When he turned to nod that it was done, the silver-crowned head turned from him to the sleeping boy, her ears laying back as she bared her canines and stepped to the bed's edge. She was clearly displeased with the boy's current condition. As it was, he looked mostly dead. There can be no error here, Toru Kun. Her voice was a whisper, but he flinched as if about to be struck. As her voice was without inflection, a person unfamiliar would never have perceived her irritation. It was disturbing how she had gleaned that particular habit from her mother. You never really knew where you stood with her until it was too late. Hi, Himidoro sama Tori's head never fully raised above the level of her navel. I have heard from my position within the leaf that their leaders discuss the boy, most with disdain. They long to slay the child and destroy the demon within as they call her. The regal kitsune hissed and the placating male raised his palms to ward off impending pain. Hi, Himidoro sama I merely repeat was is said to enlighten our clan as to his life within the village walls. His head indicated the sleeping boy. She flashed him another disgusting look before her right hand flicked open with the sound of several blades clicking into place. Toru paled immediately. My lady, if I may. He paused as she looked down on him dangerously. Since she did not readily slice open his throat, he pressed on. I do not believe that killing this one achieves our desired end. She paused to glower at his interruption. Explain. Toru glanced nervously at the talon tips on her right hand. He had felt their pain before and was in no hurry to do so again. Two reasons Mladi. First, the Death Reaper seal used to seal Hikari Dono into the boy, ties her spirit to the vessels. Her golden eyes narrowed in disbelief. While well, I have not had time to fully study the complete matrix, he lifted the boy's shirt and whispered, reveal. While passing his hand a finger's breadth over Naruto's stomach, making the outline pulse briefly into view, I have devoted time to confirming that this child's death will take Hikari Dono to the Shinigami as well. Inside the seal, Kaiubi shivered and felt something familiar. Imidoro leaned over and placed her face mere centimeters from the truly magnificent creation. She never had the same facility as her mother with kin, but she knew enough and could appreciate something that was clearly beyond her ken. Second reason mistress, I have found supporting documentation in the Hall of Records to positively conclude that this child is the son of the Gmurden Ryakusha. The female Kitsune's sharp intake of breath brought goosebumps to the boy's stomach while her eyes grew very round and her head swiveled to stare at the clearly insane male. Does matron know? Toru only shook his head negatively, his now frightened eyes fixed on something beyond her increasingly confused face. Find something you like, Hai-chan. Ah, that would explain it. The voice coming from the boy was feminine and enhanced by chakra. It did not sound remotely human. The matron second swiveled her head 180 degrees and stared into the lone red eye that met her own. The red chakra rising smoke-like from the orb told her that the boy was not in control. Hikachan. The second oldest straightened and brushed her robe smooth, though there were no wrinkles to be found. I see it's true. You managed to get yourself trapped into a human. There is considerably more to it than that, but the question now is to what do I owe this pleasure? Himidoro feigned pain even as she straightened her spine. You wound me, sister. Can I not visit my beloved? We were never close. Now leave please and forget that you found me. Oh, but we cannot do that dear sister. While I lack the skills to remove you safely, I am sure mother can. The bride price has been paid after all. We wouldn't want the rate Ningasu clan to feel cheated, now would we? Deep inside the seal, Kaiubi shuddered. That lone eye narrowed, the heated chakra beginning to rise to the ceiling. Never fear sister. We will return once mother has found a way to extract you at this wretch's expense. The elegant kitsune brushed the back of her hand against Naruto's cheek as she leaned in full of malice. Never fear. The silver daughter backed away from the bed and faded into the shadows at the edge of the room, followed a half-step behind by a clearly frightened Toru, him bowing and scraping to the bed-ridden figure as he shadow-stepped after his mistress. Kaiubi frowned at this development. She would need to activate one of her contingency plans. I, I, I the next day brought another round of frantic discovery. Laying on the surgery table, Naruto was trying to make sense of the excited voices, heated arguments, and warm bodies pressed against his tiny form. More importantly, he was trying to suck in as much oxygen as he could with Nurse Maiko's fronts smothering his mouth and nose while he was helplessly strapped to the table to prevent movement during surgery. Surgery wasn't supposed to be like this. He was told it was a serious, sedate affair with shiny objects, sponges, sutures, and sometimes forceps. 
isn't that what they always asked for in those television shows the grocery store wives watched. All he knew was that he was awake, he was cold, and people were talking about cutting off parts of his body he was very much attached to and wanted to keep. The morning started with a brief discussion involving Naruto, the third Hokage, Dr. Yamakishi, the anesthesiologist, Nurse Tamako, who had a tray filled with little eyes of different colors all sitting in tiny clear liquid-filled bowls, and Nurse Maiko a younger nurse very much smitten with his one extremely blue eye and whisker marks, she kept stroking his cheeks and, well pleasant. Pep sending shivers down his spine, making him feel funny and purr which made her squeal every time. Naruto was sorely disappointed to discover in this meeting of the minds that they couldn't match his natural eye color and was hesitant to choose another. Bitterness did not begin to accurately describe it. From this day forward, every time he looked in a mirror he would be reminded of the jerk that took his eye and got away with it. It figures that the high uga and the bunch would make it personal about the eyes. The jackass hadn't even tried to pierce his brain, he'd stabbed him through the eyelid just enough to destroy the eye itself. Naruto vaguely remembered the sensation of the kunai twisting in the socket and shivered. Somewhere in the back of his mind, he thought he heard growling. Shrugging it off, Naruto plastered his best fakest grin on his face and picked a pair of sickly yellow orbs. Adding injury to insult, he wanted a matching pair. If he was going to be reminded of the attack every day, then so would everyone else. Besides they kind of looked like wolf eyes. Wolves were cool. The Hokage looked pained. Both nurses were gently rubbing his back as they laid him down to prep for the surgery. All of the support staff came in and took their places. He remembered being asked to count backwards from 100 while a pair of hands touched him at the base of his skull and covered his eyes. At about what would be 73, he felt the familiar tug at the back of his head and things started to fade to black. Just as he appeared in the familiar square pool of murky sower water, he felt a strange buzzing sensation that vibrated his head. Then things got weird. The tunnel faded out before he took two steps away from the pool ramp. He awoke and blinked both eyes in confusion, the right eye feeling like it had been run under a tap or something. It hadn't quite registered that his head was now unwrapped, his eye having been thoroughly rinsed with saline to clear away caked blood and detritus. The intent was to inspect the socket and begin preparing the eyes for transplants. What Dr. Yamakishi found was a fully functional eye identical to the undamaged one. Apparently, human eyes didn't just grow back on their own. Who knew? By the time Naruto began to register more than his damaged eye being undamaged, the doctor's penlight began blinding him as they pried his now undamaged eyelid open. Before he knew it, more and more of those annoying hateful medical people had begun to show up and were suggesting questionable science experiments. The clear majority of them were advocating chopping off more body parts to see what would grow back and what would not. One wanted to see if he could survive neutering. They were so curious about it they mentioned it twice. It was the demon bat after all. Wasn't he the expendable property of Konoha? Surely the Hokage would allow experimentation if it could save the lives of other shinobi. Hugh Nurse Maiko's bosom being smushed into young Naruto's face while she and Nurse Tamako tried desperately to protect the prone boy with their bodies. Tamako-chan had flopped herself across his midsection while Maiko-chan was desperately shaking her head back and forth while pulling Naruto's head into her cleavage. The back and forth motion of her body brought a healthy red to Naruto's cheeks, just as another doctor wanted to test the survivability of the boy's reproductive organs yet again. The muffled shriek from our blonde Jinchuriki caught Maiko-chan's attention and, with a healthy burst of shame, she shifted her tightly clad bosom from his face so he could breathe to the side of his neck and shoulder. Not understanding the true nature of his blush, she was hoping to defend the rest of his body parts while oxygen returned his natural skin tone. She successfully managed one of her two objectives, but we'll give her an A for effort. Naruto was almost disappointed that he wasn't going to get a pair of wolf eyes. The rest of the encounter petered out as Yamakishi sent Chaz the annoying doctors away. With the initial excitement of the magically growing eyeball out of the way, Naruto quickly settled back into normal recovery mode. This included boring mornings eating hospital food, which he loved as it was better than he could get on his own, and afternoon walks with Maiko-chan, which made him nervous due to the caustic looks from other hospital staffers and villagers. No one tried anything with Maiko-chan nearby, and he needed the exercise on bright sunny days, even bundled up as he was in the cool weather. The exercise was therapeutic. Stretching dormant muscles felt good. It was disturbing how much a body could hurt after lying still for so long. He just needed to move. As an added bonus, whenever he walked and stayed outside for longer than 30 minutes, Maiko-chan would squeal and hug him smashing his face into her chest. She was very warm, plus her chest was very soft. He found that he liked the sensation of close physical contact. As a bonus, no one had ever shown excitement or given him praise for making any sort of progress, and he found this refreshing. It made him want to work harder and stay out as long as Nurse Maiko could spare time for. 
Plus, those hugs from Maiko-chan were extra nice, and she seemed to enjoy giving them an awful lot, so he happily obliged her. He was beginning to enjoy the warmth, the closeness, and the flowery smell. When he asked her what that nice smell was, she blushed and muttered something about daylilies. That became Naruto's favorite flower once she explained what they were to him. Oddly enough, he began to wonder if this was what it was like to have a mother or a big sister. Was this how families treated one another? I I I, we have no choice now. News of the boy's recovery has already spread. Monkey turned to the taciturn rooster. It will be difficult to do what you ask over such a prolonged period. We have no choice. They are already planning to finish the job before he can be enrolled. Dragon looked up from their vantage point inside the head of the Yande Mhokage, the stone eye sockets, providing an excellent outlook to gaze over the village. Only the seals warding the obvious passageways kept the vagrant out. Different seals entirely were used to keep Shinobi out. Below the quiet village pulsed with the life of its citizens. Thousands of people meandered about their day blissfully unaware of the struggle going on under their very noses. Mothers walked hand in hand with small children as they went about their daily errands. Hawkers pawned their wares upon the passerby. Shops opened up to the daily rhythm that was Kanahagakur no Sado, the village hidden in the leaves. It made him nauseous to think that this undercurrent of poison existed in the hearts of the vast majority of its citizens, each willing to lash out if they had the opportunity to lay hands upon the young Jinchuriki. He is not as alone as he once was. Tiger was incredulous. You cannot believe that the demon will keep its word. I am told that it will. The beast wants to live and, if the host dies, so does the biju. It is in the creature's best interest to keep the game afoot, for lack of a better term. Tiger was not so convinced. Until it finds a way to escape, he muttered. We will have to see. Not much to be done until it tries something regardless, Dragon countered. Phase 2 then. Monkey apparently wanted to move on to other things. He kept glancing out the right eye socket almost casually despite the urgency in his body posture. Phase 2. Dragon nodded, then body flickered away. One by one, they all flickered away. Chapter 7. 2 If by Kitsune I, I, I since the time of her birth and her subsequent emergence into Hanyu status, Dinkentain Kruger and Amitani had been the spitting image of regality. She carried herself with dignity and polish even during her first century as a speechless pup. Even now as she stood upon the dace of her clan's place of power with her body trembling in the throes of rage, she exuded royal presence. Tall and slim of build like all her clan, the metallic highlights to her silver hair and fur gleamed brightly in the dimming light of day. The blue silver orbs nestled in the smooth plane of her face finched in displeasure, even sparkled majestically, as her seven tails writhed back and forth behind her slender frame. She was bred to rule. In her very bones, she knew this. It seemed, however, that her ears were having a disagreement with her mind, as they listened to her firstborn and second eldest tell her of Hikari Chan's celestial imprisonment inside of a human child, a boy child no less. It was news she did not wish to entertain. It was news she would not, could not tolerate. Looking around for a male to thrash as she vented her displeasure, her eyes settled once again on Toru, the last male of her clan, and sighed. If she killed him in a fit of rage, she would have no one left to send hither and yon, and she would not risk her precious daughters. They held binding powers of alliance and could not be so carelessly risked. But the pitiful sigh, she let the moment pass until his nervous eyes began to flicker about without permission. As she once again reconsidered removing Toru's head from his shoulders, Himidoro moved to rest on her smaller seat next to her mother's throne. You saw the seal, Haim-chan. Her eyes never left her somewhat competent son, never turned to fully address her daughter by blood. The younger golden-eyed clone of the powerful Kitsune performed a seated bow. Hi, Kasan. It is beyond my meager skill and ceiling to decipher and is of exquisite complexity and design. The shadow matron nodded once and focused her fury on her most reliable, and only remaining, male child and sighed. She could not stay angry, not truly, as he had succeeded where all others had failed her. He finally found their wayward Hikari Chan, even if it was in the clutches of evil human men. It was always men. They would need to free her at some point. The older figure with the age perfection of a woman in her late twenties sauntered down the four steps of her dace, each slippered foot ringing loudly in the kitsune male's high-functioning ears until she stopped with the top of his head nearly resting against her knees. Toru clenched his teeth and focused with all his might on the pointed toes of her footwear. You are certain of his lineage. Toru knew exactly to whom she was speaking, the tone and timbre of her voice indicating her desire. Hi, Kasama. It is undeniable among the humans. He took a shuddering breath before continuing. Their leader, the Hokage, asked me to hide the records in a new location just last week. The brief silence that followed his declaration was unnerving, and poor Toru began to fear for the worst. When her hands clamped down on either side of his head, Toru's eyes snapped closed as he whispered a quick prayer to Kami asking forgiveness for his failures in this life. 
As his head was slowly lifted from his view of the floor, he flinched when something soft touched his forehead. Not nearly brave enough to open his eyes just yet, he waited until he heard her soft feet traveling along the day steps before he opened them making sure that the ground at his boot was all he focused on. When they opened and he saw no blood, he began to breathe again, albeit in short panting breaths. Well done, Toru. Return to your post and continue to study the vessel. I will confer with the scholars to see what can be done with the seal. Be sure to send as detailed a drawing as you can. Recognizing the dismissal, Toru bowed until his forehead caressed the cold stone and body flickered still in that position to the nearest portal reconnecting him to the human world. One did not press their good fortune with the Shadow Kitsu matron. I, I, I Naruto was standing in front of his window, his only outlet other than a scheduled hour of wandering around the hospital park this afternoon with Maiko-chan. Absent was the goofy smile that made his eyes disappear, instead replaced by a neutral mask of contemplation. Gigi had already left and told him that his entry into the Ninja Academy would have to wait until he completed his civilian education. This would put him into the Academy fall after next, meaning he had a year and a half before he could start his dream. He wasn't happy about it, but it made sense as he didn't have a clan or family to teach him the basics prior to the academy. It still soaked. It soaked quite a bit. Niko Nichan came by a short while after that saying that she would take him on a shopping spree once he was closer to entry into the academy. It didn't make sense to buy shinobi clothes now, only to throw them out later because he outgrew them. They could take care of all that next year. It made sense the longer he thought about it, but it also entailed more soakage since his clothes, the ones he wore now, had been destroyed when those fatherless trashed his apartment Inu had let him know about his home. Naruto huffed out a heavy sigh. When he mentioned that, Niko-chan giggled stating that she had a pleasant surprise for him when they left the hospital. The boy only raised an eyebrow in response. It did little to alleviate his sour thoughts on his short life in Kanoha. First off, now that he had the mental ability to evaluate key events from his brief past, he also had the ability to realize that he'd been, and would most likely continue to be. Robbed blind by the merchants that claimed over and over again how they were doing him such favors in the bargains they offered. Time and time again, images of milk past its expiration date and overly ripe produce made his face bunch up in painful grimaces. It was a miracle that he hadn't died from food poisoning before the attack that nearly took his life. The more he thought about it, the more reason he had to be thankful to Kaiubi-chan. As he looked fondly down at the area of his stomach where the seal rested, the hospital garments he wore brought his thoughts to the other reason that nagged at the back of his mind constantly, his bright orange jumpsuits that he loved so much, mostly out of ignorance, now made more sense post-attack. He had been sold on them by a particularly nasty vendor, saying that he needed clothes cheap enough, durable enough, and roomy enough that they would allow him to grow and not need to be replaced every year. Never mind that they stood out in any crowd like a bright neon orange beacon. No wonder he couldn't escape those mobs that night. He literally glowed in the dark. That was just one glowing example of how people tried to sabotage his development, his shoddy school education, just adding more bitter pickle juice in the crappy tea that constituted his life. The more he thought back on his interactions with Kanoha villagers, the angrier he got and the more his gaze hardened. Eyes the flash of a kunai shot through his mind's eye and he shivered to shake it off. On the bright side, he still had his original eyes. So far, he hadn't seen anyone else with better even considering the platinum blonde Yamanaka clan and their sky blue peepers. His face contorted into another scowl, a disturbingly frequent habit lately, as thoughts of Yamanaka Rakuto popped unwelcomed into his mind. That fatherless wasn't even sorry for what he did, but he'd get his soon enough. Kaiubi had promised that much. They all would. First, however, he had a lot of work to do starting with his release in three days. Naruto's fingers idly played with a tangled mess of yarn compliments of Nurse Tamako. It was a child's game, one he'd seen other kids play when he was smaller being a whopping six years old now, but Kaiubi had wanted him to begin working on his fingers, making them faster and stronger. She had mentioned watching his mother, Kishina, doing similar exercises when she was much smaller, the benefit being increased manual dexterity and finger strength. When they were free of the hospital, she also wanted him to find some rubber balls, playing cards, and a few other items, all of which would go to increasing his manual dexterity. Naruto mentally shrugged and began unknotting the string for the fifth time. The fact that they talked more often now helped to pass the time. His new link with her allowed them to share thoughts mentally without the mindscape, but it tended to make him appear as zoned out, forcing others to pester him until he responded. They tried to be sparing about it when he wasn't visiting her. Deep inside he had to admit that it was becoming his favorite hangout spot, Kaiubi was there after all, but it left his physical body unprotected. Even how much everyone hated him that was something neither of them could afford to let him do too often and never in public. It was just too risky. Mornings between breakfast and lunch were spent in his mindscape with Kaiubi working on core academics. 
All he had to do was pretend to nap until they were done. He was impressed by his ability to recall information, often whole pages of information, simply by closing his mind and calling up the book or scroll mentally. He was also very disappointed with what he discovered were large amounts of information from his distant class days that were incomplete or intentionally misleading. It was almost as if someone wanted him to be ignorant his whole life. He tried not to dwell on that. No more special bargains on school books from now on either. He understood on a fundamental level that his relationship with his home was flawed in many ways, encouraging this level of ongoing sabotage, perhaps even to a degree beyond his capability to repair without assistance. He would have to cultivate the few positive relationships he had and take others as they developed. It was during one of those morning study sessions that Naruto altered his relationship with the nine-tailed vixen with his usual aplomb and heartfelt honesty. He had been reviewing feudal history and opened one of the many textbooks that now sat upon the many bookshelf rows in his dreary mindscape. The book showed cutaway architecture drawings and beautifully detailed photos of castles surrounded by cherry blossoms and rock gardens. After spending an hour studying the text carefully, the boy looked up at his demon sensei and stared for several minutes into her ruby orbs. Ayubi blinked once, then twice, opening her mouth to ask if she had something on her face as the boy pointedly closed his eyes, took a deep breath, and exhaled slowly. At that moment, his mindscape changed, the walls and ground flowing away from their study area, the dingy greys and browns bleeding into cherrywood flooring in a large central room, with rice paper walls and sliding shoji panels, framed in the same luxurious dark cherry tones. The bars of her cage, those imposing and unyielding titans of metal, withdrew into the floor without a trace. As they faded, golden kanji symbols appeared along the band of her choker matching seals that appeared above the doors to the room. The room was easily 40 meters across with high ceilings made from more of the dark timber beams. Heavy columns inscribed with runes and symbols lined both sides of the rooms. Where he sat, the entrance into this room was just off to his right, his quadrant of the room converted into a place of study with his desk, easel, bookshelves, and other requirements. There were door panels on each of the other walls, large double panels with kanji placards above the door panels for the word seal that used to hang above her bars, which were now wonderfully absent. In the center of the room rose a platform made of more cherry wood, a square day surrounded with three steps. In the center of the platform lay a traditional table with mats for kneeling on opposite sides. Sunken into the wood to the left of the table lay a small fire pit with a teapot resting on metal grating. The other three quadrants of the room had shelves available to hold more literature, but nothing planned for space. Overall, the room exuded warmth and sinful luxury. Kaiubi was stunned, her jaw hanging open as she spun in circles to take it all in. Naruto frowned once more to really concentrate and focused on the opposite corner of the room. The bookshelves there vanished, and a large fireplace spiraled open from the wall. Above the hearth, tendrils of vine snaked their way up along the wall to form a mahogany picture frame three meters in height, while smaller tendrils danced and weaved their way inside the frame. When it was complete, a charcoal sketch of Kaiubi seated on an ornate chair swirled into view with Naruto standing just behind and over her left shoulder, one hand resting on the gentle slope of her trapezius. The picture was done in the style of Michelangelo Buonarotti, a shadowed charcoal drawing with most of the detail shown in their faces. The detail was exquisite enough to clearly indicate the two subjects. Beneath the picture, just a few meters from the warming fire, blossomed a circular mattress a meter thick and ten meters in diameter, made of crimson velvet resting on a cherry wood platform. The silken sheets were made of gold with a burgundy comforter to snuggle under. To the right of the bed nestled next to the wall sat a human-sized privacy screen with soaring cranes and prancing foxes. Kaiubi tried desperately to steady her breathing as she turned to her jailer, eyes wide in shock. Naruto merely smiled, the first honest one in his entire life, rose from his desk, then approached the powerful demon to caress her on the forehead. As a result, Kaiubi blinked and turned a shade of red that almost matched her hair. Before her gaping could get any worse, Naruto hugged her, laid his right cheek against hers and said, you have lifted the darkness from my eyes. I thought it only fair that I share some of that light with you. At that, she melted in his arms. The boy released her and went back to his desk to finish reading his interesting book on the ancient Edo period. Kaiubi had been shocked into paralysis, never once returning the hug as she stared intently at the child before her. His mind was too young to work this way. Most kids his age played ninja and chased each other in the park with sticks. And again, most kids his age were not dodging angry mobs or assassins by their sixth year either. No, his innocence was lost long ago, and his mind, now unencumbered by limiters, was beginning to catch up with his already much older soul. Kaiubi mourned this realization then set about exploring her new home with a happy titter. She squealed like a fangirl when she opened one of the side doors and saw the exquisite rock garden complete with koi pond and sakura trees. Her statue of Naruto rested on a marble platform in the middle of the pond. 
She nearly went back in to caress the boy when she opened the other side door to see the large meadow complete with forest a few hundred yards off in the distance. The wildlife scampering about made her heart race with a long-forgotten thrill. Being a prisoner with this host might not be such a bad thing after all. I I I a gentle buzzing interrupted his study session. With a smile and a quick nod, Kaiubi sent him on his way, his vision clearing to see a gloved hand waving up and down in front of his face. Naruto apologized sheepishly to Inu who waved it off seeing as the boy was clearly lost in deep thought. Naruto gave another sheepish smile to the Hokage and quickly detached his hands from the yarn looped around his fingers. Inu raised an eyebrow behind his mask at this but made no outward comment. Naruto, the boy focused on the old man, will be sending a message to Jiraiya that you're being released from the hospital soon. You should know that he will be wanting to visit with you upon his next visit. Without missing a beat, Naruto responded listlessly with, Hi, Aji Asen. As unenthused as the boy sounded, he did perk up when Inu bit his thumb hard enough to draw blood, ran quickly through a series of five hand signs, and then slammed his palm on the floor. A ring of kanji symbols linked into a circle fanned out from his feet, then condensed into a cloud of smoke. What appeared in the smoke was a small dog wearing a blue jacket and googles. Naruto blinked a few times in shock. Inu reached into a pocket and handed the dog a small scroll with instructions to deliver this to the Toad Sanin. The dog responded in a very deep voice with, Hi. Before clamping down gently on the scroll and vanishing in another poof of smoke. Naruto blinked three more times in rapid succession. The dog-faced Anbu stood up again and looked down into the shocked face of Yuzumaki Naruto. You okay Naruto? Naruto nodded his head very slowly. Yes, but it'll be even better if you show me those hand signs again. Inu chuckled softly. Sure, I can show you again, but it won't do you any good unless you have a summoning contract, and those are difficult to come by. Naruto shrugged it off. Ten minutes later he was going over the quick five seal sequence again and again until it was ingrained into his mind. Over the next three days in the hospital, he would have it to an almost reflexive response. He could always get Kaiubi to teach him how to manipulate chakra for the summons after the fact. I, I, I afternoons were spent on physical training when he could get away with it. Hospital staff once found him doing sit-ups and push-ups, and the scolding and sking had been truly monumental. Since physical development didn't stick with him in the mindscape, the best he could do was to learn how to mold chakra and meditate, two things Kaiubi said he needed desperately to improve upon, but he had no other way to contain the overabundance of energy stockpiling in his limbs. Everyone knew Naruto was a walking dynamo. The boy had so much energy he nearly vibrated in place if he sat still too long. Naruto attributed this to his normally cheery disposition, and most believed him. Kaiubi attributed this to his abnormally large chakra coils and chakra reserves, which were always overflowing, thanks to her periodically flooding his chakra network while he slept. His fun meter virtually stayed pegged on full. Kaiubi figured it was about time to teach him how to tap into those vast pools of energy, and they had almost a year and a half to get prepared. She explained the nature of chakra and its four sources, mind, body, spirit, thanks to her and nature. The first three he had ready access to but needed to be developed. The fourth had to be trained in by specialists as overexposure was lethal, despite some kitsune being naturally able to tap into it with limited success. Only the toads of Mount Mayaboku regularly engaged in its use, making their toad sages extremely rare and exceptionally dangerous. Iwubi was quick to shut down his fevered dreams of becoming the next toad mega sage, overusing nature chakra tended to turn you to stone. Naruto gulped and swore to focus on his primary three, and, if he could get a chance to train on Mount Mayaboku, then he would do so. As it was, Naruto already had huge reserves of chakra thanks to Kaiubi's effect on his body. Early attempts at corling his uncooperative chakra ended up with his mindscape avatar spontaneously combusting or ethereal shoji panels being blown apart. One accident even blew Kaiubi's yukata clear off her body, resulting in an indignant squeak, followed by a frantic scramble to get behind the changing screen. The fierce blush tomatoing his entire head at the side of her bare bottom nearly floored him. After apologizing to the Kaiubi from the other side of the screen and repairing the mindscape damage, they decided it was a nice day outside and that they needed to train in the meadow before the forest. Kaiubi made sure to stay behind him so she didn't lose any more yukatas. So long as her clothes stayed on, the basics of his chakra control went fairly well. He learned how to feel for his chakra, how to pull it down into his hara, the core of his body, and either trickle or flood it to different parts of his body. He had already mastered entering a meditative state, the ability to enter and depart his mindscape at will, and was trying to funnel minuscule amounts of chakra to his ears when he heard sniffling and soft slippered footsteps approaching his door. Cutting off the flow of chakra, he spun his body to face the door to the hallway and waited. Dr. Yamakishi, Nurse Tamako, Nurse Maiko, and Niko Nichan entered his room not a minute later. 
The sniffling was coming from the two nurses. Naruto was touched by their tears. With the exuberance of the average six-year-old, he hopped off the bed and ran to Tamako-chan's waiting embrace. Breaking away slowly, he moved over to Maiko-chan and repeated the tender farewell, trying to ignore the annoying way the woman's fronts rested on his forehead. She didn't seem to mind so he tried not to draw attention to it, instead stepping back to take the hospital sweats offered by the good doctor. Thickby, the only one partial to his inner thoughts, chuckled at his annoyance she imagined in another half dozen years when puberty hit he'd be missing that sensation of kashiani pressure on his head or any other part of his body. With a friendly ruffling of his hair, the doctor turned to leave with his nurses, Nico taking a seat in the room's only chair to wait for him to change clothes. Naruto's clothes from the night of the attack were shredded. The clothes left in his apartment, along with everything else, had been destroyed, so the sweats became a parting gift to the orphan with nothing to return home to. Once changed and released into the bright morning sun, Nico began the process of buying new clothes for her small charge and getting him settled into his new place. Naruto, kind soul that he was, tried to save her a little frustration and warn her as they stood before a gleaming storefront reading, Matsumoto's fine apparel. He didn't even mind her helping him with the pronunciation it was the angry store owner inside he was concerned with. But the friendly chiming of the bell above the door, a chunky man sporting a tacky pencil-thin mustache and shiny head lacking any hair that she could see, glanced up from his countertop, his eyes squeezing nearly shut as his fake smile spread from ear to ear. Ah. Welcome to Mitsuma what are you doing here D-Bad I thought we already addressed this. It must be the masks all too efficient at hiding Anbu facial expressions. Mr. Matsumoto never noticed Nico's eyes narrowing to razor thin slits behind it, but she saw every angry twitch of his sweaty face once Matsumoto Kondo's beady black eyes slid from her Anbu mask to the child's downtrodden whiskers. He was so outraged at the child's presence that he never bothered to note the change in her body posture as she prepared to gut him like a fish at his near slip to the third's law. Matsumoto did notice the gathering of customers in his very popular storefront as they gathered to watch the man heroically throw the demon bat out of his store yet again. Na, Niko Ni Chan, Naruto was gently tugging on her cloak, let's just go. This place doesn't have the kinds of clothes I like anyway. He was trying to be helpful and end the encounter before things could turn ugly. Old man Matsumoto didn't want to end the show, unfortunately, nor would he allow the demon child of Konoha to end the encounter with the upper hand and inhaled a double lungful of air to let loose another verbal tirade at the small child he knew would never lash out at him. His impending barrage seized up with a tea kettle-like squeak as Nico's standard issue ninja, the blade singing with a high-pitched ringing sound as it hissed through the air, stopped mere millimeters from Matsumoto's neck. She casually noted the boy's wince as one of his fingers shot up to rub an abused ear and made a mental note to share that discovery with her hokage. In the meantime, she turned her attention back to the snarling shopkeeper trying to lean back and away from her blade, much to the shocked gasps of his customers and employees. It only spurred on her growing sense of rage, despite the even tone of her voice. Are you forgetting something? Hondo's eyes darted between the Anbu's inhuman mask, her gleaming blade, and the partially hidden face of the boy standing behind her left hip. He may have gulped nervously, but his disdain never faded he knew his rights under the council's law. I forget nothing. You cannot force me to serve it no matter your station, Anbu-san. Nico knew he was right despite still wanting in her heart of hearts to gut him like a fish. I am not required to serve it, he flinched as her grip tightened on the pommel, and so long as I don't violate the law, you cannot do a thing about it. He raised his chin smugly in victory, despite having backed up as far as he could behind the counter to avoid having his throat sliced open. With her teeth gnashing beneath the porcelain of her mask, Nico gently reached behind her to grab onto Naruto's shoulder, right before they disappeared into a swirl of leaves, which settled calmly to the floor of the owner's shop. It only took four separate instances after that first unpleasant one, four more owner encounters ending with the Anbu, threatening to arrest a civilian vendor to get him the things he needed. By then, Nico was incensed. Naruto merely took it as a better-than-average day. By the time they reached his apartment, the special Jounin was nearly ready to slit someone's throat with her nails. Naruto thought she was too angry to realize where they were as she exited the stairwell from the highest floor of his apartment building. His old apartment was on the middle floor of the three-story building, turned left and put a shiny set of new keys into the lock. She opened the door and stood off to the side so that he could enter and look around for himself. Okajama pulled some strings and moved you to a new place, she started off. It was becoming too much of a hassle to keep hiring out Genin teams to clean your old apartment after drunks and degenerates kept breaking in and trashing it. Naruto smirked just a little. No one is to know that you live up here now and Anbu are to increase their patrolling of this area. Naruto didn't say a word to dissuade her. Doubling nothing still meant nothing so, as far as he was concerned, he was still on his own. He'd have to be careful about protecting his new home though, and the first thing he noted was the reinforced door with extra locks. 
those would come in handy. His new apartment was basically two apartments joined as one with the dividing wall knocked out. It was a nice touch. The wooden floors weren't super high quality, but they were sturdy and recently stained and polished. The kitchens had been joined into one with a large island, complete with smaller sink and hanging pots and pans in the middle, plus a real stove, instead of the sad hot plate in his last place. The bathrooms had also been joined to save plumbing costs, but what was once a tiny shower closet now had a two-person onsen for steaming. To wrap it all up, the bedroom of the second apartment had his new bed and amenities, the living room near the door had been changed into a living room and small corner study. If he added an easel, it would be similar to his corner in Kaiubi's new cell. He could hear her trilling in his mind with delight at the surprise. The sande may have earned a few points of respect in her book with this gift. Nico closed the door as she entered and handed him the keys. After they dumped his purchases in the bedroom, she walked him through the apartment, showed him the restocked kitchen, and pointed to a list on the refrigerator of places she found that would sell food to him without trying to screw him over. Her body stiffened when the blonde juggernaut nearly tackled her to the floor in an exuberant hug, his face buried in her stomach while his shoulders shook with his tiny sobs of joy. She gently rubbed his head until he released her, then set about finding out how well off he would be without her. Can you cook Naruto-kun? Naruto pointed to the cereal and instant ramen cups. Despite the cheeky thumbs up, she blew out a heavy sigh and rolled up her sleeves. It looked like dinner with her new boyfriend would have to wait. Not good enough little guy. Twice a week you and I are going to start having some cooking lessons. And so, they did. By the end of the current school year, Naruto went from complete kitchen novice to a barely survivable kitchen disaster. At least Nico didn't feel as bad leaving him alone. The fact that he seemed to remember whole recipes without having to refer to books, even correcting a few of her measurements, which she double-checked anyway, greatly reduced her concern. His freakishly adept talent with kitchen knives did worry her a bit. He also learned a few helpful things like the fact that he had a bank account in his name. It had been established on the date of his birth and had been receiving regular stipend payments every month. These monthly payments were considerable adding up to a tidy sum after six years, even if he couldn't get into the bank without being thrown out. When questioned about why he wasn't more thrilled about this news, Naruto simply threw the paperwork back into the new fireproof safe, buried in the bottom of his closet with a snarl, the very large numbers from the trial compensation brought back unhappy memories. So what if you're wealthy if you can't enter shops to spend the money or even get into the bank to get to it? He'd worry about that later. Nico blinked at his larger-than-six-year-old vocabulary and decided that information concerning the ongoing campaign of discrimination would need to be brought up with the hokage. He also learned that he actually liked real food. Not hard to discover once you've had home-cooked food. Oh sure, Raymond was still his favorite, but now he had access to healthy foods on a regular basis, even if it meant traveling a bit for it. Raymond was cheap, accessible, and required absolutely no talent to make. He looked forward to his cooking lessons with Nico Ni Chan and often apologized for taking her away from her boyfriend, something she routinely and casually dismissed. To make up for it, he spent many hours beforehand poring over cookbooks and trying new dishes for his Ni Chan when she wasn't off on missions and feeling down. This led to a fairly comfortable routine, that is until summer hit and Nico had to go on an extended patrol. Resigned to a horrible two-month break, Naruto woke up one day to find his whole existence was going to change. Rise and shine sleepy head. Naruto groaned and stretched. Five more minutes. While the new two-way communication without the dreamscape was nice, it did make things a bit awkward first thing in the morning going through the morning routine. It almost felt like he was being watched. Sorry Narukan he winced at the nickname but we need to take care of a few things today. Naruto grumbled but detached himself from his blanket's mummy-like shroud and stumbled through his morning ablutions. Kaiubi's catcalls in the shower didn't help much. Once he was done, he flopped down at the desk in his corner office, a fresh cup of tea in his hands and his eyes half awake. Kaiubi's next sentence snapped his pretty blues open like a parachute at 4,000 feet. The day we summon your den mates. Naruto froze with the cup still to his lips and, as calmly as he could, set it down on the desk before leaping from his chair and dancing in frantic circles. I take it you approve then and I have your ad Naruto. He slammed back into his chair at full attention. Good. You remember the hand seals for this. A quick nod. Don't forget the blood sacrifice. Another quick nod. When you complete the summons, you are going to say, Kuchius no Jutsu. Murden Suinzu. Can you remember that? Another quick nod followed by happy bouncing in place. Sigh. Alright. You may begin. Despite the excitement rolling off the boy in waves, he was nervous. Extremely nervous. Iwubi had hinted to this first summons, this very special summons, as the twins would be forming a very special bond with a new Kitsune summoner. 
he was to be the equivalent of the Kitsune Taichu, their general, just below Kai Ubi in rank with regards to the heart of Fox summons at his disposal, and the Kitsune Nation, which by the way Quasi resided on this plane. Scrolls she had shared even alluded to a rather sizable force of Kitsune warriors bred specifically for war, but it would be a while before he had the strength to summon them from the Kitsune plane of existence. No, his first summons would be special, but she hadn't said how special or what that would entail. So, he was understandably nervous. He began to build up chakra in his hara, located in the pit of his stomach, until she chirped in his mind that he should have enough for the summons. Peripherally, he could feel the warmth spreading out from his seal as he did this, a sensation he'd learned to associate with Kikbi, mixing her special blend of chakra and yaki with his own. Naruto nodded once, then bit open his left thumb spreading the blood across his right palm, before firing off the five hand seals chanting, Ino, Inu, Seru, Tori, Hitsuji, and parroting, Kuchius no Jutsu. Murden Suinzu. Slamming his palm into the floor and secretly happy that no one else lived in the building, Naruto watched the runes shoot out in a circular pattern for three meters before erupting in a cloud of golden smoke. Since it wasn't clearing out right away, he walked over to the stove and turned on the fan to help pull the smoke out. When he finally turned around, the sight awaiting him took his breath away. Bound on the floor were two full-grown women in different modes of dress, one in a dark blue kimono and white obi trimmed in white and pink sakura petals, her golden blonde hair fanning out on the floor in waves of silk. Her long ears of soft golden fur, tipped in black, matched the two extremely fluffy tails waving gently from the back of her. Wait what? He blinked and rubbed his eyes and looked again. After finching his arm out. He walked over and squatted down to get a closer look, ignoring the suddenly very sleepy sensation he was experiencing. He could sleep later, must examine now. He could tell that she noticed his approach, but her face stayed focused on the floor a hair's breadth from the tip of her nose. That meant she never saw his finger gently stroke her left ear from the base to the tip. The ear twitched slightly, but she fought to keep it still, as if she was afraid to offend the summoner. The result was that her breath came out in shivers and her body shuddered at his touch. Naruto had spent some time in those ancient history books and reviewed some of the great periods of art. From the view he had, this kitsune had a figure to make the great sculptors green with envy. Besides, it was cute the way her tails curled like that. HNH, cute, he giggled out too engrossed in the fact that she had long fox-like ears on the side of her head to notice the surprised twitch of both females' bodies, their eyes flickering over briefly to meet in confusion, followed quickly by defensive apprehension. Oblivious, he hurriedly but gently took her hands and asked her to rise. For a young lad not quite aware of female of Emma Kinjiti, the front view was nothing less than spectacular from a purely artistic perspective. Her face was almond-shaped and brushed by honey, now with healthy doses of pink slowly fading from her cheeks. Her green eyes were like creamy jade, eyes that never strayed from his face, and the kimono flowed over her very curvy figure. But the initial shock of her ears and tails gone, he turned to the second figure still prostrate on the floor. Gently lifting her from the floor as well, Naruto took stock of both Kitsune females and was rendered speechless. The second was a touch shorter by perhaps three or four centimeters. She had similar facial features but less oval and more angular. The eyes were the same beautiful shade of creamy jade though. Her clothes were patterned more after some of the shinobi he'd seen and consisted of dark blue trousers that hugged her body and a dark blue flak vest kept closed by hefty snaps and buckles, all of it covering a tight-fitting mesh shirt underneath. It was enough to show a healthy dose of cleavage, but secure enough not to move. She had a face mask to cover the lower half of her features, but wore it loosely around her neck. She carried a tanto strapped to her back, several pouches around her waist, and a thigh holster for shuriken on her right thigh. On her left thigh, she had a mini bandolier holding three kunai within easy reach. Both wore the same dark blue and open toed sandals, but only the one in the kimono had painted toenails. Oh yeah, they both had the same two tails of downy fur. PPP pretty very pretty, he whispered out. Then the room grew dark as he fell backwards to land flat on his back, out like a light. The shorter of the two women turned on the other immediately. You said it was her chakra. This, she paused to gesture with both hands at the unconscious boy, as not Kikbi-sama. The slightly taller and much curvier Tamami pursed her lips in concentration as she evaluated the small, and clearly human, child. It didn't make sense. They were both exposed to the new nine-tailed host, not more than 200 years ago, so it couldn't be that she'd forgotten the energy signature so quickly. Besides, she was the only trained sensor of the pair, and she was certain that their new liege lady had finally called them. It finally happened. She pointedly did not squeal like a small child when the summons came. Nope. Whatever was going on now made absolutely no sense to either of them. Well. What have you gotten us into now, sister? More importantly, how do we get out of it with our tails intact? She seemed concerned but not panicked despite being trapped in what appeared to be a human village. 
Humans did not react well to Kitsune unless they were perverts. Somewhere deep in the forests of Taki, a white-maned shinobi traipsing through the greenery in old-fashioned Jeddah, sneezed loud enough to send birds into flight across a square kilometer. Tamami looked up at her sister in confusion. She's in there. Her tone was flat but confident. Who? Who is in where? Tatsuo was beginning to think her beloved sister was a bit touched in the brain. Kick Biljo. She's in there, Tamami cheerfully chirped as she squatted down next to the gently snoring boy and poked his stomach. She giggled again when his leg reflexively twitched at the sudden sensation. Tatsuo could only blink in shock. No, no 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 not possible. Tamami noted that Tatsuo appeared genuinely upset despite the calm certainty of her sibling. You're absolutely certain she's in there? Her sister giggled even as she stroked his rounded cheeks, drawing out that wonderful purring sound, much to her delighted surprise. Positive. With a gentle shuffle, the longer-haired fraternal twin lifted the back of his head until his blonde mop and shoulders were just as gently settled onto the warmth of her lap, the crown of his head pointed to her stomach. Oh, no, you don't. Tamami looked up with confusion clearly written on her face. No, I don't what? What are you talking about? You are not falling in love with it. I'm not going to allow that to happen again, just like what happened with that urchin back in Degarashi. The younger of the two, by two minutes, blushed a bright shade of red. You promised to let that go, Nisan. Tamami's voice was soft and sad enough to make the battle-hardened Tatsuo wince just a bit. That didn't mean she was going to let up on her soft-hearted sister. Normally I would but, she gestured again with both hands to the still unconscious Naruto snoring in her lap, here we are again. What? Do you just love picking up strays? You can't save every pitiful creature that crosses our path, sis. We need to find her and soon. The thirteen are growing anxious. Tatsuo ended her rant and began pacing back and forth, her teeth worrying the nail of her left thumb, while her sister idly ran her fingers through the blonde spiky hair. He's not in it he's the current vessel of the kickby. Tamami's emphasis on every syllable was extra clear despite the recalcitrant mumbling of her voice. Well, I'm not buying it, but I know a way we can confirm it, Tatsuo nearly growled out as she drew a kunai from her thigh holster. Tamami's reaction was immediate as she leaned forward crossing her arms over the defenseless boy's chest, hoping to protect him with her own body, her lungs barking out a sharp, no. As she did so. The buxom Kitsune didn't notice the boy's frame jerk at the sharp sound of her voice, nor his hands beginning to twitch as his body reflexively fought to soak in air past the woman's kimono-wrapped bosom smothering his face. Tatsuo did and decided some fun was in order. What are you honking about, silly goose? I'm not gonna off him. She waved her blade about casually indicating his lower extremities. I figure I'd stab him somewhere non-vital and see if Kikbisama's chakra healed him. Tamami's indignant rage was making her eyes pop open and her mouth drop lower and lower with each word. What, Tama-chan? You don't approve. She was trying to hide her smirk as her sister gasped like a dying fish. How dare you what? Right about that moment, poor Tamami's face blushed a brilliant shade of red and her mouth shot open as wide as it could for a completely different reason. Minutes later, a very red-faced Naruto was in full koto before an equally red-faced Tamami, apologizing for his wandering hands. Never mind that he was out like a light and suffocating under the weight of her rather heavy chest he was six and embarrassed that he tried to lift the awkward weight from his face. Tatsuo's cackling laughter really wasn't helping ease the awkwardness much. Suanii. The mommy's whimper, reinforced by her hand still crossed defensively across her chest, did manage to help the elder sibling gain some semblance of self-control her final hiccuping cough sputtering to a slow halt as she focused on the back of the blonde creature's head. Okay, okay. Wiping away a final tear she squatted down next to the child and rapped on the back of his skull. The muffled sound answered back. Look kid, we need to figure out where we are so we can get back to our home and try again. This time the boy did look up, despite the bright red hue to his cheeks, to lock eyes with her. Get home? He asked showing absolute confusion. Yeah, home. You know, that place where people live when they're not out doing stuff. His face wrinkled up at her sarcasm and Tatsu resolutely refused to believe he was cute in any way, shape, or form. Nope, not at all, damn it. I don't understand. Kikbi Nichan said you were here to help me. His face scrunched up in confusion. Well, you see kid, it's like this dot Tatsuo was cut off by her now excited sibling's next outburst. Who is your Kikbi Nichan? Naruto was still having a hard time meeting her eye until the kimono-wearing woman grabbed his cheeks and forced him to. This is important uh what's your name? Nabuto, he garbled out past smooshed lips. Huh? Tatsuo slapped the other woman's hands away from his face so he could talk. Ah, ahem, cough, my name is Naruto. Yuzumaki Naruto. Tamami nodded once. Well, Naruto, it's important that we verify who your Kikbini chan is. If she's who we think she is, we've been looking for her for a very, very long time. 
Tatsuya still looked unconvinced, her snort saying as much. She's the nine-tailed fox that attacked Kanoha six years ago, he blurted out with almost zero emotion. Six years ago. Both women looked at each other, having been briefed of that occurrence by the senior collective of the 13. You're sure it was six years ago? Yup, she attacked on the day I was born, and the Yandame sealed her into here, he promptly stated while lifting his shirt and forcing Chakra to swirl in his core, bringing the seal to the surface. I should know. I'm six now. Hatsua could only glance to her sister, who, after spending a few moments marveling at the seal, slowly reached out to touch it, only to find herself drawn into the mind space before the very kitsune they had been searching for over the last 80 years or so. Outside, Naruto glanced up at the clearly zoned out female hovering less than a foot from his face, then back to the still standing one holding the kunai in her left hand, then back to the zoned out woman again. Awkward Tatsuya stared at them both as she waited to hear if she could finally stab the poor boy so they could be on their merry way. Things to do and all that. When Tamami came to with a start, she did two things. First, she leaned forward and hugged the surprised orphan. Naruto found it warm and soothing, something he only got to enjoy when Jiji embraced him, but this was different and it made him all squiggly inside as his tiny arms reached out to embrace her back. It was over all too soon when the very pretty lady caressed his cheek and released a now very shocked Naruto. Secondly, she stood up, walked over to her sister, and slapped her full on across the jaw. Surprise, and not a few tears, began to fill up the older woman's face as she gawked at her sibling with her mouth hanging wide open. What's more, any soft-spoken or shy commentary from her normally placid sister was obliterated by the woman's next statement delivered with narrow-eyed resolve. Kikbil Joe did not appreciate your juvenile attempts at humor nor your threatening of her new vessel. The blood immediately drained from Tatsu's face as her eyes shifted to lock on the equally surprised face of the small child, glancing up at them still in shock from the sensation of Tamami's soft lips on his cheek. He couldn't ever remember feeling that sensation before even with Jiji. But but, he's human. She sputtered out finally. Ours is not to question but to serve. But, serve. The mommy appeared to have made up her mind. It took several more minutes before the still-shocked Kitsune mustered up enough courage to prostrate herself before the equally still-shocked child and asked for forgiveness, something Naruto gave immediately with a hug and a smile. He really liked hugs. She was joined a minute later by Tamami as they sat across from their new lordling. Hatsua could not hope that this news would be well received by the matrons. A male hand held the great Bidjkin over 500 years, and that was by design. So much for tradition. Regardless, she shook off the shock and began the tedious process of explaining what the boy had unknowingly been signed up for. Aichu, I am a Kehimura Tatsua, and this squishy waist of fur, the taller kitsune in the kimono, cut a vicious glare to her sibling, is my sister Tamami. We are to be your guardians and den mates from this day forward apparently. Tatsua mumbled that last part hoping he didn't catch it, but knew her sister did, judging by the increased glare she got back. Naruto scrunched up his face in concentration for about five seconds. I understand guardians, but what do you mean by den mates? Tamami spoke up for the first time, her blush mostly under control. She means that we will live, die, eat, sleep, bathe, and have any other manner of life experiences with you, so long as we share your life. Hatsuo bluntly chimed in with, we are going to live with you, kiddo. Naruto promptly passed out again, falling sideways while at rigid Siza attention, and flopped over until he lay flat on his back, face up. He finally had a family. The twins glanced at each other with matching stares of blinking confusion. Is this going to be a recurring theme? Should we buy him one of those special helmets? Tatsuya chirped. Kikbi sighed from inside her luxury prison as she watched the three interact through her host's eyes, at least until he passed out again. Suachan's reaction she expected to a degree, but hoped she would come around. She'd hate to have to cast her away after all the work that went into selecting her for the position of handmaiden. Well, might as well move on to the next part of this phase. She calmly walked over to the large table in the center and waved one hand over the surface while funneling a mix of spirit, Riaika, Chakra and Yaki through her palm. The surface blazed with dozens of seals and symbols. Touching each seal that she wanted with a finger, she slid the tip across the table surface, moving the desired images directly in front of her kneeling station. Placing her palms on top of the next two seals, she burst large amounts of energy into the images and watched them sizzle and burn away. On the statue standing in the middle of the rock garden, she could hear the sounds of chains snapping before they vanished into glittery pieces of light. Rising from the table as the remaining symbols faded away, Kaiubi walked over to the large bed and got comfortable. The next step wouldn't take much energy, but she needed to be comfortable to help with concentration. As floating images of human anatomy and DNA strings flitted before her face, she began pulling and tugging, erasing and adding, constantly resequencing protein strains and restructuring the peskier genome code, better suited to kitsune than humans. 
As the mindscape shuddered, Kaiubi smiled and glanced one last time to the statue nestled in the middle of the garden, as its eyes morphed from round discs to slotted pupils, and longer ears sprouted from the side of its head. He's going to love this next part. Kaiubi's grin split her face in two as she returned to her partially spliced sequencing and began to neatly tie off the new coating. Leaking a constant stream of her energy through the four sealed portals now open to her, the boy's body began to slowly pulse and change. Chapter 8. The golden Todd III Tatsuo bluntly chimed in with, we are going to live with you, kiddo. Naruto promptly passed out again, falling sideways while at rigid Siza attention, and flopped over until he lay flat on his back, face up. He finally had a family. The twins glanced at each other with matching stares of blinking confusion. Is this going to be a recurring theme? Should we buy him one of those special helmets? Tatsuo chirped. Tamami shot another withering glare at her sister as she set about making their new Taichu comfortable again. Settling the tiny male once again into the comfort of her lap, she asked her smirking sister to slide the coffee table closer so she could get some things done while they waited. I don't, Tatsuo started to say as she easily hefted the plain piece of sturdy furniture, setting it gently next to her sister's right side, see why we can't just leave and pretend that nothing happened. Like we didn't get the call in the first place. Who will know? That comment made the kneeling woman pause, the air around her chilling enough to force goosebumps to the surface of Tatsuo's lightly tanned skin. Tamami, however, refused to speak her thoughts on such a suggestion, implying to the other woman that knew her so well that she was pretending not to have heard it in the first place. Tatsuo, however, did realize her slip and the impact on her sibling as she fidgeted while her sister unsealed first an inkwell, followed by several brushes, then finally papers of various sizes with a waxy sheen. It was still several moments before Tamami spoke, by then her hand already gently smoothing the excess ink from the finest brush tip she owned. No one knows where their life's path will eventually lead them, this is even more so for us the Kitsune. Her eyes never left the tiny inkwell as she spoke. You, my sister, are all I've ever known and loved since our flight from the land of our birth, but I will not keep your feet from the path you wish to pursue, despite how much it would hurt me to see you go. Well, Dross. Hatsu's breath caught in her throat. Tamami had just raised the stakes by making her intentions abundantly clear. You would leave me, the older sibling's shocked eyes wandering down to the unconscious child in her sister's lap, for this. Tamami still hadn't looked up at this point. For the record, I am doing what Kikbi-sama has commanded of us. For the second record, I am not abandoning anyone. Tamami held her sister's disbelieving stare without flinching. It is you who are abandoning us. Silence filled the air for many minutes as the kneeling Kitsune began drawing her brush across one of the normal sheets of paper at her side, her back straight, in order to keep her over full chest from smothering her peacefully sleeping charge. She stayed focused on her task even as her sister quietly turned on a heel and stepped from the spacious apartment. The moments ticked by peacefully as Tamami's brush glided across the various sheets of paper she'd spread out on her impromptu work surface, the ticking of the plain circular wall clock, the only accompaniment to the steady swishing of her calligraphy implement. She kept working even after a quick glance at the clock revealed the passing of 20 minutes, a brief smile spreading her lips as her head leaned forward to try and peek past her chest to the gently snoring child in her lap. Well, 20 minutes is a record for Sua-chan. She paused and giggled lightly, a brief nod of her head, swaying the silky curtain of golden hair as she agreed to some unheard comment. Yes, she can be a bit brash, but that only means she is passionate about what she believes in. A ruffled snort from her lap could almost be taken as agreement or amusement, depending on your familiarity with the subject with limbs sprawled to the four winds. I'm sure you two will grow to love each other in time. She glanced once up to the ceiling briefly. Speaking of time 3, 2, AI and she kept working even as her sister stormed back into the apartment, only to stomp over to the couch, throwing her body down onto it with a huff of air. Don't say it. Welcome back, beloved sister. Screw you. You knew I never went much farther than the roof, didn't you? Yes. The left corner of Tamami's mouth again crinkled into an upturned wrinkle. Tamami could easily hear her older sister's muttered, damnable cheating censors. You were never very good at running away. You never know. One day I just might really do it. Of course, dear. I meant it. SHH. He's still sleeping, Tamami shushed. Screw him too. The now frustrated former runaway barked out. Someday, when he's old enough and if you're well behaved enough, I might just let you. Tatsuo tried both ignoring her sister's conceited smirk and not choking on her own spit. Never. I need you to stop being hostile enough to pick up a few things for us, Tamami chirped with a happy smile, the ink on her list now dry, as she passed one of her projects to her sibling. Please find me something in blue, if you can. Her sister snatched the sheet, read over it once briefly, then left the apartment yet again, after making sure her ears and tails were securely hidden away. 
Not even her grumbling could remove the contented smile from Tamami's face as she turned to her next task, the image of Kikbi Sama's new gift burning in her mind, before her brush gracefully danced across several sheets of the waxy seal transfer squares. I I I when Naruto eventually came to, he had a difficult time remembering what happened and where he was. He remembered the summoning ceremony. He remembered the insanely pretty Kitsune in his apartment. He could still hear the fan over the stove trying to pump out all the smoke. I, I'm on the floor of my apartment. I must have passed out. Something wasn't right though. He couldn't see anything, and he wasn't exactly flat on his back. More importantly, something heavy was pressed to his forehead, and it covered his eyes so he couldn't open them. He was aware that his head and shoulders were laying on something very soft, something that smelled of sakura petals. He also hurt as in all of him hurt from head to toe. Well, nothing for it but to find out why he couldn't open his eyes, as he wanted to at least see what was going on. He reached up to lift off whatever was pressing on his face. Hi ah. Shudder. Funny that sounded like to Mommy chan Two very soft but strong hands closed on his own, firmly pulling them away from whatever he was trying to move off of his head, but Tamami's chest eventually lifted from his face. I I I I I. S sorry. D D D didn't mean to. He sputtered. By now he was floundering, especially since he realized he was snuggled comfortably in her lap. I think we can safely say he's a boob man, eh? Both faces, both equally flushed in embarrassment, shot heated glares to the smug brawler sitting comfortably from her position of safety on the couch. She actually took a moment to lift the neckline of her mesh shirt away to glance down at her own not inconsiderable chest, strapped down like cargo. Or maybe it's just your oversized dot Ni Chan. Despite the apparent distress of her baby sister, Tatsuya's grin only increased at their growing discomfort. If she was stuck with this draw sandwich, she was by Inari's grace going to enjoy every moment she could. Speaking of which, her glare turned particularly malicious as she looked down to lock stairs with a still glaring boy child. Taichu, you are going to have to get used to this as you will more than likely see us in various stages of undress while living with you. I know I'm partial to t-shirts and panties when I'm relaxing at home. The boy's sputtering shock gave her a warm feeling of achievement, even as she reached up to absently rub the base of her neck. The nooked female body should not surprise you as female shinobi, and more importantly female kitsune once you're old enough, will most likely try to use this as a way to get close to you. Your enemy will use whatever means are available to them in order to exploit that weakness, and many generals have been assassinated in their beds by shinobi, pretending to be their lovers. With us, you need never doubt whether or not our loyalty and affections are sincere. Naruto did marvelous credit to his gender and age group with his best wide-eyed eel. He is six after all, and the talk stuff was beginning to make his head hurt. He was still coming to terms with the fact that Tamami wasn't angry with him for squeezing her chest. Stop teasing him and stop messing with that or it will get infected. This confused Naruto as he glanced up with a clearly confused look on his face to ask what Tamami was talking about. Unfortunately, his train of thought and limited attention span was thrown off when he couldn't see the underside of her chin, all he could see was a white expanse of dark blue cloth. Apparently Tatsuya got the message though as her hand shot down into her lap, as if chazzed there by her own scowl. Forget that she'd even said that he would be seeing both of them more or less with nothing on as his limited attention span abruptly changed channels yet again. The one word the very young Naruto's mind latched onto was the honorific, Taichu. Why? Tatsuya paused, her scowl melting into a confused question. HNN. Why do you keep calling me that? Calling you what? Stumpy. The boy's face wrinkled up cutely into a six-year-old pout. No. His outrage made her giggle, a sound that he liked and lessened his furious glare, no jutsu of doom. She was really lucky, in his honest opinion, he hadn't cranked it up to level 2, the murderous glare no jutsu of death. Jiji says I'll hit a growth spurt any day now. Tatsuya snorted. Loudly. Twice. Uh huh. Anyway, listen up, Stumpy Chan. Despite the continued glare no jutsu of doom, what followed, once he explained her precarious situation, was a detailed explanation of the young boy's new kitsune position of power. Of how Taichu was an old term of respect for the highest level of military leader as theirs was a militarily structured organization, as compared to the mafia-oriented toads, who shall remain nameless from henceforward, or the chaotic ferrets that had no discernible structure that anyone could see. He sat gobsmacked as he learned how he was third in power below the Kami Inari and Kaiubi herself, their empress. As Kaiubi was sealed inside his belly, Tamami gently placed one palm on his stomach, he was the new emperor with direct access to Inari Kami himself, the honest-to-goodness Kami of all Kitsune. He was, in fact, the Taichu entitled to all rights, privileges, and authority thereof, and these two were his right handmaidens, sworn to defend and protect his life until he released them from his service or they died while in the act of doing so, whichever came first. Plenty of people had tried to make Naruto die, but no one had ever sworn to die in his stead. 
Ah no don't I have to be kid soon for that to happen. Last he checked he was still a young boy. A human boy. Tamami chuckled and one of her hands left his chest to gently stroke one of his long golden ears from base to tip. The sensation was amazing and his ear tried to twitch away from the delicate stroke. His body immediately flushed with warmth and shivered, much like she did earlier. It also did something weird to his stomach. Simultaneously, Tetsuo got up from her comfy perch to reach behind him and gently stroke one of his two tails, slowly bringing it up around his prone body so he could see it. It was the same golden blonde as his hair and tipped with snow-white fur. It was apparently also very sensitive. He shuddered again, his tail flicking quickly out of her grasp as she rubbed it across her face and chin. We will need to work on your control, Taichu. Her very lecherous smirk was not lost on the flabbergasted youth. I need to see this. A hectic scramble and detangling of limbs ensued while he wriggled out from Tamami's grasp and staggered to the bathroom. Tamami pouted at her suddenly cold lap he was a regular furnace when sleeping, and Tatsuo giggled as they waited for his reaction. When the light flicked on he saw exactly what he expected to see two long ears and two two. Very fluffy tails swing back and forth behind him. The fur was as golden as his hair, except at the tips where it was a blinding white. Oddly enough, his tails felt finched at the waistband of his sweats, and he feared his limited edition wardrobe was about to undergo modifications in the near future. His eyes were the same deep blue, but the golden pupils were more oval-shaped than round and constricted further, once the bright light came on making them shrink into slits, and his whisker marks were deeper. His mouth opened as his smile grew, and that's when he noticed his pronounced canines. Yup he was a kitsune and a darn good-looking one if you please. It was as he was gently poking his larger fangs with his fingertips that his right ear twitched towards the living room and he heard Tamami whispering to her sister, hoping that he wouldn't send them away. He smiled thinking those ears would be pretty useful if he could find a way to cover them. He was also pleasantly surprised by how much clearer his vision was and grinned again. He almost turned away when he turned off the light, except a blue glow in the mirror caught his attention. Taking a second look, that blue glow was coming from his body, his whole body. He was giving off a steady stream of blue energy and an aura. A bit concerned by this, he returned to the twins and sat down next to them with their expectant faces locked onto his eyes. Tamami looked disappointed when he didn't immediately snuggle back into her lap. Okay, what's going on? Without saying a word, the girls glanced at each other very quickly before reaching over to him and placing a hand on each shoulder. This had better work, Tama-chan, the bobcut female groused. Before he knew it, there was another pull on his mind, and the three of them were back in the mindscape kneeling before the table with Kaiubi on the other side. Without preamble, the twins bowed deeply to the nine-tailed fox as the next important lesson was about to begin. Kaiubi had a grin threatening to swallow her entire face. As she looked at her golden tod, her snow-capped taichu, her body grew warm starting with her core. Shivering off the increase in animalistic pheromones, she settled into her lecture mode and wove a tail. For half a moment, she considered applying the seal she'd provided to the twins to herself only to wave off the idea. If things went according to plan, she'd never have to worry about him betraying her, so why fight what she could overpower anyway? Three things have happened to you so that we, she motioned to herself and the two-tailed vixens, can keep you alive, as this rotten village has very little interest in doing so. She raised one dainty index finger. First off, the twins are going to help train you and protect you. That is why we summoned them. Tatsuo and Tamami smiled warmly and nodded their heads in agreement, Tatsuo's shocked face at seeing the Kaiubi directly across from her beginning to sink in. Their job is to take care of you and help train you as the ultimate Kitsune warrior, the warlord of our Kitsune army. Each has her own specialties, and you can learn a great deal about being Kitsune from them. This will have the added benefit of preparing you for a shinobi career, but that is not their primary goal, and I ask you to remember that. Their first task is to help you relearn how to use your chakra since this, she waved one hand in vague circles in front of his face and shoulders, has reinforced your now expanded chakra network and more than likely wrecked what little control you had, if any. Naruto's only response was, HNN chakra. I will be continued unfazed, tossing him a scroll explaining in detail how chakra worked both in humans and kitsune. Glancing quickly over the first few feet of the scroll, he found the complicated chakra network of his tail's very interesting reading. Another finger joined the first. Second, I removed the remaining two limiters from your seal matrix. This will unlock your physical and spiritual potential, but I cannot stress enough, her voice had risen slightly when she saw his face light up, indicating his brain was tuning her out over dreams of being the next One Punch Super Ninja, that this is a double-edged sword. If you don't learn to control your new body, and soon, all we've worked for will come undone, and you'll remain weak and defenseless. As you are now, a civilian teenager could cripple you even with the magnificent body I have engineered for you. Finally, as you've noticed by now you have some new accessories, she almost crooned as the third finger rose into the air. 
Naruto's new ears perked up and his tail started swaying side to side again, playfully swatting his twin playmates on their respective rumps. Kaiubi saw both ladies blush, the boy was completely oblivious to what he was doing and heard a subtle sigh escape to mommy's lips. Huh, it's always the quiet ones. I've given you the equivalent of a bloodline set package, basically the concentrated physical enhancements of the Kitsune race, with a couple of perks not normally included. It's up to these two to teach you and help you adapt, but I will share with you my personal additions as they are not familiar with them. Shibijuu smiled as both vixens absently reached back to the base of their skulls. You already have enhanced regeneration courtesy of exposure to my yaki, which is funneled through these three yuzu medical seals. Three green seal arrays appeared on the table in front of them. You can regenerate most damaged organs if given enough time, and most poisons will have little effect on you, but that does not make you invulnerable. Enough physical damage can still kill you, and no amount of regeneration can help you if your head gets separated from your neck. She drew her thumb across her throat to emphasize her point. So, don't get cocky, kid. Naruto filed that very important fact away, one hand ghosting up to his neck. Also, I've increased the density of your bone structure and muscle tissue by almost two and a half times. This will give you added strength and durability, making you harder to kill, but not so bulky it makes you rigid and slow. We can't have a repeat of last year's birthday. If you die, I die. Let's not have that. Naruto nodded emphatically in agreement. And finally, as we are now officially joined through the seal, and you are directly linked to my chakra, as you call it, we can do more than speak mentally outside of the mindscape. You will have access to my chakra affinities, which will grow as you gain more strength through an added number of tails. And you will get more tails, never more than eight though, as you get stronger. She leaned forward to garner his undivided attention. And I want you to get stronger. She gently flicked his nose with her fingertip and smiled. Now go. I am tired after all my work and I'd like to rest. This was a lot to take in, but he reached out and hugged the gorgeous Kaiubi one more time as things faded to nothing. When he glanced up to his new roommates, he grinned and hugged them both, then stood, stretched, and walked quietly into his bedroom. Unsure of what to do the girls eventually went back to check on the new Kitsune, only to see him face down on his bed, snoring peacefully in deep slumber. Naruto woke up hours later feeling great, Kaiubi's magic healing powers reducing his pain to a dull ache. He yawned and stretched suddenly puzzled as to why one of his new tails was stuck. Opening his eyes to find his face buried in Tamami's grasp, her baby blue pajamas covered in little golden bees, and the rest of her pressed snugly up against his front like he was a self-heating body pillow. One of his was tails snuggled up to her face in her sleeping kung fu action death grip. He first began to blush and look for a way to escape without having to cut off his brand new tail. Then he realized that he had a second tail and that it was also stuck but somehow behind him. Trying to free it he tugged on it. It didn't come free, but Tatsuya mooned in a very odd way, her voice coming from right behind his ear, so he tugged again. No luck, but he heard another moon before something squeezed his tail. Looking behind him, he saw her pajama-clad body pressed up against his back and his tail snuggled between her thighs. Both of his tails were trapped and he could smell something musky and sweet at the same time, his nose twitching as he tried to figure out a way to escape. If they were going to be sleeping with him in the same bed, he was going to need a bigger bed, since he liked to spread out a bit. Slowly prying his fuzzy appendages from their grips of doom, the walking nightlight snuck his way into the shower to scrub up for his new day, casually noticing that at least a third of his bed was unoccupied with him still smashed between the two of them. He didn't mind being their teddy bear, but they might have to set some boundaries. He had to admit that the physical contact was nice though. He liked hugs. It was also while under the hot water, his old apartment never had hot water, that the notion of welcomed physical contact hit him with another issue. Villagers hated him when he was normal Naruto. How was he going to get around as Super Kitsune Naruto, the Golden Taichu? He resolved to start his new training regimen when the girls woke up, whatever it was going to be. Maybe they knew a way to fix that. They'd also have to talk about sleeping and hogging his tails. Inside the seal, Kaiubi laughed at his dilemma. You may not mind so much in a few years she thought quietly. The answer he got when they finally awoke was not what he was hoping for. His chakra control was shot. Well, it wasn't like he had a lot to begin with, but what little he had was pretty much gone. Standing in his living room with his tails fluttering frantically the boy who would be caged couldn't even set fire to his own apartment. Wall climbing. Forget it. Assumed to mommy's form with a hinge. He got an Akamichi-sized girl with blue hair and no clothes. He couldn't even manage enough steady chakra to use chakra paper. Oh well. Back to the drawing board. He had to rework all of the basic chakra training he'd done with Kaiubi. The physical changes also came with both larger, more robust chakra coils and reserves, basically destroying what little control he had just as she predicted. 
He was now trying to control the flow of a large river vice, a fully charged fire hose. To make matters worse, he learned that his completely destroyed chakra control wasn't even solely caused by the growth in his chakra network. His overnight biological conversion into a kitsune had developed something called the modulus gland, located near the base of his tails. One gland having developed for each tail. This genetic marvel's sole purpose was for the regulating of Riaika base chakra in his tail networks, networks that were supposed to be just as complicated as his human developed chakra network. The only difference between his glands because he was a human first and the glands of a normal kitsune was that his did more than regulate the flow of chakra to and from the tail's network. His glands were larger and more complicated as they were required to either allow or prevent flow of his kitsune spirit chakra, like a normal kitsune, from his tail network to what they were calling his core network, but also regulating that same flow by mixing the two normally incompatible chakras into a usable form of hybrid chakra that wouldn't poison him over time. Then end result was a more robust network as his chakra gates, coils, and tenketsu had to be reinforced to handle the revised flows. The twins seemed nonplussed and, with a gentle smile, told him that they already worked out a beginner training schedule for him. His training would be broken up by their specialties. The mommy would teach him general chakra control, kitsun jinjutsu, kitsun elemental control, and what little human ninjutsu she had learned over the years living in the human world, which admittedly was not much. What she didn't know they would study together. When he asked why it had to be kitsune techniques, she informed him that they weren't well versed in human techniques, seeing as kitsune arts were regulated through their tails, which internally regulated and molded their chakra into elemental forms without hand seals. Hatsua would work on his physical aspects to include reinforcement and extension techniques with chakra control exercises, kitsune tojutsu, and kitsune kinjutsu. Unfortunately, before they could get to the cool stuff, he would have to learn to control his new body, and that would take time. She seemed a bit too excited at that idea. The three worked him to the bone always keeping him inside until he learned to alter his form enough to pass for human again, but it would take pretty much the rest of summer before he had enough control to hold kitsune illusions long enough to get through a day of school and be able to learn transformations. There were two types, one that simply covered his appearance under a false image of no substance in other words, he could still have his kitsune appendages out, but anyone bumping into them would break the illusion, and one that actually transformed him physically, removing the tails, ears and covered his eyes, making him look and feel like the old Naruto. At least he didn't glow anymore by the time August rolled around. As much as he hated going without the tails and ears, the latter technique was more useful, and that he could assume other more helpful forms like a fox or other people he was familiar with. It also meant he could shop unopposed. Most vendors were very polite to his disguised forms, especially when he imitated women, which he was learning a great deal about living with two beautiful ones that shed clothing at the drop of a hat. Tamami was very helpful in correcting problems with his shape change jutsu, his female persona coming a long way with her help. He would eventually have to find a name for his female alter ego. It was very effective at persuading dirty old men to be nice to him. It also opened up whole new realms of pranking. It just took forever to learn enough control to maintain the form longer than 30 minutes. They used this new level of control as an incentive to give him time outside of his apartment as he developed a severe case of cabin fever halfway through summer. His control shot up dramatically, however, and Tatsuo was relentless in conditioning his body which served to further increase his physical chakra reserves. She even began to train him at night in nearby training grounds. He felt like a new man. Er, boy. Training continued through the last civilian school year, which by now was a blur of activity. His grades improved when they weren't being actively sabotaged, and his overall scores were high enough to let him graduate. To be honest, teachers would have passed him anyway just to get the demon bat out of their classrooms. It did afford plenty of time to train before and after school with the twins and added new skills to his tool chest. Bowl climbing, water walking, camouflage, and voice throwing, all valuable tools in the kitsune trickster bag, made nights of pranking and evading and boo worth the exercise of fleeing for his life. Pranking the rude store owners just made life enjoyable, especially when Tatsuo began teaching him burglar skills like lock picking, wire work, trap detection, and removal, and pickpocketing. When he found ledgers reporting how much shop owners had robbed from him, it all became very personal, and he very diligently worked to balance the scales. He just gave the money to other street urchins and homeless people in the red light district where he was just another social outcast. He became very popular in that part of town. I I I okay, this looks like a good spot to camp for the night. Tatsuo set her pack down and glanced back to her soon-to-be eight-year-old charge as his heavy breaths quickly settled down into normal breathing. His stamina, even at such a young age, astounded her. She refused to get attached to the tiny future psycho though. 
Males just could not be trusted, she'd seen the mistake of that firsthand, and Kitsune were long-lived enough that Tachis were transitionary. There would be another one along soon enough, and the thirteen would make her female, and all would be well again. She pointedly averted her gaze up and away from his big blue gorgeous eyes, once he looked up at her in anticipation. Nope, he wasn't cute at all, just another street rat. Yup. Besides, he'd be warier of her after this camping visit. Okay, Taichu. She didn't have to look down to know he was vibrating with excitement. We're going to set up a den here, then we're going to learn trapping for small game. She glanced down and yup, he was so excited his body was vibrating in place. Camping basics and small game trapping before we learn to hunt, got it. The small child pumped a fist into the air and began setting up their combined tent with excitement, she'd weaned him of that spontaneously shouting nonsense the last two times they'd come camping. Thumps to the head were effective. Do you need a hand? He shook his head and shot her a cheeky thumbs up before diving right in. She, in turn, climbed up to a comfortable branch and watched closely as he set up a tent, noting a couple of poles would need to be tightened, otherwise it was passable, then set about prepping a basic campfire, complete with Y-shaped sticks to make a spit. To cap it off, they were close enough to a stream that he returned with a flattish stone just big enough for a couple of metal mugs or a small pot. The vixen smiled knowing the stone would get bigger over time as he got stronger. The fact that he remembered that she liked her tea in the morning and that she used warming stones over the fire made him less intolerable. He was almost bearable at this point. Come on, Stumpy. His hands flopped from their proud position on his tiny hips as he shot her another pout, er, glare. Let's go catch some fish then I'll teach you how to trap small game. He tittered with excitement as the two sauntered off. Tatsua offhandedly considered the lush bounty of Kanoha's surrounding forests, finding it ironic that the same despicable humans that once made his life a living nightmare were going to be responsible for him becoming the apex predator in these very same woods. A shiver shot down her spine at the thought, the vixen unsure just yet if that was a good or a bad thing. He was male after all. Okay, Stumpy Chan. He growled. How cute. I'm going to show you three trapping methods I prefer to use when hunting game this week, and we are going to store the rabbit carcasses in this handy scroll Tomichan gave us so they don't go bad. She cut him off immediately. No, for the last time I don't know how to make storage scrolls. Stop asking, Stumpy Chan. First two we learn at the same time. We're going to learn how to make pitfalls and box traps. She glanced down to her little pack minion. Did you bring the apple cores? Naruto obediently held up a trash bag filled with semi-rotten leftovers. Good. Let's get to work then. Building traps wasn't as tough as the future shinobi thought it would be. Finding rabbit activity wasn't too difficult either once you knew what their round poop pellets looked like or where to typically find holes in the ground surrounded by rabbit tracks. Atsua was full of helpful information, like how rabbits like the sweetness of apples over veggies, the natural sugar made sense, but also how if you crushed an apple or two around your traps and snares, it helped hide the scent of humans and other predators. He also learned that the little buggers were really good jumpers, so their pit trap needed to be at least an arm's length deep, Tatsuo's arm length not his, and narrow to prevent them from jumping out of it. Finding thin twigs to lay over the pit then covering it with leaves made the pit easy to do just about anywhere if you had a shovel, since neither knew any neat jutsu. All it took was a little work. Tatsuo unsealed a pair of boxes and explained how big they needed to be and what kind of sticks she thought best to prop it up. It helped that she'd used hers regularly so it made for a bizarre kind of show and tell. The next day, sure enough, they found a cute little bunny in the box and two sitting quietly in the shallow pit. Naruto's happiness at catching the cute balls of fluff had him briefly losing control with an exuberant yada. Unfortunately, all it did was startle the rabbits and earn him another bop on the noggin. Still, it did nothing to curb his enthusiasm until she lifted one of the panicked creatures from the pit by the scruff of the neck and held it out to him, which generated a questioning look from the child. That look melted into panicked fear two seconds later when she handed him a thin-bladed knife and blandly ordered him to kill it. It would be a much more traumatized Uzumaki Naruto learning how to make tree snares two days later, already knowing what was coming his way once they caught the next brace of rabbits. I, I, I camping and hunting would not be the extent of his education. Extension techniques allowed him to funnel chakra into his tails and make them stretch. This was extremely handy, especially when combined with tree walking through the Tinketsu points in Akitsune's tail, all 312 of them. In fact, Akitsune's tail had a highly developed chakra network, as a vast majority of their chakra manipulation was funneled through their tails. By the time summer ended, he could stretch his tails to twice their natural length, each tail was three quarters the length of his body and could hold up to 75 kilos of weight in each. Tatsuo was ecstatic especially at night when she wanted a security blanket. She wouldn't teach him reinforcement just yet, but she did introduce him to it. 
being able to boost his physical strength and speed while generating a hide as tough as stone, made him drool, but she told him the development of his body had to come first. If he was a good taichu, she would start teaching him by the end of his first year in the academy. And nothing he did, not his puppy eyes no jutsu nor groveling on his knees with promises of all the hugs and caress she could stand, would change her mind. Tatsuo did take him out at night and into the forests to teach him how to use his senses. His normal vision was marvelous, but Kitsune night vision was incredible. Moonless nights were still crystal clear. But the small stream of chakra to his eyes, he could even see residual heat traces in animal tracks and heat signatures from bodies up to 30 meters away. She put him through his paces, but he learned a great deal about Kitsune's sensory capabilities. For one, Kitsune, like foxes, have binocular vision just like normal foxes do, vision granting a wider field of view with greater depth perception and accuracy, even without streaming chakra to his eyes. This made it much more difficult to sneak up on a Kitsune with camouflage jutsu if they were able to study their environment undisturbed, even if you could get past their keen noses. Another benefit came in the greater form of higher olfactory functions. While a fox's sense of smell isn't as good as your specialized, reed hunting variety, Canis lupus, his sense of smell was roughly 50 times better than a boring human and could accurately discriminate odors with a range of about He was never going to beat an Inuzuka in the nose department, but he could hold his own. It was extremely useful in keeping track of the twins by smell, especially when she taught him about the special caudal gland in the tip of his tail used to mark his mates, it smelled like a flower he wasn't familiar with. This also made their fascination with cuddling his tail much clearer they were marking themselves as taken to other Kitsu males. This discovery made him blush for over an hour when he remembered the Tatsu attended to snuggle his tail between her thighs, she never quite gave up on that habit. His parabolic ears were fantastic. Without chakra, he could hear rats and mice up to 100 meters on a quiet night and target sounds too within a few degrees of accuracy, although lots of background noise cut down on the range. The only downside was that loud noises caused lots of distractions and some pain until he learned to mentally filter the excess. The whisker marks and tail were used to help with his balance and high-speed locomotion. In addition to fine-tuning his balance, Tatsuo smeared cream all over the whisker marks on one side of his face and laughed while he continuously fell over. They also were good for detecting shifts in air pressure by fast-moving items because of the extremely fine hair follicles nestled deep in the whisker grooves of his cheeks. His tails acted like large rudders, even helping him change direction or position in midair. After he mastered movement with this pair of additions, Tatsuo made him master the Kitsune transformation and learn how to move again without them once they were hidden. In the end, he discovered that he missed his fuzzy add-ons and couldn't wait to unfurl them the moment he got home. It wasn't until he mastered the basics that they taught him a chakra exercise to protect him against attacks that targeted those delicate senses. That was worth learning and resulted in a passionate makeout session with Tamami, much to her pleasure, even if it was only him repeatedly caress her cheeks. It got much better afterward as Tatsuo started taking him out into the forested training areas of Konoha to learn how to hunt bigger game and survive with more than a rudimentary diet in the wild. They had to buy a small freezer chest to keep the extras they brought back, much to Tamami's joy, as it gave plenty of material to teach cooking with. Tatsuo taught him how to cook in the field, but the hot cuisine belonged to her sister. By the time his birthday rolled around again, he was both a functional kitsune and a passable human. They also stayed in this time around thanks to Tama-chan's basic defensive seal arrays and watched movies while snuggled up on the couch. Yes, he needed to hide from the villagers. Yes, they scowled, yelled, insulted, and hurt him whenever they could get away with it, which was never now. Yes, they used every opportunity they could to hunt down the demon bat. But not every waking moment of his life was darkness and pain and suffering. Sometimes there were rather spectacular moments of light and love that helped to reaffirm that possibly, perhaps maybe, not every human was a wasted bag of walking flesh. Sometimes, good things could happen to the Kyubi container. Take for instance a certain Maiko near the southern outskirts of Konoha. During his last year in the civilian school, and only during nights of the full moon, the twins would take him to a very secluded training area they discovered when scouting out the village. These nights were quickly becoming Naruto's favorite because Kitsune biology was greatly affected by the lunar pull. He felt energized during the full moon. On nights like these, when the full moon could be seen in the afternoon sky before the sunset, the twins would take the boy to this secluded hideaway so that he could burn off excess energy near training area 54. It was a small glade located just up a steep hillside from the tiny shrine dedicated to Amakane, the little worshipped kami of wisdom and intelligence. The glade was small centering around a deep pool fed by a trickling waterfall, the resulting flow splitting off in two directions before gurgling down the hillside. One directly fed the shrine freshwater. The other ran off to join the larger stream before disappearing into the woods. 
It was in the second stream that the monks and maikos of the shrine cleansed their bodies just far enough away so that they didn't contaminate the pool at its source. This did little to stop Naruto on the nights his guardians brought him to the pool in full kitsune hanyu form, a habit that became routine every month during the full cycle of the moon when their bodies raged against the moon's strongest pull. The boy relished these early days when he could release the transformation and let furry bits fly openly. He'd strip down to just his shorts and boxers and would let loose his pent-up energy by running around, over, swimming in and leaping out of the pool, oft times running along the rocky face of the small waterfall, his joyous face raised to the moon above as he whooped and yelled. Even with a pheromonal suppression seal at the base of their necks, their Taichu's Yaki enhanced pheromone production was a bit much to undertake. So out into the open air they boldly went. The twins, in their full battle fox forms, would sit by the poolside watching the young kid leap about, whilst trying to cleanse their bodies of the built-up pheromones Naruto constantly released. They didn't fault Kaiubi for wanting to make him formidable from the start, but the child was innocently unaware, almost blissfully, of the effect biologically it was having on the two very fertile females. Their eyes spent the greater part of the day mentally dilated, their brains literally high off extremely saturated levels of dopamine, coursing through their mesolimbic pathways and their synaptic activity, stimulated by his overactive pheromone production. So, the twins brought him here for two reasons. First, high levels of physical activity out here helped to reduce his physical activity in that tiny apartment, reducing the spread of his pheromonal fog. Kaiubi ramped up his body to be on par with a mature kitsune male, and this meant he produced a very addicting stimulant like a smokestack. Second, being out in the fresh air helped to calm their stressed out receptors and reduce the chemical stack up when they weren't right on top of him, so to speak. It was their own version of physical therapy combined with pheromonal purging. Naruto didn't notice how their hands clenched and unclenched when the girls were fighting the urge to rip off his clothes. He didn't notice how their nostrils flared when he came back from harsh physical training and began stripping off layers of clothing to the many whines and whimpers from his female roommates. He didn't notice how they went without undergarments because their bodies refused to let them stay dry, though he had commented on the heavier levels of musk in the apartment so much that the poor oven vent stayed on pretty much all day long. He was seven. What did he know about Kitsune let alone female biology? So, here they sat, their foxy tails swishing back and forth as the young Taichu leaped about with water flying off his body as he careened off the rock situated around the pool hundreds of yards from the minor shrine. It was also here that he met his first crush. Akio was wending her way up the trail to the spring. It was late afternoon and sounds were oddly distorted in the growing night, but she was sure she had heard it this time, there was something up there, and she meant to chase it away, while everyone else was finishing up the evening meal, she'd wolf down her food so that she could get away to check it out. She could clearly hear splashing now as she drew closer, the happy shots afterwards sounded like a young boy. Her brows narrowed in anger. Didn't this vagabond realize the importance of the pool that fed clean water to her shrine? She would have to teach him a lesson. Pausing to pick up a stout branch lying under a tree, she shook it a few times in what she hoped was a threatening manner, in truth, she had no idea how to fight, she was just hoping to scare whoever it was away, and stealthily made her way off of the stone walking path and into the brush not far from the pool. As she crept through the tangles, her eyes nearly exploded from her face, and her jaw fell open at the two majestic foxes she saw sitting peacefully by the water's edge, both lazing in the setting sun, as they watched a most curious male child leaping about and running on top of the water's surface. She blinked once, twice, then three times as her eyes flicked back and forth between the odd trio. She was stunned, and she knew not which oddity to stare at first. Foxes were a good omen for Amakane as they were seen as intelligent creatures. Now Akio wasn't a child as she'd seen her 15th summer, and, by all rights, she was a lovely young woman in full possession of her faculties. Her shrine secretly tended the breed of Vault Shrinky, that came to feed on the scraps the higher priests and Maikos left out at night once a week, they were careful not to overfeed the foxes, lest they become too dependent. She could say with certainty as she secretly studied those smaller fluffballs that she loved foxes and had some familiarity with the breed. These two specimens were magnificent, unlike anything she had ever seen before. The twin foxes were a beautiful golden red, more gold than red, and were larger than any other fox to date. On their haunches, she guessed their bodies were easily over a meter in length. Lean sinewy muscles twitched lazily under their silky fur, and both of their twin tails she blinked several times here they each had two tails apiece, each an additional meter in length. They were enormous specimens, but she couldn't stop herself from whispering, Kitsune. Their ears twitched to her direction in response, but the creatures didn't bolt or stir from their perches. Instead, they remained absolutely focused on the blonde child running amok in her shrine spring. With great effort, Akio tore her gaze from the benevolent Kitsune and caught sight of the child doing somersaults and handsprings across the water's surface. I I I do you think Taichu has noticed her? 
Tamami gave the equivalent of a mental snort. I doubt it. He is lost in the thrush of freedom, no matter how short it is. Let's see how this plays out then. Odds on Bakamono vs Aishin. Tamami chirped a very fox-like chuckle. I see your play and raise you my dishes all next week I say Saishin. Tetsuo chirped her agreement. It would be nice not to go hunting with the Taichu for a while. Seeing him take down prey with his claws and fangs was very stimulating. I I I this time she dropped her branch and gaped at the boy's tails, yes, tails as in more than one and his fox-like ears, all of which were beautiful golden color tipped by white. It matched the shock of golden hair on his head. Her eyes tried to draw in more detail, but he was moving too quickly, and, at one point, he crested in a backwards leap into the air by flipping his body gracefully over the center of the pool before diving with minimal splashing into its depths. Moments later, he breached the surface and landed in a crouch on the surface, his body flexing, she had noticed his bare chest and back with a shameful blush, then shaking, the water flinging from his body starting at his head and working its way down to his tails, which poofed out into two bushy feather dusters. Akio couldn't help it. She snickered then gasped as her hands flew to her traitorous mouth. Too late. The male kitsune evidently heard her as one snow-tipped ear twitched before his head snapped in her direction, her chocolatey brown eyes meeting his deep blue ones, as deep a blue as the center of their spring. She squeaked in terror and fled back down the hill, her body crashing clumsily through the brush. Naruto looked to the twins who merely tilted their heads like the poor defenseless creatures of the forest that they were. Recognizing their ploy, he grimaced then leaped off after the girl in the red and white mica robes. If he didn't win her over, those two would play bad kitsune and threaten to eat her. Thinking it over, they'd been pretty cranky lately. Perhaps they might actually eat someone this time? He began to move with a sense of urgency. Leaping from the water's surface, he took to the trees and dropped down easily 50 meters ahead of the panicked girl who by now wasn't even watching where she was fleeing to. Naruto sighed. Didn't girls ever pay attention when they watched scary movies? He leaped towards her to get her attention. He landed right in front of her trying to make as much noise as he could. She was too panicked and ran into him anyway with a shriek, which meant she ricocheted off him when he used chakra to stay on his feet and fell back onto the hard pathway. When her eyes snapped up to meet his, she froze at first then frantically backpedaled until she bumped into a tree. Naruto, moving slowly and deliberately, crouched down on all fours and immediately went into shy Saishin mode, turning his body partially sideways like an animal would when it stumbles upon something it couldn't quite figure out. I I I Tamami, still in her combat form, looked at Tatsuo and gave a crappy grin, if foxes had the facial muscles to do that. Tatsuo merely waved her off with a tail, it's not over yet. He still has time to eat her. Tamami snorted. I I I Naruto raised his chin a bit, his long ears laid back along his head and sniffed the air a few times. The girl was terrified, but she wasn't trying to run anymore. Her eyes were wide, her teeth were bared, lips parted, and nostrils flared as she gave off short, quick pounce. Both hands were clenched, and at either side of her head with her face turned far enough away that she wasn't directly facing him, her eyes stayed locked on his every movement from the corner of her very white sockets. Naruto inched closer and sniffed again, his ears laid back, but his eyes hesitant, almost nervous as he inched closer, then he flinched back a half-step before waiting a few minutes and reaching out with one hand, as if to draw closer again. The girl's breathing began to slow. She hadn't relaxed her posture, but her robes weren't rapidly rising and falling like the bellows at Blacksmith's Forge. This was a good sign, so Naruto took it very slowly. He leaned forward without moving his hands and feet, almost as if this was as close as he dared to come, and sniffed her again from a distance. Something about his tentative behavior perked her interest, and the girl's lips closed partially, her teeth unclenching enough to start worrying her lower lip. Slowly, agonizingly slowly, she reached out with one bald fist, her own hand jerking back, as if she wasn't sure this was a good idea, before her fingers uncurled showing her palm. Naruto figured it was time to ham up the performance and try to win her past the fear that rolled off her body in waves. Fear produced sweat and too much fear was cloying, a bitter salty smell that stung his nose. So, Naruto sniffed as he got closer and sneezed, a high-pitched chhhh. Sound that shook his head and made his kitsune ears stand straight up, his eyes wide in mock surprise. The girl nervously chuckled after her hand jerked all the way back to her front. Perhaps she was trying to ease her own tension. Perhaps she was afraid he'd start chewing on her arm. Naruto rubbed the back of his hand across his nose and turned back to the frightened girl, his ears laying gently alongside his head as he inched his neck out again and tentatively sniffed for her, her hand slowly inching back out to meet him once more. I I I his eyes were such a deep blue, but in the middle where the pupils were ovoid, they were a rich golden color. Is this a Tenko? Could this be one of the celestial foxes? Has Inari blessed my devotion with this encounter? Akio was beginning to hope that this was a good omen. She decided she would try to be bolder with the Kitsune boy. 
Itsudo would be green with envy. She said a quick prayer to Amakane asking forgiveness for her vanity, then slowly leaned forward to meet the encroaching spirit. I I I Naruto inched forward again until his nose touched her palm. He sniffed a few more times smelling her sweat, her fear, orange blossoms, and the smell of old lumber, must have been the stick she was holding. As her hand slowly turned palm up, his head tilted down, and he began to sniff along her forearm. She giggled softly, a sound he liked a lot actually, but didn't jerk away. When he got to her elbow, he decided to push things a bit faster, he could hear voices at the bottom of the path, someone saying they thought they'd heard Akio scream. That must be this girl. He had a few minutes but not much more to win her over in the hopes of keeping his secret. Naruto reached the crook of her elbow, which had bent due to the slightly ticklish sensation of him sniffing it, and as she pulled her arm closer to her side, his head followed along bumping against her chest. He was embarrassed at the contact, but she was too busy giggling to be offended as her other hand rested on top of his head, inching its way to one of his ears. Feeling his blush blooming a contact with her soft chest, he covered his reaction up by sneezing once again and transforming into his combat form in a puff of sparkly smoke. I I I Tetsu eagerly leaned forward. They had heard the search party coming and wondered what the boy would do as his time ran out. She remained hopeful that she'd catch a break from hunting with the walking ferryman smokestack. I I I Akio coughed and waved away the smoke so she could see. When the smoke cleared enough, she gasped aloud and uttered one word that made the twins flinch, Tenko. Naruto sat there in full two-tailed fox form, his golden coat rippling in the night breeze over densely packed lean muscle. His azure eyes were turning more golden as his pupils began to expand, allowing more light in the growing darkness. The girl was rapturous as her hands reached out and pulled the fox into a hug seemingly on impulse. Naruto blinked in shock. Clearly her fear of the half-demon boy did not extend to the dangerous war fox that could easily rip her throat out. He stopped trying to figure it out the moment her hand started scratching behind his ears and the white fur under his chin. It was heaven on earth. His eyes closed involuntarily and his neck began to arch out as he leaned into her ministrations. What? What was going on back there? His left hindquarter was convulsing against his wishes. Traitor. His mind screamed at the rebellious appendage until she hit a certain spot in the middle of his back and his whole body twisted to the left in a curly cue, causing him to collapse on the ground. Unfazed, the girl switched both hands to scratch under his chin and along his belly. He was completely at her mercy, both hind legs kicking helplessly into the air as he involuntarily rolled over onto his back. I I I Tamami looked over to Tatsua with another grin. Tatsua merely groused, don't say it. We're having beef curry Monday night. Tatsua grumbled while Tamami turned back to take special note of where the girl was scratching that made Taichu so helpless in her grasp. I I I Akio was in love at first furball. His fur was sheer silk, the wide underside the brightest she had ever seen. Her own pristine robes were dingy in comparison. The gold of his coat could have been spun from the metal for all she could tell. She could feel the powerful muscle underneath which explained his amazing physical feats at the pool, but his furry face made her want to smoosh him like the stuffed animal she used to have as a child. Slowly she stopped scratch she caught a whiff of something like cinnamon and musk. Bright girl that she was, she thought she remembered reading about a gland near the fox's cheek used in marking its mates, and she blushed. Was this Tenko marking her as his mate? She hugged him, her arms wrapping around the corded muscle of his neck, and began to cry. Happy as she was she found the situation utterly ridiculous. She was a shrine maiden, sworn to a life of dedication to her temple and free of worldly affections. She'd made the vow not two years ago after having lost what employment she could find, old men were perverted wretches, and now she was smitten with a trickster fox beard. She playfully scratched his neck there went that leg again and pointed his muzzle directly into her face. If you will be my Tenko, then this will be our little secret beautiful Saishin. Naruto chirped a happy bark, then jerked his head past the girl's shoulder and down the path. The voices were getting closer, and now she could hear them as well. His ears lowered again, and he then started to back away, this time fear showing in his eyes. I I I Akio felt the animal tense, and her eyes grew big with fear. As she looked over her shoulder where her beloved Tenko was looking, she could hear the voices from her shrine family, and her eyes jerked back to the now clearly nervous beard. Wait, she frantically whispered, do not go. Don't leave me. I'll keep you safe I promise. Wait. She couldn't hold him. But the powerful jerk from his forelegs, the muscular fox pulled away but stopped after a few short paces as his head snapped back to the teary Maiko. He hopped forward once again and nuzzled her one more time liking her face and neck before bounding into the brush and out of sight. The girl had one hand to her cheek and the other outstretched to the fading memory of her golden fox beard. I hope you come to visit me again, Tenko-sama, she whispered. She giggled when she heard him yip once in the brush. Before she knew it, warm human hands were hugging her and checking her over for injury. She ignored their questions and admonitions about running off late in the day. 
she was in a dream, walking on a cloud of happiness. As her hand came away from her face, she found several golden strands of fur and winced. She hadn't heard him yelp, but she hoped she hadn't injured the kind spirit in her frenzied grip. She just wanted him to stay. Akio was almost ashamed at how disappointed she was to see her fellow shrine maidens. As nice as they were, none of them were fox spirits that she knew of. Akio carefully gathered up a strand she could see and pulled a lock of her own hair out, carefully wrapping it around the silken fur so that it made a strand she could braid later. Her shrine mates could only look on puzzled by her behavior, even as she rose and walked confidently down the path back to the shrine, the strand of fur clutched tightly in her hands and nestled between her fronts. Naruto vowed to return one day as he watched her saunter off down the path. He could still smell her orange blossom shampoo as he turned and padded off on his way home. He'd had enough fun for one day. By the time Nico came around the summer before his first year of the Ninja Academy, Naruto was a completely different seven almost eight year old. So guys, here is where I will stop for part one. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed the video. So if you want the next part, turn on the notification bell. Also, leave a like for this video and check out the other videos linked in the description, and I'll see you all in the next video. So until then, keep watching, keep loving, and goodbye everyone.